Chapter 18, Part 3 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1 by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, Part 3. 3. Meantime, in South Africa, there had broken out the only rebellion, with the exception of the Irish affair of Easter 1916, which the campaign produced within the confines of the British Empire. The grant of self-government to the Transvaal and Orange Free State in 1906, four years after the conclusion of the South African War, was a bold step which occasioned much uneasiness to those who were most familiar with the temper of the back veld. A strong people like the Boers do not surrender readily their dreams, and their tenacity of purpose was kept alive by certain sections of the Dutch Church and by the ignorance and remoteness from modern life of the rural population. That the venture did not end in disaster was due to two events which could not have been foreseen. One was the movement towards a union of South Africa, the foundations of which had been laid by Lord Milner's reconstruction after the war, and which Lord Selborne, aided by a brilliant band of young Englishmen, brought to a successful conclusion. The second was the appearance of two Dutch statesmen of the first quality. The old Africander leaders, like Mr. Hofmeyer, had often been men of great ability and foresight, but they had lacked the accommodating temper of statesmanship. General Botha, the first prime minister of the Union, had been the ablest of the Boer generals, and his subsequent work entitled him to a high place among imperial statesmen. He had the large simplicity of character and the natural magnetism which makes the born leader of men. His record in the field gave him the devoted allegiance of the old commandos. He was a sincere patriot, both of South Africa and of the empire, for though abating nothing of his loyalty towards the land of his birth, he saw that the fortunes of South Africa were bound up inextricably with the fortunes of the empire as a whole while he had the noble opportunism, the wide practical sagacity, which enabled him to move by slow degrees and to conciliate divergent interests by sheer tact and goodwill. His lieutenant, General J.C. Smuts, had won fame alike as a scholar, a lawyer, and a commander in the field. With greater knowledge and a keener intellect than his chief, he had not bothered gifts of popularity and popular leadership, but between them the two showed a combination of talents which it would be hard to parallel from any other part of the British dominions. Bother had no easy part to play. The Unionist Party, led first by Sir Star Jameson and then by Sir Thomas Smart, while remaining the official opposition, might be trusted to cooperate in all reasonable legislation. But among the Dutch, there was a section led by General Herzog and drawing its support chiefly from the Orange Free State, which was definitely anti-British and aimed not at racial union, but at Dutch ascendancy. It was a true party of reaction, narrow and sectional in its aims and bitter in its spirit. There was also, growing up on the rand and in the industrial centers, a labor party, largely officered by professional agitators from overseas, which realized the delicacy of South African economic conditions and aimed at a hold-up in the interests of a class. It will thus be seen that South African politics showed few affinities with those of other British countries. The party in power, Bothers, was a conservative party, composed mainly of landowners and farmers, and representing landed capital. The opposition, mainly British in blood, contained most of the industrial capitalists, and was markedly progressive in character. The Labour Party was not such as we are familiar with in Britain, but in the main rigidly classed in its aims and anarchical in its methods while the Hossagids were nakedly reactionary and obscurantist. As usually happens, the two extremes tended to form a working alliance, and the extraordinary spectacle was seen of the rent agitator and attacker from the wilds meeting on the same platform. 
bothered before the war began, had cleared the air by two bold steps. He had dismissed Herzog from his ministry, and definitely dissociated himself from his aims, thereby driving the Herzogites into violent opposition. Then he had dealt faithfully with the Labour Party. The first great strike on the Rand in 1913 had been a success, for the governments were unprepared, and the strike leaders dictated their own terms. The second attempt was a fiasco. The government called out all its forces, the ring of terror was broken in three days, and ten of the leaders were summarily deported under martial law. The result was to bring the official opposition much closer to the government, but to array against the prime minister a dangerous faction made up of the Herzogites and the defeated and discredited Labour Party. The advent of war made a new division. Herzog found that he could not collect a following and became a trimmer. He attacked the government but forbore to aid the rebels when the insurrection broke out. The Labour Party, considering their previous treatment, behaved with genuine patriotism. Many of their leaders took service in the new army. The working men of the Rand hastened to enlist, and General Bother's rescinding of the deportation order was a fitting recognition of this loyalty. But meantime, a very serious falling away was becoming apparent in the ranks of the Dutch. It cut across political parties for some of the Herzogites supported Bother's policy, and intriguers were busy among those who had never followed Herzog. The great mass of the Dutch people never wavered. Morris's performance had offended many who would otherwise have been lukewarm on the British side, for he had in effect invaded the Cape province with foreign troops. But in certain districts, a general discontent with the trend of modern politics and dark memories of the South African war combined with religious fanaticism to produce a dangerous temper. Presently, treason found its leaders. In the war of 1899 to 1902, there was a certain predicant of Lichtenberg, von Rainsberg by name, who acquired a reputation for second sight. He used to be known to our intelligence department as Delaray's prophet, and was supposed to have much influence over that distinguished general. After peace, he went on living in Lichtenberg, and that influence increased, while his reputation spread far and wide through the back belt. When war with Germany broke out, he discovered that the events foretold in the Book of Revelation were at hand, and that Germany was the agent appointed of God to purify the world. If we dared to draw the sword upon her, he prophesied the blackest sorrows. He had a number of visions, one of red and blue and black bulls, and one of an angel perched on the Patikrao monument, which he interpreted on the same lines. The disaster at Hess River on 11th September to the troop train carrying the Kaffarian rifles seemed to the superstitious a vindication of his forecast. Four days later came a second installment. The prophet had an eye to local politics and had announced that Delray, Bayers, and Tibet were the leaders destined to restore the old republic. On the night of 15th September, Delray and Bayers were traveling in a motor car westward from Johannesburg and were challenged by a police patrol which was on the lookout for a gang of desperados. Bayes bade the car drive on, probably fearing that his plot had been betrayed, and a shot was fired which ricocheted and killed Delaray. The true story of that night and of Delaray's intentions will never be fully known. It seems probable that he had been won over to rebellion, though it is difficult for those who shared the friendship of that high-minded gentleman to believe that he would have brought himself to violate the oath of allegiance which he had taken to the British crown. About Bayer's disloyalty, there was soon little doubt. Early in September, he had resigned his post as Commandant General of the Union Defense Force. In a letter which revealed more than he intended, 
and to which General Smoltz most effectively replied. He had done brilliant work in the Zauensburg during the South African War, and probably ranked next after Bother, Delaray, and Smuts among the Dutch commanders. But for some time, German agents had been working upon his vanity, while the Prophet played upon his somber religion. He had visited Germany and been received by the Emperor, and from that honor he had never recovered. We need not judge him too hardly, for he paid the penalty of his folly and it would be unreasonable to expect that rebellion would seem a heinous crime to one who twelve years before had been fighting against britain the real gravamen of his offence was that he broke the military oath which he had sworn as commandant general along with general Kemp, a former lieutenant of Delaray's, and a good soldier he proceeded to stir up disaffection in the western transvaal with him was joined the famous Christian de Vett, whose name was at one time a household word among us. De Vett was not a general of the caliber of Bother, Smuts, and Delray, and his chronic lack of discipline spoiled more than one of the last name's movements. But as a guerrilla fighter in his own countryside, he had no equal. He had not Delray's moral dignity or Bayes's knowledge of modern conditions, being a boar of the old, stiff, narrow, back veiled type, with a strong vein of religious fanaticism. But his name was one to conjure with, and his accession to the ranks of the irreconcilables vastly increased the difficulty of the government's problem. The main strength of the movement lay in the Baywana, or squatter class, the poor whites who had been created by the boar system of large farms and large families. For them, the future held no hope. In the old days, they had staffed the various tracts into the wilderness, but outlets were closing, and Africa was filling up. They had little education or intelligence, but they had enough to know that their economic position was growing desperate, and they not unnaturally struck for revolution when the chance came. They made up the bulk of the vet's men, the rest were a few religious fanatics, a few republican theorists, some men who still cherished bitter memories of the last war, and a number of social declassy and unsuccessful politicians. Little pity need be wasted on such, but it is not easy to withhold a certain sympathy for the luckless Bayona, for whom the world held no longer a place. The rebellion was not long in revealing itself. On 26th October, the Union government announced that the vet was busy commandeering burghers in the north of the Orange Free State, while Bayers was at the same task in the Western Transvaal. On the 24th, the former had seized Helbron, a little town in the North Free State, on a branch of the main line from Cape Town to Pretoria. Further, at Wright's, he had stopped a train and arrested some Union soldiers who were traveling by it. Bayes, meantime, with a commando formed chiefly of Delray's old soldiers, was in Roxtonburg, threatening Pretoria. Bother at once summoned the burghers to put down the revolt, and to their eternal honor they responded willingly. It was no easy decision for many of them. They were called on to fight against men of their own blood, some of whom had been their comrades or their leaders in the last war. From farm to farm ran the summons, and many a farmer took down his mauser, which had shot nothing but buck since Diamond Hill or Colesburg, and upsettled his pony, as he had done before the Great Sand River concentration. The magic name of Bother did not fail in its appeal, and in a few weeks, he had over 30,000 under arms. He was now a man of 52 years of age, tired with heavy years of office and a sedentary life, and not in the best of health. The rebellion must have been peculiarly bitter to one who had striven beyond all others for a united South African people, and who was not likely to forget the friendships of the old strenuous days. He did not suffer the grass to grow under his feet, 
resolving to clear Bayas out of the neighborhood of the capital before he turned to deal with De Vett, he entrained for Rostenburg on the 26th and fell in with the enemy next day to the south of that town, about 80 miles from Pretoria, where the Cirrus Road goes through the northern foothills of the Megalisper. There he smoked Bayas and camped so fiercely that their commandos were scattered, 80 prisoners were taken, and the leaders fled inconveniently to the southwest. Part of the rebel forces went northward into the hills of Waterberg, but the bulk of them followed their generals to Lickenburg. In Lickenburg, Colonel Albert was waiting for them. His first encounter was unfortunate, for 110 of his men were cut off from the rest and captured at Trierfontein by the rebels. A day or two later, he retrieved the disaster, recovered the prisoners, and thoroughly beat Clausen, the rebel leader. Meanwhile, that portion of Bayes's force which had gone north to Waterberg and which seems to have been under the command of Muller was busied in raiding the line that runs north from Pretoria till Colonel van der Venter, fresh from his success in the Cape, hustled it back into the hills. On 8th November, he caught the raiders at Sanfontein, near Wambaths, some 60 miles from Pretoria, and dispersed them with many killed, wounded, and prisoners. The remnants fled back to Rostenburg and the west. By this time, Botha had news of the whereabouts of Bayers and Camp. Hunted by Colonel Lammer, the former fled southwest to the flats of Blumhoff, crossed the Vau River, and entered the Orange Free State. He had a sharp fight near the junction of the Vau and the Vet, and lost about 400, as well as most of his transports, but succeeded himself in getting clear away. The men whom Colonel Albert had already beaten were now with camp making for Bechuanaland and German territory. They were safe enough in that direction, for the Kalahari Desert at the end of the dry season might be trusted to take its toll of rash adventurers. On 7th November, General Smoltz made a speech in Johannesburg in which, summing up the situation, he announced that the rebellion in the Cape was over, that the Transvaal rebels were now only a few scattered bands, and that in the Orange Free State alone, where the Welt was at work, had the revolt assumed any serious proportions. The vet had only a month of freedom, but he made good use of it so far as concerned the distance covered. Ten years before, he would have made a very different fight among those flats and copies of the northern free state, where spring was beginning to tinge with green the long umber and yellow distances. But now the stars in their courses fought against him. His own countrymen had become prudent and did not see the admirable humor of Shambocking, a magistrate who had once fined him five shillings for whipping a native. They gave information to the government and grudged ammunition and stores to the good cause. Once he had had fine spot in that district, slipping through blockhouse lines and eluding the clumsy British columns. But now he found himself being constantly brought up against that accursed thing, modern science. So long as he could trust to a good horse, matters went well. But what was he to do when his pursuers took to motor cars which covered 20 miles where the British Mountain Infantry used to cover five? The times were out of joint for Devat, and so he went shambocking and commandeering through the land, perpetually losing his temper and delivering bitter philippics against these later days. General Botha was ungodly. The English were pestilential. Maritz was the only true man. Heresy, imperialism, and necrophilism were jumbled together as the enemy. King Edward, he cried, with some pathos, promised to protect us, but he did not keep his promise and allowed a magistrate to be put over us. There we have the last cry of the Anshan regime in South Africa, which saw patriarchalism and personal government vanishing from a machine-made world. De Wet was at Frieda on 28th October, when he had the famous interview with the magistrate already referred to. 
Meanwhile, his lieutenant, Vessels, had looted Harrismith near the NATO border and damaged the railway line. Thereafter, the vet turned west and found sanctuary in the neighborhood of Wienberg, where on 7th November, at a place called Domberg, he defeated a Union force under Commander Cronier and lost his son David. At the time, his army seems to have numbered 2,000 men. Next day, a second rebel force was beaten at Kronstadt by Colonel Manny Bother, who continued the pursuit for several days. By this time, Bother, having all but cleared the transfer, was on his way south, and on the 11th came in touch with the vet at Marquardt, about 20 miles east of Wimber. The rebels were in four bodies, one at Marquardt, one at a place called Bantry, a third at Unterkorp, and a fourth which which was developed himself in the Mushroom Valley. Bother's plan was to surround the whole rebel force, two Union armies under Colonels Ritz and Lukin, working round its flanks. Something went wrong, however, with the timing of the movement, and Lukin and Ritz did not reach their allotted posts in time. In spite of this accident, the vet was completely defeated. Bother took 282 prisoners, released most of the loyalists taken by the rebels, and captured a large quantity of transport. On the 13th, it was officially announced that the interrupted train service between Bloemfontein and Johannesburg would be resumed. The vet at first fled south, but presently doubled back and on the 16th was at Virginia, on the main line. Two armored trains on the railway managed to prevent a large part of the rebel force from crossing and to head it eastward. Presently, some of its commandants began to come in and many who had taken up arms, attracted by the clemency of Bother's proclamation, laid them down again. Devet was aiming at a junction with Bayes, who was in the Hubstadt district at the time. Bayes, however, was in trouble on his own account. On the 15th, Colonel Sellius had fallen upon him at Balfontein and had beaten him thoroughly and made large captures. Most of the 1,500 rebels were driven northwards, many across the Val. Accordingly, the vet, fleeing from Virginia down the Sand and Vet rivers, found Sellius ahead of him and heard of Bayes's disaster. He saw that the game was up and halted his force near Boshof. There seems to have been considerable disaffection in its ranks, and in a final address to them, he advised all who were tired of fighting to hide their rifles and go home. Many took the advice, including two of his sons. Many yielded themselves to the Union forces, but the vet himself, with 25 men, made one last dash for liberty. On 21st November, he tried to cross the Val and was driven back by Commandant Dutois. In the evening, however, with a following now reduced to six, he managed to slip over the river above Blumhof and took the road for Vryburg and the northwest. He now picked up some fugitives and a small commando crossed the railway line to Rhodesia, 20 miles north of Vryburg. He had apparently conceived the bold scheme of going through the Kalahari to German Southwest Africa. But he had not allowed for the motor cars of his pursuers. For a day or two there was heavy rain which made the roads bad and gave the Boer ponies of his party an advantage over any motor. But by the 27th the weather had cleared, the veld was hot and dry, and Colonel Britz, who had taken up the chase, began to capture the slower members of the commando. As the fugitives penetrated into the western desert, their case became more hopeless. The vet was forced by the motors behind him to cover 50 miles at a stretch without off settling, a thing hateful to the poor horse master. The end came on 1st December, when at a farm called Waterburg, about a hundred miles west of Mafeken, the vet and his handful surrendered to Colonel Jordan. He was taken to Freiburg and two days later entered Johannesburg, a prisoner. He had yielded at the end with a shaggy good humor. 
Having decided that modern conditions were the devil, he was glad to see his own Africanders such adepts as the use of the powers of darkness. With the capture of the vet, the rebellion was virtually at an end. There was a good deal of skirmishing along the south and north banks of the lower Vau. Camp, accompanied by the Lickenburg prophet, fled west after Truerfontein to the little town of Schweizer Renica and thence towards Freiburg. He had some fighting at Kuroman, from which he headed southwest across the southern Kalahari. He was engaged again north of Uppington, and it was a very battered remnant which ultimately crossed the border of German southwest Africa. Early in December, Botha organized a great sweeping movement from rights, which ended in the surrender of vessels with the only large body of rebels still in the field. Bayes, with a small commando after his defeat at Baufontein, had haunted the southern shore of the Vale between Hubstadt and Kronstadt. On the morning of 8th December, he fell in with a body of Union troops under Captain Urs and was driven towards the river. He and some companions endeavored to cross the Vale, which was in high flood, and midway in the stream, he found his horse failing and slipped from his back to swim. His great coat hampered him, and he tried in vain to get rid of it. A companion heard him cry, I can do no more, as he disappeared. His body was found two days later. He had been drowned, for there was no bullet mark on him. By the end of December, the last embers of disaffection had been stamped out within the Union territory. Of the five leaders whom Moritz had named, the vet was captured, Muller was wounded and a prisoner, Bayes was dead, Camp was across the German border, and Herzog had never declared himself. In less than two months, Botha had harried the rebels round the points of the compass and had taken 7,000 of them prisoners, with a total casualty list to the Union army of no more than 334. He exhibited magnanimity and wisdom in his hour of triumph. Rebels who had been members of the defense force and had broken their military oath were very properly put on trial for their life. But to the rank and file, he showed no harshness, and in the interests of South Africa's future, this clemency was not misplaced. Rebellion could not, for the country boys, carry the moral stigma which it would bear if dabbled in by an ordinary Briton. The empire had no sentimental claim upon them, and the case for loyalty founded on material interests required a certain level of education before it could be understood. Besides, so far as the older race of Boers was concerned, insurrection was in their bones. It had always been a recognized political expedient, and indeed, for more than a century, had been the national past time. End of chapter 18, part 3Chapter 19 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The War at Sea, Coronel and the Falkland Islands, 14th September to 8th December. On 29th October, Prince Louis of Bettingburg, who, as first sea lord, had done good service to his adopted country, retired from office and Lord Fisher returned to the post which he had held four years before. Lord Fisher was beyond doubt the greatest living sailor, and the modern British Navy was largely his creation. Explosive, erratic, a dangerous enemy, a difficult friend, this proud and rebellious creature of God had the width of imagination and the sudden lightning flashes of insight which entitled him to rank as a man of genius. Behind a smoke screen of vulgar rodomontade, his powerful mind worked on the data of a vast experience. Moreover, he had that rarest of gifts, courage, as the French say, of the head as well as of the heart. His policy in war might be too bold or too whimsical, but it would never be timorous or supine. 
The situation which he had to face in October did not differ greatly from that of the preceding months. Jericho, without adequate basis, was engaged in the difficult task of performing a multitude of duties while keeping intact his capital ships. He had to arrange for the convoying of the first contingents of Canadian troops and to meet and defeat the German campaign of submarines and mines around the British coasts. On 16th October, an alarm of enemy submarines at Scapa compelled him to leave that anchorage till its defenses were complete, and after moving his whole cruiser system farther north, he chose as his battleship bases the natural harbors of Skye and Mu and Loch Swilly in Ireland. The German liner Berlin, which had managed to slip through our North Sea patrols at the end of September, had sold mines in the North Irish waters, and one of them was struck on 27th October by the audacious of the 2nd Battle Squadron, which sank after a 12 hours struggle to get to port. As a protest and a protection against indiscriminate mine laying in the great highways of ocean trade, the British Admiralty on 2nd November notified to the world that the whole of the North Sea would thenceforth be regarded as a military area and that neutral ships could only pass through it by conforming to Admiralty instructions and keeping to certain predetermined routes. Presently, the situation improved. The defenses of Scapa were completed, and the German submarine attack languished, as if its promoters were disappointed with its results and were casting about for a new policy. It was well that the Admiralty had an easier mind in home waters for they were faced with an urgent and intricate problem in more distant seas. The existence of Admiral von Spee's squadron left our overseas possessions and our great trade routes at the mercy of enemy raids. Till it was hunted down, no overseas ports could feel security, and the Australian and New Zealand governments, busy with sending contingents to the fighting fronts, demanded not unnaturally that this should be made the first duty of the British Navy. Whether the squadron kept together or split into raiding units, it was no light task to bring it to book when it had the oceans of the world for its hunting ground. Sooner or later it was doomed, and von Spee, hampered with difficulties of coaling and supplies, could only hope for a brief career. But during that career, a bold man might do incalculable damage to the Allies and deflect and cripple all their strategic plans. And the German admiral was a most bold and gallant commander. About the middle of August, two of his light cruisers, the Dresden and the Kaushuel, appeared in the mid-Atlantic, while the Emden, as we have seen, harried the Indian Ocean. Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock in command of the North American station, took up the chase of the first two throughout the West Indian Islands and down the east coast of South America. Meantime, von Spee was somewhere in the Central Pacific, where at the end of September he bombarded Tahiti, and presently it became clear that the Dresden had joined him. His squadron now comprised two armored cruisers, the Ganassanao and the Scharnhorst, and three light cruisers, the Dresden, Leipzig, and Nuremberg. The first two were sister ships, both launched in 1906 with a tonnage of 11,400 and a speed of at least 23 knots. They carried 6-inch armor and mounted 8 8.2-inch, 6 5.9-inch, and 18 21-pounder guns. The Dresden was a sister ship of the Emden, 3,592 tons, 24.5 knots, and 10 4.1-inch guns. The Nuremberg was slightly smaller, 3,400 tons. Her armament was the same, and her speed was about half a knot quicker. Smaller steel was the Leipzig, 3,200 tons, with the same armament as the other two, and a speed of over 22 knots. This squadron set itself to prey upon our commerce routes, remembering that the British Navy was short in cruisers of the class best fitted to patrol and guard the great trade highways. 
Bonchby moved nearer the western coast of South America and found coaling and provisioning bases on the coast of Ecuador and Colombia and in the Galapagos Islands. The duties of neutrals were either imperfectly understood or slightly observed by some of the South American states at this stage, and the German admiral seems to have been permitted the use of wireless stations, which gave him valuable information as to his enemy's movements. So soon as definite news came of von Speer's whereabouts, Craddock sailed south to the Horn, he had in his squadron, when formed, the twelve-year-old battleship, the Canopus, two armoured cruisers, the Good Hope and the Monmouth, the light cruiser Glasgow, and an armed liner, the Otranto, belonging to the Orient Steam Navigation Company. None of his vessels was strong either in speed or armament. The Canopus belonged to a class which had been long obsolete. Her tonnage was 12,950, her speed under 19 knots, and her armament for 12-inch, 12-6-inch, and 10 12-pounder guns, all of an old-fashioned pattern. Her armor belt was only 6 inches thick. The Good Hope was also 12 years old. Her tonnage was 14,100, her speed 23 knots, and her armament to 9.2-inch, 16-6-inch, and 12 12 pounder guns. The Monmouth was a smaller vessel of 9,800 tons, with the same speed and mounting 14 6 inch and 8 12 pounder guns. The Glasgow was a much newer vessel and had a speed of 25 knots. Her tonnage was 4,800 and her armament 2 6 inch and 10 4 inch guns. Craddock's instructions received on 14th September, were to make the Falkland Islands his base and to concentrate there a squadron strong enough to meet von Spee. A week later, it appeared as if von Spee had gone off northwest from Samoa to his original station in the North Pacific, where the Japanese could deal with him. It looked, therefore, as if Craddock were safe, so he was ordered not to concentrate all his cruisers but to attack German trade west of the Magellan Straits, for which task two cruisers and an armed liner would be sufficient. The news of the arrival of the Dresden did not seem to alter the situation, but on 5th October, the Admiralty had information which suggested that von Spee was making for Easter Island, and Craddock was warned that he might have to meet the Scharnhorst and the Ganassanau and consequently was ordered to take the canopus with him. Craddock asked for reinforcements, and protested that his instructions were impossible, for with his small squadron he could not watch both coasts of South America. For some days, owing to bad weather and the pressure of other duties, there came no reply from the MOT. If von Spee escaped, he might cripple our operations in the Cameroons, and my work untold harm in the troubled waters of South Africa. On 14th October, Craddock was told to concentrate the Good Hope, Canopus, Monmouth, Glasgow, and Otranto for a combined operation on the west coast of South America, and informed that a second squadron was being formed for the plate area. Craddock assumed that his former orders also held good and that he was expected to bring the enemy to action. His difficulty was with the canopus, which was hopelessly slow. On 22nd October, he left the Falklands to make a sweep round the Horn, leaving the canopus to join him by way of the Magellan Straits. He had no illusions about the dangers of his task, for he knew that if he met von Spee, he would meet an enemy more than his match. During these weeks, with the conditions made communication with the Admiralty exceptionally difficult. He was not aware that an Anglo-Japanese squadron was operating in the North Pacific, and he seems to have regarded the charge of all the western coasts as resting on himself alone. In this spirit of devotion to a desperate duty, he left the slow canopus behind him, and with his two chief ships, but newly commissioned and poor in gunnery, 
set out on a task which might engage him with two of the best cruisers in the German fleet. He may have argued further, for no height of gallantry was impossible to such a man, that even if he perished, the special circumstances of the conqueror might turn his victory into defeat. For in Mr. Balfour's words, the German admiral in the Pacific was far from any front where he could have refitted. No friendly bases were open to him. If, therefore, he suffered damage, even though in suffering damage he inflicted apparently greater damage than he received, yet his power, waits for evil while he remained untouched, might suddenly, as by a stroke of an enchanter's wand, be utterly destroyed. The opponents, Craddock from the south and Von Spee from the north, were moving towards a conflict like one of the historic naval battles, a fight without mines, submarines or destroyers where the two squadrons were to draw into line ahead and each ship select its antagonist as in the ancient days the glasgow which had been sent forward to scout a little after four o'clock in the afternoon of first november sighted the enemy she made out the two big armored cruisers leading and the light cruisers following in open order and at once sent a wireless signal to the flagship by five o'clock the good hope came up and the monmouth had already joined the glasgow and the otranto both squadrons were now moving southwards the germans having the inshore course the british were led by the good hope with the monmouth glasgow and otranto following in order the germans by the Scharnhorst with the Gnasenau, Dresden and Nuremberg behind. We can reconstruct something of the picture. To the east was the land, with the snowy heights of the southern Andes fired by the evening glow. To the west burned one of those flaming sunsets which the Pacific knows, and silhouetted against its crimson and orange were the British ships, like woodcuts in a naval handbook. A high sea was running from the south and half a gale was blowing. At first, some twelve miles separated the two squadrons, but the distance rapidly shrank till it was eight miles at 6.18 p.m. About seven o'clock, the squadrons were converging, and the enemy's leading cruiser opened fire at seven miles. By this time, the sun had gone down behind the horizon, but the lemon afterglow showed up the British ships, while the German were shrouded in the inshore twilight. Presently, the enemy got the range, and shell after shell hit the Good Hope and the Mammoth, while the bad light and the spray from the head seas made good gunnery for them almost impossible. At 7.50, there was a great explosion on the Good Hope, which had already been set on fire. The flames leaped to an enormous height in the air, and a doomed vessel, which had been drifting towards the enemy's lines, soon disappeared below the water. The mammoth was also on fire and down by the head, and turned away seaward in her distress. Meantime, the Glasgow had received only stray shots, for the battle so far had been waged between the four armored cruisers. But as the good hope sank and the mammoth was obviously near her end, the enemy cruisers fell back and began to shell the Glasgow at a range of two and a half miles. That the Glasgow escaped was something of a miracle. She was scarcely armored at all and was struck by five shells at the water line, but her coal seems to have saved her. The moon was now rising, and the Glasgow, which had been trying to stand by the mammoth, saw the whole German squadron bearing down upon her. The mammoth refusing to surrender was to pass hope so she did the proper thing and fled by ten minutes to nine she was out of sight of the enemy though she occasionally saw flashes of gun fire and the play of search lights for fortunately a fury of rain had hidden the unwelcome moon she steered at first west northwest but gradually worked round to south for she desired to warn the canopus which was coming up from the direction of Cape Horn. Next day, she found that battleship 200 miles off, and the two proceeded towards the Straits of Magellan. 
Craddock, out of touch with the Admiralty and perplexed by contradictory telegrams, could only take counsel from the valor of his heart. He chose the heroic course, and he and his 1,650 officers and men went to their death in the spirit of Drake and Granville. The Germans had two light cruisers to his one, for the Otranto was negligible, but these vessels were never seriously in action, and the battle was decided in a duel between the armored cruisers. The Good Hope mounted two 9.2-inch guns, but these were old-fashioned and were put out of action at the start. The 6-inch guns, which she and the Mammoth possessed, were no match for the broadsides of 12 8.2-inch guns fired by the Scharnhorst and the Gynasenau. The German vessels were also far more heavily armored, and they had the inestimable advantage of speed. They were able to get the requisite range first and to cripple Craddock before he could reply, and they had a superb target in his holes silhouetted against the afterglow of sunset. The Battle of Coronel was fought with all conceivable odds against us. The defeat of Coronel played havoc with the British Admiralty's plans and dispositions, and left a hundred vulnerable spots throughout the empire open to foreign speed. Mr. Churchill and Lord Fisher did not hesitate. A blow must be struck and at once, and that blow must be decisive. The defense, Carnarvon and Cornwall were ordered to concentrate at Montevideo, where the remnants of Craddock's squadron was instructed to join them. Jellicoe was summoned to land his two battle cruisers, the Invincible and the Inflexible, each with a tonnage of 17,250 a speed of from 25 to 28 knots, and eight 12-inch guns, so placed that all eight could be fired on either broadside. Sir Frederick Dofton Sturdy, the chief of the war staff at the Admiralty, was put in charge of the expedition with the post of commander-in-chief of the South Atlantic and Pacific. His business was to take over the ships at Montevideo, and seek out von B should he attempt to break into the Atlantic by the Horn. If, on the other hand, the German admiral was aiming at the Panama Canal or the Canadian coasts, he would be dealt with by the Anglo-Japanese squadron in the North Pacific. On the 11th November, Sturdy sailed, and on the 26th reached the rendezvous, where he found the Carnarvon, Cornwall, Kent, and Bristol. Von Spee, after Coronel, lingered for some time on the coast of Chile, waiting on Cordius, and apparently also in the hope that the German battle cruisers might break out of the North Sea and join him. Then, finding that the Anglo-Japanese squadron was becoming troublesome in the Pacific, he steered for the Horn, which he rounded at midnight on 1st December. He was aiming at the Falklands, where he expected to find a weak British squadron coaling. He meant to draw it out to sea and destroy it, and then occupy the islands and demolish the wireless installation. As a matter of fact, only the canopus was there, and the little colony expected that at any moment the blow would fall. But on the afternoon of 7th December, Sturdy appeared with his squadron, intending to call, and then go round the horn in search of the enemy. The Falklands, with their bare brown walls shining with quartz, their innumerable lockins, their prevailing mists, their grey stone houses, and their population of Scots shepherds, looked like a group of the Orkneys or Outer Hebrides set down in the southern seas. Port Stanley lies at the eastern corner of East Island. There is a deeply cut gulf leading to an inner harbour, on the shores of which stands the little capital. The low shores on the south side almost give a vessel in port a sight of the outer sea. The night of 7th December was spent by the British squadron in coaling. The Canopus, the Glasgow, and the Bristol were in the inner harbour, while the Invincible, Inflexible, Carnarvon, Kent, and Cornwall lay in the outer gulf. About daybreak on the morning of the 8th, von Spee arrived from the direction of Cape Horn. The Gneisenau and the Nuremberg were ahead and reported the presence of two British ships, probably the Macedonia and the Kent, 
which would be the first vessels visible to a ship rounding the islands. Upon this, von Spee gave the order to prepare for battle, expecting to find only the remnants of Craddock's squadron. At eight o'clock, the signal station announced to study the presence of the enemy. It was a clear, fresh morning with a bright sun and light breezes from the northwest. All our vessels had finished coaling except the battle cruisers, which had begun only half an hour before. Orders were at once given to get up steam for full speed. The battle cruisers raised steam with oil fuel and made so dense a smoke that the German lookouts did not detect them. About nine, the canopus had a shot at the Canasonal over the neck of land, directed by signal officers on shore. At 9.30, von Spee came abreast the harbour mouth and saw the ominous tripod masts, which revealed the strength of the British squadron. He at once signaled to the Canasonal and the number not to accept action, and altered his course to east, while Sturdy's command streamed out in pursuit. First went the Kent, and then the Glasgow, followed by the Carnival, the battle cruisers, and the Cornwall. The Germans had transports with them, the Baden, and the Santa Isabel, and these fell back to the south of the island, with the Bristol and the Macedonia in pursuit. The Canopus remained in the harbour, where she had been moored in the mud as a fort. At about ten o'clock, the two forces were some twelve miles apart, von Spee steering almost due east. The invincible and the inflexible quickly drew ahead, but had to slacken speed to twenty knots to allow the cruisers to keep up with them. At eleven o'clock, about eleven miles separated the two forces. At five minutes to one, we had drawn closer and opened fire upon Leipzig, which was last of the German line. Von Spee, seeing that flight was impossible, prepared to give battle. So far as the battle cruisers were concerned, it was a foregone conclusion, for the British had the greatest speed and the longer range. Ever since Coronel, he had had a sense of impending doom, and had known that the time left to him was short. He saw, like the great sailor he was, that while his flagship and her consort were in any case doomed, their loss might enable his light cruisers to escape and that these could still do work for his country by harrying British trade. About one o'clock, he signaled to the latter to disperse and make for the South American coast, while he accepted battle with his armored ships. His three light cruisers turned, therefore, and made off to the south, followed by the Kent, the Glasgow, and the Cornwall, while the Invincible, the Inflexible, and the Carnivon engaged the Scharnhorst and the Ganassenau. About two o'clock, our battle cruisers had the range of the German flagship, and a terrific artillery duel began. The British armor-piercing shells from some defect in construction burst on impacts, and this explained the long-drawn agony of the German ships, which remained afloat when their decks had become places of torment. The smoke was getting in our way, and Sturdy used his superior speed to reach the other side of the enemy. He simply pounded the Shanghors to pieces, and just after four o'clock, she listed to port and then turned bottom upwards, with her propeller still going round. The battle cruisers and the Carnivon then concentrated on the Ganassanau, which was shearing off to the southeast, and at six o'clock, she too listed and went under. Meanwhile, the Kent, Glasgow, and Cornwall were hot in pursuit of the three light cruisers, and here was a more equally matched battle. The Dresden, which was farthest to the east, had, with her pace and her long start, no difficulty in escaping. The other two had slightly the advantage of speed of the British ships, but our engineers and stokers worked magnificently, and managed to get 25 knots out of the Kent. It was now a thick misty afternoon, with a drizzle of rain, and each duo had consequently the form of a separate battle. The news of the sinking of the Scharnhorst and the Ganassenau put new spirit into our men, and at 7.30 p.m. the Nuremberg, which had been set on fire by the Kent, went down with her guns still firing. 
The Leipzig, which had to face the Glasgow and the Cornwall, kept afloat, fighting most gallantly till close upon 8 p.m., when she too heeled over and sank. As the wet night closed in, the battle died away. Only the Dresden, battered and fleeing far out in the southern waters, remained of the proud squadron which at dawn had sailed to what it believed to be an easy victory. The defeat of Craddock in the murky sunset of Coronel had been amply avenged. The Battle of the Falkland Islands was a brilliant piece of strategy for a plan initiated more than a month before and involving a journey across the world was executed with complete secrecy and precision. Tactically, it was an easy victory owing to Sturdy's huge preponderance in strength. The British gunnery was good, and a battle might have been won in half the time, but for the British Admiral's very proper desire to win without loss and return the battle cruisers intact to Jellico. Yet, when this has been said, it was a workmanlike performance, doing honor to all concerned. Technically, the sole blemish was the escape of the Dresden, which could not, however, have been prevented. For the speediest of the available ships, the Glasgow had only 25 knots against the 27 which the German cruiser managed to achieve. The result had a vital bearing on the position of Germany. It annihilated the one squadron left to her outside the North Sea, and it removed a formidable menace to our trade routes. After the 8th of December, the Dresden was the sole enemy cruiser left at large and she and the armored merchantman, the crown prince William and the prince Ito Friedrich were the only privateers still at work on the high seas. The British losses were small considering the magnitude of the victory. The Invincible was hit by 18 shells, but had no casualties. The Inflexible was hit thrice and had one man killed. The cruisers suffered more heavily. The cans, for example, having four men killed and twelve wounded, and the Glasgow nine killed and four wounded. Every effort was made by the British ships to save life, but in the circumstances, most of the efforts were vain. The only sign of a lost vessel was at first the slightly discolored water. Then the wreckage floated up with men clanging to it, and boats were lowered, and sailors let down the sides on bow lines in order to rescue the survivors who floated past. The water was icy cold, about 40 degrees, and presently many of the swimmers grew numb and went under. Albatrosses, too, attacked some of those clinging to the wreckage, pecking at their eyes and forcing them to let go. Altogether, less than 200 were saved, including the captain of the Ganazanao. Emerald Fonge B. perished with two of his sons, the victory was of supreme importance in the naval campaign, for it gave to Britain the command of the outer seas, and enabled her to concentrate all her strength in the main European battleground. Failure would have altered the whole course of the war in Africa, and most gravely interfered with the passage of troops and supplies to the Western Front. It is worthy, too, to be held in memory along with Coronel, as an episode which maintained the high chivalrous tradition of the sea. Let us do honor to a gallant foe. The German admiral did his duty as Craddock had done his. The German sailors died as Craddock's men had died, and there can be no higher praise. They went down with colors flying, and at the last the men lined up on the decks of the doomed ships. They continued to resist after the vessels had become shambles. One captured officer reported that, before the end, his ship had no upper deck left, every man there having been killed, and one turret blown bodily overboard by a 12-inch shell. But in all that hell of slaughter, which lasted for half a day, there was never a thought of surrender. Fonchby and Craddock lie beneath the same waters, in the final concord of those who have looked unshaken upon death. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1 by John Buchan 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. The First Winter in the West. We left the campaign in the West when the critical moment had passed. The thin lines from Newport to Ahais had done their work, and by 20th November the tide of attack had recoiled and lay grumbling and surging beyond our bastions. A number of German corps were sent east to Hindenburg, and Foch was now at leisure to rearrange his lines and give some rest to the sorely tried defenders. The bulk of the British Second Corps and most of the Seventh Division were already in reserve, and the First Corps followed, so that at the end of November, except for the Third Corps and the new Eighth Division, portions of the cavalry and the Indian Corps, the front from Albert to the sea was held by the French troops of Dubel's 8th and Moudry's 10th army. In those days, both in France and Britain, little was known of the great crisis now happily passed. The French official communicates gave the barest information, and the Paris papers could not supplement it. The English press continued to publish reassuring articles and victorious headlines. Indeed, it was officially announced that our front had everywhere advanced on a day when it had everywhere fallen back. Hence, since the duration of the crisis had caused little anxiety, its end brought no special relief or rejoicing to the ordinary man. Soldiers returning on leave, solemnized by their desperate experience, were amazed at the perfect calmness of the British people till they discovered that it was due to a perfect ignorance. There is a peculiarly exasperating type of optimism from which in those days our troops had to suffer. I suppose we are winning hands down, said the cheerful civilian, and the soldier, with Ypres raw in his memory, could only call upon his gods and hold his peace. This conspiracy of silence may have served some purpose in keeping nerves quiet, though the courage of the British people scarcely deserved to be rated so low. But in concealing from them the greatest military performance in all our history, it prevented that glow and exaltation of the national spirit which makes armies and wins battles. Winter had now fairly come and though modern war may affect to despise the seasons, the elements take their revenge, and both armies were forced into that trench warfare which took the place of the old winter quarters. The shallow shelter trenches of mid-October, hasty lines scored in the mud by harried men, became an elaborate series of excavations to which the most modern engineering knowledge on both sides was applied. At the same time, the enemy had to be kept occupied, and while the bulk of the Allied troops were employed as navvies and carpenters, the guns were rarely silent, and attacks and counterattacks reminded the armies that they were at war. It was a period of temporary stalemate and quiescence, and therefore leisure was given to the Allies to perfect defenses, to elaborate fresh schemes of attack, to train their raw levies, and to reconsider weapons and tactics in the light of their new experience. Germany, for the moment, had consented to a defensive war in the West, and even Falkenhayn, who was convinced that the decisive victory could only be gained on that front, bowed to an imperious necessity. The popular prestige of Hindenburg and the rigorous personality of Ludendorff focused German interests on the East. The absorption was justified, for the eastern problem was urgent. Austria must be saved from final disaster and the new allegiance of Turkey confirmed. Germany, therefore, resigned herself to holding the western line with numbers considerably inferior to those of her opponents. Trusting to her discipline and training, her greater skill in fortification, and her unquestionable superiority in machine guns and artillery, the Allies were in no condition to institute an immediate offensive. The French since August had lost a million men and were busy accumulating new reserves and laboring to increase their munitionment. The British losses had also been high and were partly replaced by adding one territorial battalion to each brigade. 
battalions which were presently to be organized in special territorial divisions and to win fame not inferior to the proudest records of the old regular army munitions were still scanty notably in the high explosive class and it was obvious that no serious offensive could be contemplated till the new factories hastily improvised in britain began to produce in bulk but the first battle of ypres was scarcely over before the optimistic spirit of sir john french set itself to devising plans for a new attack he wished to attempt a turning movement by the belgian coast which would gain possession of Zeebrugge. at first the british cabinet were inclined to favor the scheme the admiralty was anxious to prevent the use of that coast as a submarine base and believed that the navy could support any advance effectively from the sea while it was clear that russia was in no very comfortable position and that an offensive which should check the dispatch of further german troops to the east was desirable on every ground of loyalty and sound strategy lord kitchener promised the regular twenty seventh division and held out hopes of a great increase in territorial battalions but joff rejected the proposal he was unwilling to push the british army in sole charge of the allied left he considered that a german offensive in the near future was likely and was anxious for the safety of his front especially in the neighborhood of Ua and montigny and he was developing a scheme of his own for a breakthrough on the south side of the german salient at Reims and on the west at Arheis, for which he must accumulate all possible reserves presently the british government also blew cold on the project the old foolish fears of invasion revived in their minds they did not see their way to supply the necessary munitions they were unwilling to dispute the view of the french commander-in-chief there was another motive by the end of the year their thoughts had begun to toy with the idea of relieving the stalemate in the west by employing british forces in an altogether different theatre the various objections alleged by london and paris may as sir john french has argued have been each capable of answer but there can be little doubt that the decision was substantially right neither british nor french were as yet ready for a serious advance and we may be very certain that an attempt to free the flanders coast that winter would have been as costly and as futile as the various offensives of nineteen fifteen the winter fighting was commonly described as a war of attrition a guerre du jour but the phrase was a contradiction in terms it was more correctly a period of waiting a marking of time till further reserves in men and material were ready but there was a positive side also to the allies plan by frequent local attacks they kept the edge of their temper keen they prevented the enemy from concentrating in force against any part of their line they detained troops which might otherwise have been sent to hindenburg their purpose was to be ready for any german attack but to prevent it if possible by constantly worrying portions of the german front the five hundred miles of the allied line were held as to one-tenth by the british and for the rest by the belgians and the french it ran from newport generally west of the isar along the ypres canal in a salient in front of ypres behind Misin to just east of armentieres then west of neuve chapelle to givenchy across the la Bassi canal east of vermeer west of lens to just east of arheis from arheis it lay by aubert and noyon to soissons east along the Aisne to just north of Reims from Heinz by Vienne to Varhan, thence making a wide curve round Verdon to the west bank of the Meuse, opposite Saint Miel, and so to Pont Mousson on the Moselle. Thence it passed east of Nunevi to just east of Saint ten miles inside the frontier. It reached the crest of the Wouche about the Coup de Bunum, and then ran in German territory to Belfort and the Swiss border 
In January, a German comic paper published a cartoon in which two French staff officers were depicted measuring the day's advance with a foot rule in order to make up their report. The jibe was not unfair, for the winter's record was a chronicle of small things. A sandhill one east of Newport, a trench or two at Ypra, a corner of a brick field at La Bassi, a few hundred yards near Arhais, a farm on the Was, a mile in northern Champagne, a coppice in the Argonne, a hillock on the Meuse, part of a wood on the Moselle, some of the high glens in the Wash, and a village or two in Alsace. But these minute advances had their moral value for the troops engaged, and even a certain strategical importance for the campaign. The enemy, as it happened, was in no position for a serious attack, but had he been, Joff's policy must have seriously crippled his chances of success. The tale of these months may be briefly told. In December, there were attacks by the British on the Wiscat Ridge and at Givenchy, and by Moudoui at Vermeer. There was considerable activity in the snow-laden wood of La Grouille in the Argonne and on the crests of the Wouche. In January 1915, the Great Dune near Lombardseed was taken, and for several weeks there was intermittent fighting around Conchy and Givenchy. At Soissons, there was a more serious affair. The French Manouri's right attacked and carried a hill northwest of Cluy, and three days later suffered a crushing counterstroke, which compelled them to fall back across the flooded end, giving the enemy a mile of the southern bank, and leaving a broad shallow wedge in their front. In Champagne, in the end of February, Long de Curry, with the French Fourth Army, made a considerable advance, which pinned down certain German reserves destined for the east, and caused the enemy, on his own admission, greater losses than he had suffered in Masurinland the previous September. In February and March, Sahai made some small gains among the heights of the Wuaf, and a continuous struggle went on among the glens and ridges of the Wuj with the result that, except for Hartmann's Velakov, every gun position on the slopes was held from Ashpark to Gebwella, and all the southern passes and crests were in French hands. But the staple of the campaign was the day-to-day -day work of making and manning entrenchments. There were many observers at the time who saw in the trenches a final reductio ad absurdum of war, who, like Lord Nottingham in the campaigns of Marlborough, declared that a decision was now impossible and that the Allies might fight to all eternity without result. Some such feeling was not absent from the mind of the British cabinet when they began to hunt feverishly for possibilities of attack in distant theatres. But trench fighting is the oldest and most constant of the phases of war. One of the most critical of the world's battles, Alassia, was a trench battle, and Fasadia was a consequence of the trenches of Durazzo. Napoleon knew that period of standstill in a campaign when troops are forced into trenches, as at the Passage in 1807, and before him, Frederick the Great had worked out the philosophy of such a condition. In 1914, the trench lines in the west represented the point at which the battle of movement had come to an end from exhaustion. They were different from those of Marlborough's day because they were continuous and continuously manned so that a breakthrough was not possible without a fiercely contested battle. The trenches of Villaroi and Villa were dug to enable large territories to be held by relatively small forces. Those of 1914 came into being because, since outflanking was out of the question, the opposing forces were too big for the battleground. They were the natural refuge of large armies to whom mobility was denied. When the position was first taken up, trenches were shallow and rough, hastily dug with entrenching tools for a temporary shelter. But as the campaign developed and the line held, they were deepened, improved, 
and connected until they became a vast ramification of ditches and earthworks, defended with barbed wire entanglements and every contrivance that human ingenuity could suggest. They were not a fixed position. Daily, like a glacier, they endeavored to creep farther forward by means of sap and mine. Both sides burrowed towards their opponent's lines, and when successful, a length of trench would leap into the air in a great explosion. There would be a rush of infantry, and a hundred yards of hostile trenches would be won, and if the guards were propitious, held. If a party succeeded in getting into the enemy's trenches, their first task was to block the communication zigzags to prevent a counter-attack. Every night, patrols would creep out into the low man's land between the lines, and occasionally fall in with an enemy patrol and rush it with the bayonet, while magnesium flares lit up the darkness and the guns of both armies awoke. Snipers on both sides were busy all day from pits and prepared positions, and woe betide the unwary man who lifted his head above the ground. The devices of the 18th century campaigns returned. The Japanese had used hand grenades at the siege of Port Arthur and bombs and grenades. Bombardiers and grenadiers in the old sense took their places in our scheme of war. The Germans had for this task the better equipment, and the British soldier fought with bombs made out of jam parts, and every manner of improvisation till scientists and manufacturers at home turned their attention to his new needs. The true weapon against trenches was the artillery. There were first the ordinary field guns, the British 18-pounder, the French 75mm, and the German 77mm, with an effective radius of a couple of miles. Without an artillery preparation, an infantry advance was folly, and the guns were used to damage the enemy's trenches to keep down the fire of the enemy's field guns and occasionally to bombard positions of importance behind the trenches. But field artillery was at some disadvantage in trench warfare as compared with its use in a maneuver battle against advancing infantry. With its flat trajectory, the ordinary field gun did extraordinary little harm to men in trenches two feet wide. Shrapnel proved nearly useless, and the Allied guns took to firing, as far as their supplies permitted, high explosive shell with a percussion fuse. More important were the heavy guns, the 60-pounders, and especially the field howitzers. The immense power of the shell and the fact that it fell from a high angle enabled them literally to destroy the trench which they succeeded in hitting. Again, they had an ordinary range of four to five miles, and this allowed them to be emplaced well to the rear out of any danger from the enemy, unless one of his own howitzers got their range. The heavy guns played a vital part in trench warfare, and most of the advances were due to their preliminary bombardment. That they did not play a greater part was owing to the difficulties under which they were operated, with trenches close up to each other, in many cases not 40 yards off, in some cases scarcely a dozen, it was a risky matter for artillery to bombard the enemy, for the slightest shortage in the flight of a shell caused devastation among their own men. The discomforts of trench warfare can never be removed. At the best, they can be mitigated. In the early days, before 20th November, when regiments were cooped up with their dead for a fortnight under constant fire in shallow mud holes, the misery of it beggared description. As the first violence of the attack ebbed and the Allies were given leisure to revise their trenches, many improvements were introduced, battalions were more frequently relieved, and the whole system was regularized. The strain and the ennui of the work remained, but the physical hardships grew lighter, the trenches were lined and drained, and the communication network was perfected. The British food supplies were excellent. Good feeding will go down to history as a tradition of this army in Flanders, like hard swearing in the case of an earlier expedition. 
frequent reliefs and better provision for billets and baths in the rear did much to ease their lot a battalion which came out of the trenches weary lame dishevelled spiritless and indescribably dirty would be restored in a couple of days to a reasonable smartness and good humour perhaps the officers in those months had the hardest task for them war justified its old definition months of acute boredom punctuated by moments of acute fear the worst part of the business was the wet and this was chiefly felt in the north a dripping winter and the presence of a million men turned west flanders into a gigantic mud hole some parts of the allied line were better than others the allies district was fairly dry so was the clan selabeka rich and the country round missing and wishkat while in the plushtia wood a stretch about two miles long by one mile wide a reasonably comfortable forest colony was established where men could move about with a certain freedom but all along the lease and the ypres canal the trenches were liable to constant flooding and the approaches were seas of mire it was worse still between this mood and the sea where life became merely amphibious tons of wood laid for pathways disappeared in the sloughs a false step on a dark night meant a descent into a quagmire from which a man if happily rescued by his fellows emerged as Trinkolo said of caliban no fish but an islander that had lately suffered by a thunderbolt the lease overflowed its banks and inundated our trenches for eighty yards on each side a brook at festerberg came down in flood and several men in the neighboring trenches were drowned but far worse than any risk to life was the misery of standing for hours up to the waist in icy water of having every pore of the skin impregnated with mud of finding the walls of a trench dissolving in slimy torrents while rifles jammed clothes rotted and feet were frost-bitten it was a lesson in the extremes to which human endurance could go but so efficient was the commissariat work and so ample the provision of comforts and warm clothes that the british sick rate was no more than three per cent lower than that of many garrison towns in peace and inconceivably lower than that of any war of the past the winter was a period of excessive busyness both at the front and at home in britain and in the rural areas of france new levies were being trained with a speed which a year before would have been considered impossible every factory and laboratory was busy devising and manufacturing new weapons and since to most men the war was still an adventure full of hope and the chance of glory there was as yet little slackness and weariness staffs were working out new tactical problems against an advance in the spring and even the governments who had the chance to appreciate more correctly the situation were in a mood of irrational optimism rarely shot with misgivings such a mood did not lend itself to that serious thinking ahead and that disentanglement of the true guide ropes of the problem which were the clamorous needs of the hour few men gave thought to the real weakness of the allied position that a batch of governments united in a loose alliance was confronted by an enemy whose efforts were directed by a single brain and will the problem at the moment seemed to be how to develop the latent resources of france and the british empire not how to use them when developed to the best purpose there was therefore greater progress made in the creation of weapons and the development of minor tactics than in working out the major conceptions of strategy yet in the former sphere it is right to acknowledge the magnitude and earnestness of the work the foundations were being laid for that immense munitionment and those new armies which did not appear fully in the field till nineteen sixteen in the dominion of the air the allies were rapidly drawing ahead france had led the way in experiments and her government between nineteen o nine and nineteen fourteen acquired the largest air fleet in the world 
Germany had at first preferred to interest herself rather in airships than in airplanes, but her military advisers were well aware of the latter's value and had prepared a strong corps. The German aviator was especially trained to reconnaissance work and the task of range finding for the guns and abundantly proved his value in the first weeks of war. The British air service, the last to be started, had been so wisely and energetically developed by Sir David Henderson and his colleagues that in many respects it was the best equipped of all. It contained a military and a naval wing, and to the latter fell most of the destructive work during the winter, when Dusseldorf, Cologne, Friedrichshafen, and other places were visited. And on Christmas Day, a raid was made on the shore defenses and Zeppelin sheds at Kutzhaven. Meantime, the slow process went on of the growth of understanding and good feeling between the Allied armies. France and Britain were given the chance of studying each other at close quarters under the sternest of all trials, and respect sprang up in the heart of each for the other's idiosyncrasies. The ordinary Frenchman was avowedly bored with politics. In no country, perhaps, is the politician, however sterling his virtues, very generally loved. His rewards are so large and immediate, the qualities which lead to a popular success may be so trivial that he gets little sincere admiration except from those engaged or desirous of being engaged in the same line of business. But in France, this aloofness from politics had led not only to a profound distrust of all politicians, but to a certain callousness about the work of government. If a hundred men in Britain, chosen at random, had been asked to name the figures they admired in the past half-century, ninety at least would have mentioned no politician. In France, probably the whole hundred would have produced a list untainted by politics. But in war, war for dear life, all was changed. The state was no longer a knot of bungling officials with long tongues and deep pockets, but France, the lovely and eternal. Forgotten tales and traditions, old fragments of nursery rhymes, the dreams and emotions of boyhood, the memory of kin and home and friends, were fused in a conception of France as a mother to die for, a queen to strive for, a goddess whom the humblest felt for as a lover and a child. Such is the happy gift of the French people. They may seem steeped in anti-nationalism, distracted with narrow class interests, sunk deep in matter, when suddenly the guns speak, and there awakes a tempestuous affection as simple as Joan of Arc, as splendid as the dream of a crusader. It is another privilege of the race that they are not afraid of heroics. They believe in doing fine things finely with the grand air. They have no self-consciousness. War is a new world where familiar conventions do not apply, and they rise to the heights of its novelty. The Marseillaise becomes not an ordinary marching tune, but a psalm of battle. The trickler is not a flag but the art of the covenant. War is a high adventure, and the man who in normal times sold haberdashery in the Rue du Viverly trailed a rifle in the Argan woods with a wild poetry in his head. Again and again, we find a touch of noble rhetoric in their deeds and speeches. They were gay after the traditional French manner, but it was not the stolid gaiety of good health and spirits but a sister to fierce anger and first cousin to tears. For all the ranks of France, the war was a crusade, and they moved to it with the consciousness of destiny and with the high seriousness of Raymond before the walls of Jerusalem. Some day a poet will arise to sing of these new armies of the Republic. They were different from any that had gone before different from Napoleon's troops, intoxicated with dreams of glory or the puzzled levies of 1870. They were an armed nation with every class and condition in their ranks. 
the easy camaraderie of peacetime between man and officer gave way to a stern self-imposed discipline and a passionate loyalty to their leaders in these leaders we find republican dignity at its best the heroics of france were in the soul and world famous army commanders were scarcely to be distinguished in dress and mode of living from the ordinary man the land had found what cromwell sought the plain rosette coats captain who knows what he fights for and loves what he knows the british soldier was psychologically a world apart in normal times he was more political than the frenchman more interested in his government and he had perhaps a more ready consciousness of the nation as something above and beyond ordinary things he was always prepared to back his own side as he would do in a football match and his own side though he never tried to define it was in a dim way a conception of britain hence the war worked no very startling revolution in his point of view he was a professional man at arms and war meant simply a busy period for his profession and a good deal of overtime he fought therefore partly out of professional pride partly from a natural love of adventure and partly from loyalty to his side i speak of the british regular and what i have written did not apply in the same degree to the territorials or to the new service battalions formed after the outbreak of war in which many men enlisted solely from motives of duty and patriotism and we had more affinities with the national army such as the french the british regular went to war as a matter of everyday business and he considered it his duty to turn the most desperate affair into something homely and familiar war was not to him a new world and he did not see why because of it he should forego his ordinary tastes and habits so we find him under heavy fire discussing hotly the merits of his favorite football team and playing games in his scanty leisure and diffusing over the whole ghastly business of slaughter the atmosphere of a placid english saturday afternoon he declined to make much of anything while fifty miles from the firing line his letters might unliven his relations with accounts of horrors how he had no candle but was writing by the light of bursting shells but when he got into the real business he wrote that he wanted a new pipe and hoped that all are well as this leaves me at present he was a hopeless puzzle to his enemies here was a being who seemed without seriousness who never talked about glory or his country who prided himself on professing a dislike for war who behaved when he was allowed as if he were in a garrison town at home and yet who proved resistless in attack and unshakable in defence was he merely a capable hireling an efficient mercenary if so how by all the laws of history should he be able to stand against single-hearted patriots the answer is that he was the best of patriots but he was a briton and had his own way of showing it he was naturally shy of heroics the german soldier went into battle with his songs about the rhine and his fatherland the british soldier could not do that to save his life he would have felt a fool or a play actor so when he sang it was a music hall jingle or some doggerel of his own composition the kind of thing he would shout himself hoarse over in peace he was as fond of his home as any rylander the highlander had in his memory the long ceiling of the misty island the irishman some thatched cluster amid the brown mosses of the west the english countryman some village of the green south but they did not talk about them for talk would have spoiled their sacredness they had found out the best device for keeping nerves steady in a nerve-wracking war and that was to pretend that the whole affair was nothing out of the common cheer up my lad said the sergeant to the anxious recruit in the trenches i've always heard as how is the first seven years of war as is the worst the british regulars fighting temper was set for seven years more if necessary 
a campaign fought in this sober, practical spirit must be barren of legends. In Flanders, as they sang in the American Civil War, we were tenting again on the old camp ground, and with a more susceptible race, we should have heard tales of grey goose shafts in the air, and phantom knights on dim horses, and periwigged captains leading ghostly cohorts. The Russians in the east saw St. George with his great spear riding in their van, but any tales that came to be told were invented at home, for our army did not see visions. Scot and Irish and Welsh had alike come under the spell of a common Britishness, which is cherry of speech and fancy. The British soldier is deeply humorous in war, and his character therein is precisely his character in peace. It is no high-strung gaiety, but ordinary good spirits, and a talent for farce. He is profoundly inventive in language, with a gift of ridiculous nomenclature which takes the worst edge of his hardships. Humor and soundness of heart make up sportsmanship, and he is nothing if not a good sportsman. You see this in his attitude towards the enemy. He had none of that childish venom of hate which was officially regarded in Germany as the proper spirit in which to fight battles. He respected his opponents and would allow no one to cry down their fighting value. A bad black lot, no doubt, said a Scot soldier of the Germans. But not the ones opposite us. They are very respectable men and grand fighters. The dreary business of trench warfare was relieved by practical jokes upon the enemy and much chaffing, to which he frequently replied in the same spirit. A famous Berlin clan in the German trenches occasionally went through performances amid the applause of both sides. A certain German sniper with a completely bald head was preserved by one battalion as a keeper preserves a rare hybrid and when they were moved to another part of the front, they left instructions to their successors that the old fellow was not to be killed. Outposts have always fraternized to some extent. They did it in the peninsula and in the Crimea, and the close contact of the lines led to the extraordinary truce of Christmas Day. Possibly it was connived at by the commanders on both sides, for some of our trenches were nearly flooded out and the Germans had much timbering to do. In the French part of the field, there was little of this fraternizing. They had wrongs to avenge, too many and too deep for these amenities of war. Had the British been holding lines in the Midlands, with a wasted East Anglia before them, there would have been little inclination to exchange courtesies with the enemy. The French and British tempers in war were the product of national character. Each was fine in itself, each had merits which the other lacked, each was omnipotent in certain forms of fighting, and the combination of the two in one battle front was fortunate and formidable. In the essentials, they were one, for behind the exaltation of the French lay a profound practical talent, and beneath the prose of the British attitude was a shining devotion. It rarely found expression in words, but Sir Francis Doyce, drunken private of the Buffs, the troopers who went down with the Birken Head, the Marines of the Victoria, and a hundred deeds in this campaign were proof of its presence. From the letter of a young officer who fell in the October battles, I take some sentences which put soberly in the English fashion this abiding impulse. Try not to worry too much about the war. Units and individuals cannot count. Remember, we are writing a new page of history. Future generations cannot be allowed to read of the decline of the British Empire and attribute it to us. We live our little lives and die. Some are given chances of proving themselves men, and to others no chance comes. Whatever our individual faults or virtues are matters little, for when we are up against big things, we must forget individuals. Some will live and many will die. We cannot count the loss. It is far better to go out with honor than to survive with shame. End of chapter 20
Chapter 21 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Raids and Blockades. November 2nd, 1914 to March 31st, 1915. The war in northern waters now entered upon a phase which had few parallels in the conflicts of the past. An old dread took bodily form and its embodiment proved farcical. Exasperated by failure, Germany cast from her all the ancient etiquette of war, and the result was that the law of the sea had to be largely rewritten. The shores of Britain, since the days of Paul Jones, had been immune from serious hostile attentions. Very properly, she regarded her navy as her defense, and paid little heed to coast fortifications except at important naval stations such as Portsmouth and Dover. But the possibility of invasion remained in the popular mind, and was used as a goad to stir us to activity in our spasmodic fits of national stock-taking. Invasion on the grand scale was admittedly out of the question so long as our fleets held the sea, but a raid in the fall of a winter's night was conceivable and became a favorite theme of romancers and propagandists. When the war broke out, the menace was seriously regarded by the government, and during October and November, when the German guns across the channel were within hearing of our southern ports, steps were taken to protect our eastern coast line. We needed every atom of our strength for the great Flanders struggle, and if a raiding party succeeded in occupying a stretch of shore, the necessity of dislodging him might gravely handicap our major strategy. Accordingly, yeomanry and territorials entrenched themselves in the eastern counties and had the dullness of their days enlivened by many rumors. Civilians were perturbed by the thought of how they should conduct themselves if their homes were violated, and there was much activity in the formation of national guards and a considerable increase in recruiting for the new service armies. Late on the afternoon of 2nd November, eight German warships sailed from the Elbe base. There were three battle cruisers, the Seiglitz, the Motka, and the Von der Tarn, two armored cruisers, the Blucher and the York, and three light cruisers, the Kobeck, the Graudenz, and the Strasbourg. Except the York, they were fast vessels, making at least 25 knots, and the battle cruisers carried 11-inch guns. Cleared for action, they started for the coast of England, and early in the winter dawn ran through the nets of a British fishing fleet eight miles east of Lowestoft. An old mine-sweeping gunboat, the Halcyon, was next sighted and received a few shots, but the Germans had no time to waste on her. About eight o'clock, they were opposite Yarmouth, and proceeded to bombard the wireless station and the naval air station from a distance of about 10 miles. For some reason or other, they were afraid to venture farther inshore. Probably, they took their range from a line of boys marked on the chart, and did not know that, after the declaration of war, these boys had been moved 500 yards farther out to sea, so their shells only ploughed the sands and plumped in the water. In a quarter of an hour, they grew tired of it and moved away, dropping many floating mines, which later in the day caused the loss of one of our submarines and two fishing boats. The enterprise was unlucky, for on the road back, the York struck a mine and went to the bottom with most of her crew. The raid was a reconnaissance, and a blow aimed at the son foie of Britain. The later purpose miscarried, for nobody in Britain gave it a second thought. To bombard the beach front of a watering place seemed a paltry achievement, when at the moment the opportunity was present to interfere with Admiral Hood on the Belgian coast. It would have been wiser had the authorities taken it more seriously, and issued instructions to civilians as to what to do in case of a repetition of such attempts. For having found a way, the invaders were certain to return. They came again on 16th December, when a thick cold mist lay low on our eastern coasts. 
von Spee and his squadron had gone to their death at the Falkland Islands, and it behoved the German navy to strike a blow in return. The raiding force, which was under Rear Admiral Hipper, commanding the battle cruiser's squadron, included the Der Flinger, the newest of the battle cruisers, and the von der Tarn. The Blucher was there, and the Cyclists and the Graudens, and there were also at least two light cruisers present. Before daybreak on the 16th, the squadron arrived off the mouth of the Tees and there divided its forces. The Der Flinger, the von der Tarn, and the Blucher went north to raid the Hartlepools, and the other two went south against Scarborough. A few minutes before eight o'clock, those citizens of Scarborough who were out of bed saw approaching from the north four strange ships. It was a still morning with what is called in Scotland a har on the water and something of a sea running, for the last days had been stormy. Scarborough was entirely without defences, except an old Russian sixty-pounder, a Crimean relic which was as useful as the flint arrowheads in the local museum. It had once been a garrison artillery depot and had a battery below the castle, but Lord Hodain had altered this and made it a cavalry station. Some troops of the new service battalions were quartered in the place, and there was a wireless station behind the town. Otherwise, it was an open seaside resort as defenseless against an attack from the sea as a seal against a killer whale. The ships poured shells into the Coast Guard station and the castle grounds, where they seemed to suspect the presence of hostile batteries. Then they steamed in front of the town, approaching to some 500 yards from the shore. Here they proceeded to a systematic bombardment, aiming at every large object within sight, including the Grand Hotel and the gas works while many shells were directed towards the waterworks and the wireless station in the western suburbs. Churches, public buildings, and hospitals were hit, and some private houses were wrecked. For 40 minutes, the bombardments continued, and it was calculated that 500 shells were fired. Midway in their course, the ships swung round and began to move northwards again, while the light cruisers went out to sea and began the work of mine dropping. The streets were crowded with puzzled and scared inhabitants, and, as in every watering place, there was a large proportion of old people, women, and invalids. At a quarter to nine, all was over, and the holes of the invaders were disappearing round the castle palmetry. They left behind them eighteen dead, mostly women and children, and about seventy wounded. About nine o'clock, the Coast Guard at Whippy, the little town on the cliffs north of Scarborough, saw two great ships steaming up fast from the south. Ten minutes later, the newcomers opened fire on the signal station on the cliff head. Several dozen shells were fired in a few minutes, many striking the cliff, and others going too high and falling behind the railway station. Some actually went four miles inland and awakened a sleepy little village. The old abbey of Hilda and Catman was struck but not seriously damaged, and on the whole, considering the number of shells it received, would be suffered little. The casualties were only five, three killed, and two wounded. The invaders turned northeastward and disappeared into the haze to join their other division. That other division had visited the Hartlepools, the only town of the three which came near to fulfilling the definition of a defended place. It had a fort with a battery of antiquated guns. It had important docks and large shipbuilding works, which were busy at the time on government orders, and some companies of the new service battalions were billeted in the town. Off the shore was lying a small British flotilla, a gunboat, the patrol carrying four-inch guns, and two destroyers, the Doon and the Hardy. About the same time as the bombardment of Scarborough began, the Der Flinger, the Von der Tarn, and the Blucher came out of the mist upon the British flotilla and opened fire. The action took place on the north side of the peninsula on which Old Hartlepool stands. 
with great gallantry, the small British craft tried to close and torpedo the invaders, but they were driven back with half a dozen killed and twenty-five wounded, and their only course was flight. The German ships approached the shore and fired on the battery. Then began the first fight on English soil with a foreign foe since the French landed in success in 1690. The first on the soil of Great Britain since the affair at Fishgard in 1797. The achievement deserves to be remembered. The garrison of the battery consisted of some territorials of the Durham Royal Garrison Artillery and some infantry of the Durhams. The 12-inch shells of the Der Flinger burst in and around the battery, but the men stood to their outclassed guns without wavering and aimed with success at the upper decks of the invaders. For more than half an hour, a furious cannonade continued, in which some 1,500 shells seemed to have been fired. One ship kept close to the battery and gave it broadside after broadside. The other two moved farther north, shelled Old Hartlepool, and fired over the peninsula at West Hartlepool and the docks. The streets of the old town suffered terribly. The gas works were destroyed, and one of the big shipbuilding yards was damaged, but the docks and the other yards were not touched. Churches, hospitals, workhouses, and schools were all struck. Little children going to school and babes in their mother's arms were killed. The total death roll was 119 and the wounded over 300. 600 houses were damaged or destroyed, and three steamers that night struck the mines which the invaders had laid off the shore and went down with much loss of life. The spirit in which the inhabitants of the raided towns met the crisis was worthy of the highest praise. There was dire confusion for nobody had been told what to do. There was some panic. It would have been a miracle if there had not been. But on the whole, the situation was faced with admirable coolness and courage. The authorities, as soon as the last shots were fired, turned to the work of relief. The territorials in Hartlepool behaved like veterans both during and after the bombardment. The girls in the telephone exchange worked steadily through the cannonade. It should be remembered that we cannot compare this attack on the east coast towns with the assaults in a land war on some city in the battle front. In the latter case, the mind of the inhabitants has been attuned for weeks to danger, and preparations have been made for defense. But here the boat came from the blue. The narrow, crowded streets of Old Hartlepool were a death trap and the ordinary citizen was plunged in a second from profound peace into the midst of a nerve-wracking and unexpected war. Somewhere between nine and ten on that December morning, the German vessels rendezvoused and started on their homeward course. They escaped only by the skin of their teeth. Before the first shell was fired, word of the attempt had reached the British Grand Fleet. Somewhere out in the Har. Beatty, with his battle cruisers, was moving to intercept the raiders, and behind came half a dozen of the great battleships. But for an accident of weather, the German battle cruisers' squadron would have gone to the bottom of the North Sea. But the morning har thickened, till a series of blind fog belts stretched four hundred miles east from our shores. This lamentable miscarriage was due solely to the weather and not to any lack of skill and enterprise on the part of our emeralds. Our destroyers had been in action with the raiders before dawn. As late as 11.30 p.m., one of our cruisers was in contact with the German light force, and just after noon, the enemy was sighted by our battleships. But as the trap seemed about to close, the fog thickened, and Admiral Hipper slipped through. The German battle fleet, which had followed the battle cruisers, had turned for home early in the morning. The raiders returned safely to the Heligoland base, to be welcomed with iron crosses and newspaper eulogies on this new proof of German valor. On that same day, the Admiralty issued a message pointing out that demonstrations of this character against unfortified towns or commercial ports 
though not difficult to accomplish, provided that a certain amount of risk is accepted, a devoid of military significance. They must not, it was added, be allowed to modify the general naval policy which is being pursued. The first was a pardonable overstatement, unless we interpret the word military in a narrow sense. These raids had a very serious military and naval purpose, which it would have been well to recognize. The German aim was to create such a panic in civilian England as would prevent the dispatch of the new armies to the continent, and to compel Jellico and the Grand Fleet to move their base nearer the east coast, and undertake the duties of coast protection. The first was defeated by the excellent spirit in which England accepted the disaster. No voice was raised to clamor for the use of the new armies as a garrison for our seaboard. The second, though at first there was some natural indignation on the threatened coast, and a few foolish speeches and newspaper articles, had no chance of succeeding. In vain is the net spread in sight of the bird. The only result was that more stringent measures were taken to prevent espionage, that civilians were at last given some simple emergency directions, and that recruiting received the best possible advertisement. Germany made much of the exploit, till she discovered that neutral nations, especially America, were seriously scandalized, and then she had recourse to explanations. Scarborough had been bombarded because it had a wireless station, Whitby because it had a naval signal station, Hartlepool because it had a little fort. Technically, she could make out a kind of argument, and Hartlepool might fairly be said to have come within the category of a defended place. It was true that the fortifications were lamentably inadequate, but she could retort that that was Britain's business, not hers. But the real answer is that she did not aim at the destruction of military and naval accessories, except as an afterthought. The seafront of Scarborough and the streets of Old Hartlepool were bombarded not because they were in the line of fire against a fort or a wireless station, but for their own sakes, because they contained a multitude of people who could be killed or terrorized. If Germany had the exact plans of the coast ports and of their condition at the time, as she certainly had, she knew very well how far they were from being fortified towns or military and naval bases. She selected them just because they were open towns. For frightfulness, that would have far greater moral effects upon the nation than if it had been directed against Harwich or Dover where it might be regarded as one of the natural risks of war. Her performance was not a bridge of a technicality, for it was only a logical extension of an admitted principle. But such a barbarous extension was in itself a bridge of the unwritten conventions of honorable campaigning. The slaughter of civilians to produce an impression was one of those things repellent to any man trained in the etiquette of a great service. The German navy had been justly admired, but it was beginning to show its parvenu origin. Individual sailors might conduct themselves like gentlemen, but there was no binding tradition of gentility in the service, and, as in the army, those at the head disliked and repudiated any such weakness. The last word was with the mayor of Scarborough. Some newcomers, he wrote, into honorable professions learned the tricks before the traditions. The British casualties by sea, apart from the losses in battle, were not serious during the last months of the year, but on the first day of 1915, there was a grave misfortune. On the 31st of December, eight vessels of the Channel Fleet left Sheerness, and about three o'clock on the morning of 1st January, in bright moonlight, the eight were steering in single line at a moderate speed near the start lighthouse. There was no screen of destroyers, and the situation invited an attack from submarines, several of which had been reported in these waters. The last of the line was the formidable Captain Lossley, a pre-dreadnought of 15,000 tons, and a sister ship to the Boer, which had been blown up at Sheerness on 26 November. Some time after three, she was struck by two torpedoes and went down. Four boats were launched, 
one of which capsized, and out of a crew of some 800, only 201 were saved. The rescue of part of the crew was due to the courage and good seamanship of Captain William Pillar of the Bresham Trawler, Provident, who, in heavy weather, managed to take the inmates of the formidable cutter aboard his vessel. The misfortune showed that the lesson of the loss of the Creasy, Hogue, and Abakir had been imperfectly learned. For eight battleships to move slowly in line on a moonlit night in submarine-infested waters without destroyers was simply to court destruction. Early on the morning of Sunday, 24th January, Rear Admiral Hipper, who commanded the German battlecruiser squadron, left William Schaffen with a strong force to repeat his exploit of the previous month. The von der Tann was still undergoing repairs, but he had with him the side lids in which he flew his flag, the Motka, the Der Flinger, the Blucher, six light cruisers, one of which was the Kobach, and the destroyer flotilla. To recapitulate their strengths, the Der Flinger had 26,200 tons, a speed of nearly 27 knots, an armored belt of 12 inches and 8 12-inch guns. The side lids had 24,600 tons, the same speed, and 10 11-inch guns. The Motka had 22,640 tons, 25 knots, and 10 11-inch guns. The Blucher had 15,550 tons, 24 knots, and 12 8.2-inch guns. Before starting, Admiral Hipper took certain precautions. He enlarged the minefield north of Heligoland, and north of it concentrated a submarine flotilla, while he arranged for tablins and seaplanes to come out from the island in certain contingencies. His main motive, assuming that he encountered part of the British fleet, was to retire and fight a running action, and entice our vessels within reach of his submarines or the Heligoland mine field. The same morning, the British battlecruisers under Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty put to sea. A hint of the German preparations had reached the Admiralty, and developments were anticipated. He flew his flag in the Lion, Captain A. S. M. Chatfield, a vessel of 26,350 tons, nearly 29 knots, and an armament of eight 13.5-inch guns. With him sailed five other battle cruisers, the Tiger, Captain Henry Pelly, 28,000 tons, 28 knots, eight 13.5-inch guns. The Princess Royal, Captain Osman Brock, a sister ship of the Lion. The New Zealand, Captain Nionel Halsey, 18,800 tons, 25 knots, and 8 12-inch guns. The Indomitable, Captain Francis Kennedy, a sister ship of the Invincible and Inflexible, which were in the Battle of the Falkland Islands. With the battle cruisers went four cruisers of the town class, the Southampton, the Nottingham, the Birmingham, and the Lowestoft, three light cruisers, the Arethusa, the Aurora, and the Undaunted, and destroyer flotillas, under commander Reginald Tewitt. Admiral Beatty's squadron completely outclassed Admiral Hipper's alike in numbers, pace, and weight of fire, and the Germans were heavily handicapped by the presence of the Blucher, whose low speed of only 24 knots marked her out as a predestined prey. The night of Saturday, the 23rd, had been foggy, and the destroyers, scouting east of the Dogger Bank, had a difficult time. Sunday morning, however, dawned clear and sharp, for the wind had changed to the northeast and swept the mist from the seas. About seven o'clock, the Aurora, Captain Wilmot Nicholson, sighted the Germans off the Docker Bank, signaled the news to Piety, and presently opened fire. Piety steered to the direction of the flashes, and Hipper, who had been moving northwest, promptly turned round and took a course to the southeast. This sudden flight, when he could not have been informed of the enemy's strength, made it plain that the German admiral's main purpose was to lure our vessels to the dangerous Heligoland area. 
about 8 o'clock, the situation was as follows. The Germans were moving southeast in line with the Motka leading, followed by the cyclists, their flinger and blucher, with the destroyers on their starboard beam and the light cruisers ahead. Close upon them were the British destroyers and light cruisers, who presently crossed on the port side to prevent their smoke from spoiling the marksmanship of the larger vessels. Our battle cruisers did not follow directly behind, but in order to avoid the mines which the enemy was certain to drop, kept on a parallel course to the westward. The lion led, followed by the tiger, the princess royal, the New Zealand, and the indomitable. What followed was an extraordinary tribute to the engineers. The first three ships could easily be worked up to 30 knots, but the last two, which had normally only 25 knots, were so strenuously driven that they managed to keep in line. Our leading ships had the pace of the Germans, and no one of our squadron was seriously outclassed, while the unfortunate Blucher, on the other hand, was bound to drop behind. Fourteen miles at first separated Beatty from the enemy, and by nine o'clock he was within eleven and a half miles of the last ship. The lion fired a ranging shot which fell short, but soon after nine, when the squadrons were ten miles apart, she got her first blow home on the blucher. As our line began to draw level, the tiger continued to attack the blucher, while the lion attended to the deflinger. At 9.30, the Blucher had fallen so much astern that she came within range of the guns of the New Zealand, and the Lion and the Tiger were busy with the leading German ship, the Seidlitz, while the Princess Royal attacked the Deflinger. The Motka, first in the line, got off lightly because of the smoke which obscured the target. Our destroyers and light cruisers had dropped behind, but presently, when the German destroyers threatened the Meteor and M Division, under Captain the Honorable Herbert Meade, went ahead and took up a position of great danger in the very thick of the firing. The British gunnery was precise, shell after shell hitting a pinpoint 10 miles off, a pinpoint 2 moving at over 30 miles an hour. It was not a broadside action, for the ships at which we aimed were stern on. At first sight, this looks like a disadvantage, but in practice, it had been found to give the best results, and that for a simple reason. To get the line is an easy matter. The difficulty is to get the right elevation. In a broadside action, a shell which is too high falls harmlessly beyond the vessel, because the target is only the narrow width of the deck. But in a stern-on fight, the target is the whole length of the vessel. 600 feet or more, instead of 90. By 11 o'clock, the sidelids and the deflinger were on fire. The blucher had fallen behind in flames and was being battered by the New Zealand and the indomitable. An hour later, the meteor torpedoed her and she began to sink. The crew lined up on deck ready for death and it was only the shouts of the Arethusa that made them jump into the water. With a cheer, they went overboard, and none too soon, for presently the blucher turned turtle and floated bottom upwards. Our boat rescued over 120 of the swimmers and would have saved more had not some German aircraft from Heligoland dropped bombs upon the rescue parties and killed several German sailors. The airmen clearly thought that the blucher was a sinking British cruiser, and this may have been the basis of the preposterous tale of our losses which the German Admiralty subsequently published. We return to the doings of the three leading battle cruisers. The German destroyers managed to get between them and the enemy, and under cover of their smoke, the Germans made a half turn to the north and increased the distance. Beatty promptly altered his course to conform. The destroyers then attacked at close quarters, hoping to torpedo, but the four-inch guns amidships in the battle cruisers drove them off. Presently, submarines were sighted, and Beatty himself saw a periscope on the starboard bow of the Lion. 
The flagship at this time was much under fire, but suffered remarkably little damage. Just before eleven, however, as her bow lifted from the water, it was struck by a shell which damaged the feed tank. She had to reduce her speed and fell out of the line. This accident had unfortunate effects on the battle, which up to now had been going strongly in the British favor. Beatty had to transfer his flag to the destroyer, attack, and the charge of the pursuing battle cruisers passed to the next senior officer, Rear Admiral Moore, whose flag flew in the New Zealand. The Lion moved away to the northwest, and in the afternoon her engines began to give serious trouble. The indomitable, released by the sinking of the Blucher, took her in tow, and after some anxious hours, she was brought safely into an English port. The attack, meantime, followed hard on the battle cruisers, but it was not till twenty minutes past twelve that she overtook the Princess Royal, to which Beatty transferred his flag. He found that the squadron had broken off the fight and was retiring. The reason which led Emerald Moore to this step was fear of a German minefield, but it would appear that the British squadron at the moment of turning was 70 miles from Heligoland, and probably at least 40 from the new minefield which Emerald Hipper had laid. The consequence was that what might have been a crushing victory was changed to a disappointment. The British losses were few, 10 men killed on the Tiger, four on the meteor and six wounded on the lion no british vessel was lost and the hurt to the flagship was soon repaired the germans lost the brucher the deflinger and the sidelits were seriously damaged and many of their crews must have perished but such minor successes were little better than a failure when we were within an ace of destroying the whole german force of battle cruisers the Battle of the Docker Bank is chiefly of interest as the first action where destroyers were employed to make torpedo attacks on capital ships. To Germany, the result was a grave annoyance, which was covered by a cloud of inaccurate reports. Hipper was apparently not held responsible, but Engenoy became the target of criticism. He was shortly afterwards removed from the command of the high sea fleet, and its place taken by Admiral von Poy. Three weeks later, the British First Lord of the Admiralty made a statement in the House of Commons, which summed up the recent work of the Navy and drew the attention of the nation to the lessons of the Docker Bank action. The power of the great guns, the excellence of British gunnery, the immense advantage of speed. He pointed out that, at five to four in representative ships, the enemy did not think it prudent to engage, that, should the great fleets join in battle, Britain could put into line a preponderance both in quality and numbers far greater than five to four, and that this extra margin might be regarded as an additional insurance against unexpected preliminary losses by mines and submarines. The total naval losses, mainly by submarine, had been 5,500 officers and men. For the loss of these British lives, we have lived through six months of this war safely and even prosperously. We have established for the time being a command of the sea such as we had never expected, such as we have never known, and such as our ancestors have never known at any other period of our history. In the concluding words of this speech, Mr. Churchill foreshadowed the possibility of further naval pressure against an enemy who, as a matter of deliberate policy, places herself outside all international obligations. He referred especially to the imports of food, hitherto unhindered, and his pronostication was soon verified. From the beginning of the struggle, merchandise, which was not contraband of war, had been allowed to pass into Germany in neutral vessels. But on the 26th of January, the German government announced their intention of seizing all stocks of corn and flour, and forbade all private transactions as from that morning. This meant that grain had become a munition of war for it was no longer possible to distinguish between imports for the civilian population and for the army in the field. 
Accordingly, the British government had to revise its practice. The American steamer Wilhelmina, laden with a cargo of foodstuffs for Germany, was stopped at Falmouth, and the case referred to the prize courts. In this policy, Britain did not depart from the traditional principles of international practice. She did not, as yet, propose to seize non-contraband goods in neutral vessels. All that happened was that certain goods, which were normally non-contraband, were now made contraband by the action of Germany. The economic and legal bearing of these events will be discussed in the next chapter. Here, it is sufficient to note the actual consequences. Germany, much perturbed by the unforeseen results of her declaration, attempted to modify it by announcing that imports of food would not be used for military purposes. But such a declaration could not be accepted by Britain, for it was not possible in practice. Then, in a fit of wrath, Germany took the bold step of declaring war against all British merchandise war which would follow none of the old rules for it would be conducted by submarines who had no facilities even if they had the disposition to rescue the crews she further announced that from eighteenth february onward the waters around the british isles would be considered a war region and that any enemy merchant vessels found there would be destroyed without its always being possible to warn the crew or passengers of the dangers threatening the sea passage north of the Shetlands and the coastal waters of the Netherlands were declared to be exempt from this menace. The blockade of Britain was not a blockade in any technical sense. Germany merely specified certain tracts of water in which she proposed to commit acts which were forbidden by every code of naval warfare. In 1806, Napoleon had issued an earlier Berlin decree in which he proclaimed the British Isles to be in a state of blockade. He could not enforce it, and British trade, so far from suffering, actually increased in the ensuing years. But Napoleon, though he used the word blockade improperly, sought his purpose by means which were not repugnant to the ethics of civilized war. Germany, utterly incapable of a real blockade, could only succeed by traditioning her last remnants of decency. An inferior boxer may get an advantage over a strong opponent if he gouges his eyes. The German announcement not unnaturally gave serious concern to neutral nations, especially to America. Germany had warned them that neutral ships might perish in the general holocaust, and their anxiety was increased by an incident which happened on 6 February. The Cunada Lusitania, which had a number of Americans on board, arrived at Liverpool flying the American flag. Such a use in emergencies is a recognized practice of war. One of Paul Jones's lieutenants passed successfully through the British Channel fleet by hoisting British colors, and the British Foreign Office was justified in defending the custom. But clearly, if it was made habitual, it would greatly increase the risks of neutrals, and America had some grounds for her request that it should not be used frequently and deliberately. The next step of the British government was to close absolutely to all ships of all nations the greater part of the North Channel leading from the Atlantic to the Irish Sea. Then on 1st March, Mr. Asquith announced in the House of Commons that the Allies held themselves free to detain and take into port all ships carrying goods of presumed enemy origin, ownership, or destination. No neutral vessel which sailed from a German port after 1st March would be allowed to proceed, and no vessel after that date would be suffered to sail to any German port. It was not proposed to confiscate such vessels or their contents, but they would be detained. Thus, tardily, in the eighth month of war, did Britain make use of her chief asset in the struggle, and revealed the paradoxical spectacle of the greatest of the world's naval powers, waiting to declare a blockade of her enemy till her enemy had first proclaimed a blockade of her. 
Mr. Asquith's announcement implied the strict blockade of Germany and was defended by him not as a fulfillment of but as a departure from international law upon the subject. It was, in his view, a legitimate retaliation against a foe which had broken not only every international rule but every moral obligation. Clearly, it could not be an effective blockade in the strictest sense, but it may be noted that it was at least as effective as the blockade proclaimed by the North in the American Civil War when a highly indented coastline of 3,000 miles was washed by only 12 ships. Before 18th February, the day of destiny, German submarines had been busy against British merchantmen. They had succeeded from the beginning of the year in sinking eight, and they had been wholly unscrupulous in their proceedings, as was proved by the attack of Arp upon the hospital ship Asturias. By 24th February, they had sunk seven more. By 10th March, another four. By 17th March, another eight. By 24th March, another three. By 31st March, another three. If we take the total arrivals and sailings of overseas steamers of all nationalities above 300 tons to and from ports in the United Kingdom during that period, we shall find that the losses worked out at about three per thousand. It was not a brilliant achievement. The mountain which had been in travail with awesome possibilities brought forth an inconsiderable mouth. The blockade hindered the sailing of scarcely a British ship. It did not raise the price of any necessary by a farthing, but it damaged what was left of Germany's reputation in the eyes of the civilized world, and it increased, if increase were needed, the determination of the Allies to make an end of this crazy international anarchism. Some of the commanders of the German submarines, notably Captain Wettigen, who lost his life went about the business as decently as their orders allowed. Others, such as the miscreant who sang the falaba, torpedoed the vessel before the passengers were in the boats, and jeered at the drowning. In the German navy, as in the German army, humanity depended upon the idiosyncrasies of individual commanders, for it had small place in the logic of her official traditions. It was a curious comment upon Baron Marshal von Biebenstein's proud boast at the Hague. The officers of the German Navy, I say it with emphasis, will always fulfill in the strictest manner duties which flow from the unwritten law of humanity and civilization. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. Economics and Law If a great war is a package of surprises for the strategist, it is not less so for the economist and the jurist. It is proposed in the present chapter to examine briefly some of the phenomena which at the outset appeared in the provinces of the two latter and the task can scarcely be neglected, for they were vital matters to the civilian part of the nations concerned. War is fought with a weapon of which the steel point is the armies, and the shaft which gives weight to the blow the civilian masses pursuing their ordinary advocations. The lustiest stroke will miscarry if the shaft be rotten. For a generation, economists had prophesied that in a world war, the dislocation of credit and the destruction of wealth would be so stupendous that the whole machinery of modern life would come to a standstill. Their prophecies were curiously wrong, not unnaturally, perhaps, for political economy is a bad ground for forecasts. It is not an exact science, except within the narrowest limits. It selects and abstracts its data and its rules work strictly only in a rarefied and unnatural world. This war left the economist, if he were pedantically inclined, in a state of bewilderment. Wild heresies were applied and worked sufficiently well. Deductions, mathematically exact, were falsified. Certain things which by every law should happen were never heard of. The jurist had surprises also, but of a different kind. He saw a stock of laws under which it seemed the world had agreed 
flung again into the melting pot. He began to realize the dependence of law upon opinion, its malleability, the delicacy of its sanctions. For him, it was a bracing experience and highly educative. For the more rigid type of economist, it was a penance and a confusion. War both complicates and simplifies the economic situation. The ribs of the state show when the comfortable petting falls off. In examining the economics of the struggle, we must first of all make a distinction between a country like Britain, where the normal life still in essentials continued, and a country like Germany, where everything necessarily was mobilized for war. Britain had all the world open to her, except the belligerent countries. Her factories were still working largely on private contracts. She was still exporting and importing, and paying for imports by exports. She was still the financial center of the world, with relations with foreign bursars and banks, financing her allies and her overseas dominions with ships on every sea doing the carrying trade of other nations besides herself. Britain's economic problem, therefore, was rather complicated than simplified. She had to keep her ordinary life going and adopt special measures to repair those parts of the mechanism which had been crippled by war. The same was true of France and Russia in a less degree. The one had universal service and the enemy inside her frontiers. The other had no trade outlets to the west during most of the winter months, but both were in touch with the outer world. Germany and Austria, on the other hand, were approaching the position of a beleaguered garrison. They could do no trade except with or through their adjacent neutrals, and every day the volume of this must diminish. What imports they got must be paid for by gold or foreign securities, for they had no exports. They must be self-sufficing and self-sustaining, and revert to the economy of the primitive state. Their problem was therefore greatly simplified. All the machinery of foreign bills and foreign exchanges and foreign debts or credits had stopped short. They had one great occupation, to provide out of the existing resources sufficient raw material and sufficient food for army and people. So long as the nation was agreed, internal payments could be easily regulated, and paper money could be indefinitely created. If Germany were destined to win, the highest milk circulation would be redeemed with ease. External payments did not trouble her, for there were none that mattered. Let us imagine a case where a hundred men shut off fifty in a castle and sit down to invest it. The besiegers will get their food from a wide neighborhood and must pay for it in cash or get it on credit. They must keep up good relations with the people who sell bread and gunpowder and be able to send to their homes and fetch what they want. They will live, in short, the ordinary economic life of the rest of the world. But the fifty in the fortress are in a very different case. They cannot get out and nothing can come in. So they must use the food in the castle larder and the ammunition in the castle magazine and make more if the castle garden is large enough to grow potatoes and there is any stock of charcoal and saltpeter in the cellars. Their captain will have to take charge of the stores and dole them out carefully. He will pay his men their wages from the gold he may happen to have with him or more likely in promissory notes to be redeemed when they are relieved, or hack their way out to their own land. The economic problem which he has to face may be desperate and urgent, but it is simple. The British situation represented the extreme antithesis to that of Germany. It developed on lines mainly normal in a world mainly abnormal. But at the beginning, when men's minds were uneasy, certain emergency measures had to be adopted. And throughout the war, the state had to use, or promised the use of, its whole credit, that is, every stake and stone in the land, to strengthen weak spots in the line. Salus properly supremalex was definitely the maxim, and the state became leviathan in a sense undreamed of by Hobbes. The main tasks of the government from the economic point of view were three. 
to ensure an adequate supply of food at reasonable prices, to provide an adequate supply of cash and credit, largely a psychological problem. For if people are persuaded that all lawful obligations will be met as usual, the battle is more than half won. And to finance the war, which meant not only paying their own bills, but giving certain assistance to their allies. The measures taken to preserve the food supply have been already glanced at. Cargoes were insured at a rate which began at five guineas per cent, and fell in a month to two guineas. After the destruction of the Emden, the rate fell back to little above that of peace time, and business resumed its ordinary channels. Hulls were insured through associations, the government taking 80% of King's enemy risks. The report of one of the largest of these, issued on February 12, 1915, described the work done. Up to that date, the losses paid on vessels insured with this association during voyages started since the outbreak of war were over £800,000, and the premiums received a million five hundred thousand pounds. From November, said the report, members have been able, in many instances, to obtain in the open market rates below those fixed by the state, and therefore the amount insured with the association has been diminished. Again, a cabinet committee fixed maximum prices for certain articles of food, which after various revisions were abandoned as business became normal. The cost of living rose during the winter, and there were proposals for a further official price scale, which the government, after consideration, rejected. In a speech in February 1915, the Prime Minister pointed out that the prices of certain foodstuffs, such as wheat, were fixed not in Britain but in America, that prices had not risen beyond the point attributable to the increased consumption of food at home owing to the new armies, the closing of the Dardanelles to Russian grain, and the lateness of the Argentine crop. A few minor steps were taken in this matter, such as a not very fortunate government purchase of sugar and a half-hearted attempt by the Board of Agriculture to increase and organize home-grown supplies of foodstuffs. The second task, to assist credit, and therefore employment, involved a multiplicity of measures, only a few of which can be chronicled here. Distress was anticipated, and the local government board made elaborate preparations for every possible contingency. Local relief committees were organized. Four million pounds was authorized to be spent on building houses. The law of distress was altered so that landlords could not without special permission issue warrants for arrears of rent, and debtors were put in a favorable position. As it turned out, there was no distress to speak of. In most industries, there was some scarcity of labor, and wages rose. In our ports especially, the casual laborer became a rare and much desired phenomenon. With several millions withdrawn to the army from trade, the working classes that remained were in a condition of comfort and privilege. Another class of measures was concerned with the actual conduct of the war. The British railways were virtually taken over by the government and directed by a committee of general managers, wages being increased partly at government expense. All armament firms worked exclusively for the government and for the Allies, and their numbers were largely augmented by enrolling a variety of railway shops, motor car factories, and engineering works for the same purpose. Most textile factories were busy on government contracts, and in all areas where manufacturing was done for war purposes, recruiting was stopped or curtailed. Squads of dock laborers had to be sent to the French ports to assist in landing men and supplies. But the demand for war munitions and the special measures taken for that end constituted almost the sole direct interference with British trade. Ordinary manufacturers prepared goods for their ordinary markets with little hindrance except an occasional cessation of railway facilities and a great shortage of shipping. The restoration of financial credits was undertaken with much boldness and success, 
and a laudable disregard of shibboleths and precedents. The moratorium and the measures to regulate bills of exchange have been described in an earlier chapter. The extravagant public finance of recent years had to some extent weakened British credit, and heroic measures to be paid for later on the same heroic scale were necessary. The stock exchange reopened in January after an arrangement had been arrived at that the banks should not call in their loans to stockbrokers till a year after the declaration of peace. It opened in blinkers, for severe restrictions were needed to prevent our enemies raising money by selling stocks in London through neutral countries. Speculation was made impossible, for a man could only sell stock which he actually possessed. Minimum prices were fixed, all transactions were for cash, and there was no carrying over. In order to conserve our financial resources, the Treasury, in the same month, announced that no fresh issues of capital would be permitted except with its approval, and that this approval would only be given when the undertaking was deemed desirable in the national interest. For the rest, by January 1915, apart from the deadness of the stock exchange, our financial machinery, while working at low power, was working naturally and normally. There was some strain between America and Britain, owing to the beginning of the war, coinciding with the usual seasonal indebtedness of the New World to the Old. The New York bankers lodged £20 million in gold at Ottawa on behalf of the Bank of England, and this was used to finance the heavy purchases of war material in the United States, and so redress the balance. In the same way, an attempt was made to restore the financial equilibrium between Russia and Britain, and a credit for Russia was granted in London by an issue by the Bank of England of £10 million Russian government bills. Speaking generally, the winter showed the great strength and soundness of the British banking system, which had survived a stress which would have shattered the credit of most nations. Incidentally, it revealed the enormous power of the joint stock banks, who had the right to call the tune. Holding £600 million of the people's money, they were the main financiers of British trade. The third task, to pay our bills and those of some of our allies, was only begun during the first eight months of war, and it may happily be completed in the time of the grandson of the youngest child in Britain today. The loan of £350 million raised in November issued at 95 with interest at 35 and so virtually a 4% security included a loan of £30 million to Canada, Australia and New Zealand, the loan to Belgium and a small advance to Serbia. At a conference of the Allied Finance Ministers held in Paris in February, an arrangement was come to for partially pooling the Allied resources. Britain, France and Russia agreed to take over in equal shares advances made to present and future allies, and to make jointly all purchases from neutral countries. It is needless to detail the various types of new taxation introduced in Britain and elsewhere. We were unfortunate enough to enter upon war with our normal war taxes, the income tax and the super tax, already on a war basis. Britain was spending at the rate of something over £2 million a day. It was estimated at this time by one statistician that a year of war on this scale would cost the British Empire directly and indirectly £1,258,000,000 which represented about one-fourteenth of the national wealth of Britain and about one-twentieth of the total wealth of the British Empire. Thus, the economic position at the beginning of the spring of 1915 was that Britain continued her normal activities, slightly depressed in some quarters and enormously increased in others. Her commercial and financial mechanism was intact, but while most of her private industries went on, a considerable section was switched off to purposes directly connected with war. The one serious difficulty appeared in this latter sphere. Germany had calculated on various joints in her harness, civil war in Ireland, an apathetic government, a people unwilling to recruit, 
and labor troubles. Only the last gave any color of truth to her forecast. During February, in various districts engaged in the manufacture of war material, notably on the Clyde and the Mersey, strikes broke out, in most cases against the wish of the leaders of the trade unions concerned. For long, discipline had been growing slack, even the self-imposed discipline of the unions, and employers found too often that an arrangement with the men's representatives was by no means an arrangement with the men. The British labor troubles gave great joy to the enemy and much concern to the nation and its allies, for they hindered the manufacture of munitions, especially shells, on which the life of our armies depended. The troubles were an inevitable consequence of a system of private armament firms working under the same conditions as other businesses. At Cluso, the men were soldiers, amenable to military law, and a strike was a mutiny, punishable in time of war with death. The British system allowed a workman, for the sake of another penny an hour, to jeopardize the lives of thousands of his countrymen and to endanger the future of his country. The blame for this preposterous state of affairs could not, however, be laid only on the workman's shoulders. He, in turn, was a victim of national supineness, and his case was in some respects a strong one. Often he had tried to enlist and had been sent back to make armaments. He had been compelled to work overtime, an unwise step forced by the government upon employers, for protracted overtime weakens the efficiency of the workman, so that he actually produces less than in a normal week. He was tired, sulky, disappointed, and soon he grew overstrained. As he was making high wages, he had a certain amount of spare cash, and it was unfortunately true that he often drank more than usual, and his whole nervous system deteriorated. It was easy to find grievances, and he had a certain prima facie case. Though he was earning big wages, he had to work hard for them, and he found the cost of living going up while he believed with some reason that his masters were earning profits utterly disproportioned to his increased pay. Again, he saw many of his trade union rules infringed owing to the exigencies of war. It did not matter to him that his union leaders had consented to the change, for the workman as a rule is as suspicious of his leaders as of other people, and he feared that presently he would be swamped with black leg labor. For years, he had been taught by demagogues that he had rights but no duties, and invited to embrace a policy based on stark selfishness. He was so much better than his mentors that when the crisis came, he was ready as a rule to play his part and enlist with his brothers and cousins. But when he was compelled to continue his ordinary work, his sense of the gravity of things seemed to slip away. How could it be otherwise? Almost every newspaper published flaming headlines daily, announcing some gigantic Allied success. He looked at the headlines and did not read the obscure message from Rome and Athens on which they were founded. When his friends came back from the front and shook their heads, he could only think that his friends had had specially hard experiences. Did not every paper tell him that the Allies were winning easily? Did not the wise and good proclaim business as usual or victories as usual? He believed in both, and business as usual naturally implied strikes as usual. It was easy for the ordinary citizen to lose his temper with the strikers, but in common fairness it should be recognized that part of their case was sound, and that what was not was mainly the fault of their former teachers. Conscription and military law would have probably been not unpopular in the armament areas, for no sane man likes to be without discipline and leaders. The various steps taken by the government to meet the situation might be described as tentatives towards this solution. The exceptional nature of the time was emphasized, and guarantees were given that the principles of the trade unions should not suffer. The movement towards government's control was still in its rudiments.
the economic condition of France and Russia was akin to Britain's, with reservations for the effect of a conscript army in withdrawing men from trade, and for their temporary losses of territory. Lille and Wuj in German hands were sections cut off from their industrial life, to which we in Britain had no parallel. But for France, all her foreign outlets remained, so far as they could be used, and for Russia, the East was still open. Both show astonishing recuperative power, their industries reacting to the stimulus of war. Russia was more or less self-supporting, save in respect of munitions, and her large gold reserve was for the moment sufficient to pay for her foreign purchases of war material. She financed the war by the issue of short loans, treasury bills, and a loan redeemable in 49 years. She considerably increased taxation, for she had to make up a deficit in income of more than 84 million pounds, caused by the prohibition of the trade in spirits. France, after 15th December, financed herself chiefly by treasury bonds, which on March 12, 1915, according to a statement by Monsieur Hibou, had reached a total of nearly a hundred and fifty five million pounds. These bonds were rapidly taken up and distributed through all classes, and for them the peasant and the small tradesman brought out his store of gold from the stocking foot. The revenue, which had fallen heavily down to October, began to recover with extraordinary rapidity. History had shown that no enemy dared to reckon on France's speedy exhaustion either in men or money. Germany, as we have seen, was now in the widest sense a beleaguered city, and her economics were the economics of a fortress. By the end of 1914, she could not hope to receive any large quantity of foodstuffs or war munitions from abroad, and by March of the new year, all imports ceased except from existing stocks held in Scandinavia, Holland, and Italy. Her problem was simply to organize the distribution of her domestic stocks, and to see that, so far as possible, they were replenished from home sources. New foodstuffs must be won from the soil, new supplies of chemicals and ore from the mines, as far as was consistent with the preoccupations of war. Her task was one of internal production and administration. The financial side was simple. So long as the nation was confident, the credit of the state could be used indefinitely. The harvest of 1914 had been poor, but at first the food question was little considered, since the public expectation was of an immediate and final victory. Apparently, there was some miscalculation as to the amount of corn available, and in the autumn there was a good deal of careless waste. Early in the new year, the German government suddenly realized that the national supplies under this head were running short and might vanish before the harvest of 1915 reinforced them. Accordingly, elaborate provisions were made to husband the stores of flour. Municipalities were given the right to confiscate private stocks. The bakers became government servants and bread cards were issued which fixed the amount which the holder was entitled to buy. Bread became dear and bad. All the industries depending on grain were restricted. Little beer was brewed, and pigs no longer could be fattened. Millers were compelled by law to mix 30% of rye flour with wheat flour before delivery, and the bakers were compelled to sell as wheaten bread a compound of this already blended flour and 20% of potato starch flour. Rye bread might be 30% potato. Such a shortage, however, was a long way removed from famine. Most foodstuffs in Germany were still cheap and plentiful. A dinner in Berlin in January did not cost more than a meal in London. Only the bread was indifferent. Luxuries, as in all such cases, were more plentiful and relatively cheaper than necessaries. The future, however, was darkening. The harvest of 1915 must be a bad one, and the most meticulous thrifts could not spread out supplies indefinitely. 
what was felt in january as merely an inconvenience might by july be a pinch and by the winter an agony most industrial stocks ran short but they mattered little the grave question was that of materials which formed the basis for the manufacture of war munitions before the war germany had consumed annually seven hundred and eighty five thousand tons of saltpeter sixteen thousand tons of rubber a million and a hundred thousand of petroleum and two hundred and twenty four thousand of copper in the last two cases there was some small local production about ten per cent of the whole she had also made large importations of nitrates the allied blockade cut off much of the saltpeter all the rubber and most of the copper petroleum and nitrates war such as germany waged with its immense use of artillery and motor transport was simply impossible without these materials some such as petroleum could be replaced to a certain extent by substitutes nitrate could be chemically produced and the large stocks of copper in private use could be drawn upon for a considerable time but no substitute could be found for rubber and this commodity was germany's sorest need during the early months of nineteen fifteen the allies at this time were inclined to exaggerate germany's shortage of war material and to underestimate the ingenuity of german scientists but the pinch existed as in the case of food and in time would become a menace german finances during the war did not present any great difficulties to a well-disciplined state provided and the point was vital that the people were confident of the ultimate issue and that panic were avoided two credits for two hundred and fifty million pounds each were voted before christmas and early in the new year another five hundred million pounds was asked for the money was raised by a loan and there was no increase of taxation the spandau war chest was early in the campaign added to the gold reserve of the rice bank and it was maintained in germany that these reserves as late as february nineteen fifteen were scarcely touched this may have been true for germany had had little reason owing to the blockade to use her gold at the beginning of the war she contemplated the raising of a foreign loan and an american firm was asked to place bonds to the extent of two hundred and fifty million pounds this was found impossible owing to the refusal of the other new york banks to cooperate and german war loans became wholly domestic matters nominally they were highly successful they were fully and readily subscribed and gave the imperial treasurer occasion for dithyrambic speeches on the financial resources of his country by means of credit societies advances in notes were made on every kind of property these notes were legal tender and against them the reich bank issued its own notes the general result was economically not very different from what would have been obtained by a large increase of government notes without gold security it was a perfectly justifiable policy for a country situated as germany was she mobilized the internal credit of the nation as she mobilized her armies so long as her people looked for victory so long as they were justified in believing that indemnities and the spoils of conquest would readily liquidate all the obligations which the state had incurred towards them to sum up it may be said that the allies owing to the command of the sea conducted under difficulties their usual economic life while germany was almost wholly on a war basis in spite of the fact that scarcely any german territory was in enemy possession and large areas of french and russian soil were in german occupation germany was short in some classes of foodstuffs and badly crippled in several forms of war material but endeavored to meet the first by a vigorous control of distribution and the second by the use of substitutes the war finance of all the belligerents was a matter of gigantic loans but the security differed with the allies it was a weakened but in its main lines a normal economic life 
with germany it was solely the prospect of victory and the fruits of victory defeat for germany would mean a colossal bankruptcy she had made all her assets a pawn in the game of war the questions of international law which arose in the early months of 1915 were in themselves so curious and their importance in our relations with america and other neutrals was so great that they demand some notice in order to understand the situation we must realize the international practice at the outbreak of war we may leave out of account the declaration of london for a coach and four had been driven through that unlucky arrangement before august was gone and the handle was thereby given for germany's charge that britain had been the first to play fast and loose with international arrangements under the ordinary practice enemy's ships were liable to capture and enemy's goods on board to confiscation neutral goods going free neutral ships could sail with impunity to and from enemy ports and any enemy goods which they carried were exempt from capture unless they happened to be contraband of war contraband of war was anything which was of direct use to the enemy's fleets and armies it included not only weapons and explosives but materials which were capable of a double use the latter being known as conditional contraband in the napoleonic wars conditional contraband was usually things like tar ham and timber later it became such commodities as petroleum and copper if conditional contraband was destined for an enemy port it was liable to capture in a neutral bottom food for the civilian population of the enemy was not contraband it might become so if destined for the enemy's soldiers or sailors but this destination was obviously almost impossible to prove contraband conditional or otherwise was liable to seizure if it were assigned to a neutral port but could be shown to be destined for the enemy these principles were fairly clear but they involved a large number of questions of facts such as the real destination of a cargo and the precise ownership of a whole such questions of facts were decided by prize courts which condemned or released the captured vessels submitted to them and arranged for compensation sale and the other consequences of their verdicts prize courts did not administer the domestic law of the country which appointed them they said in lord stowell's famous words not to administer occasional and shifting opinion to serve present purposes of particular national interests but to administer with indifference that justice which the law of nations hold out without distinction to independent states some happening to be neutral and some to be belligerent unhappily while there may be agreement in peace on the main international principles there is apt to be very little unanimity in war for a power puts the emphasis differently according as it is a neutral or a belligerent a great maritime power like britain was subject to a special temptation in her own wars she was able to ride belligerent rights hard for she desired to use her naval strength to destroy the enemy if she was a neutral she pressed neutral rights to the furthest point conceivable for she sought to get the benefits of her large mercantile marine the united states in their civil war were rigid sticklers for belligerent rights while britain pled the cause of neutrals in this war britain stood for belligerents and they were the advocates of neutrals if the situation had been reversed and britain had been neutral undoubtedly she would have done as america did there is a human nature in states as in individuals and human nature is rarely consistent the first difficulty arose in connection with conditional contraband especially copper germany needed copper and she could only get it from foreign countries notably america now copper if shipped to hamburg would be clearly contraband and would be seized but what if it were shipped to genoa or bergen suddenly the exports of american copper to europe began to grow prodigiously in nineteen thirteen 
from August to December, the imports to Italy had been 15 million pounds. In 1914, for these months, they were 26 million pounds. Scandinavia and Holland, for the same period, in 1913, had imported 7 million pounds. In 1914, the figures were 25 million pounds. This looked suspicious enough, for these countries were not in the enjoyment of an industrial boom, and such high copper stocks could only be meant for Germany. Britain's position was difficult. If she allowed them to land, Germany would get them. If she arrested them on the high seas, she had little or no evidence of a German destination to go on. She could only presume that, in the state of the Dutch, Scandinavian, and Italian copper trade, they must be destined for Germany. The consequence was that she adopted the doctrine of continuous voyage, against which she had often made outcry in the past, and she pressed it very hard. That doctrine was first heard of in the Seven Years' War, and came to great notoriety during the American Civil War. When the North was blockading the South, Northern warships would discover a British merchantman bound for Nassau in the Bahamas with a cargo of rifles, or to Matamoros just across the Rio Grande from Texas with shells. These were war stores, and of no use to the quiet civilian. And since Mexico and the Bahamas were not at war, the presumption was that the cargoes were destined for the Confederacy. Accordingly, these innocent merchantmen were seized and condemned after some highly interesting decisions by the United States Prize Courts. Britain protested vigorously, especially the lawyers, but the government happily took no steps. When the Boer War came, she showed some disposition to accept the American view, for since the Transvaal had no sea coast, contraband could only come by a neutral port like Delagoa Bay, and she stopped several vessels on this suspicion. Presently, she had accepted wholeheartedly the American doctrine, and it was for the United States to repine at the consequences of their teaching. Indeed, she greatly improved on it. The northern cruisers took only cargoes of absolute contraband, where the presumption of enemy destination was unrebuttable. Britain took cargoes of conditional contraband, part of which might easily have been used by neutral civilian industries, and she defined conditional contraband in a way which played havoc with that decoration of London, which in early August she had proudly declared to be her guide. The United States made a temperate protest on 28th December 1914, and Sir Edward Grey replied on 7th January with some friendly observations, pleading the force majeure of necessity, and on 18th February with a long statement setting forth the whole British case, referring to American usage in the past, and pointing out that, whatever our restrictions, America was prospering over the business. In this statement, he outlined a far more startling departure from international practice than the seizure of American copper. And on 1st March, a declaration of the British government expounded the new policy. On 26th January, as we have seen, the German government had announced the future control of all foodstuffs, including imports from overseas. This abolished the distinction between food destined for the civil population and that for the armed forces. Experience shows, ran Sir Edward Gray's statement, that the power to requisition will be used to the fullest extent in order to make sure that the wants of the military are supplied. And however much goods may be imported for civil use, it is by the military that they will be consumed if military exigencies require it especially now that the German government have taken control of all the foodstuffs in the country. In these circumstances, it was natural that Britain should treat as contraband of war or food cargoes for Germany, and for a neutral port if their ultimate destination was patent. Germany replied by announcing a blockade of Britain as from 18th February. British vessels or neutral vessels in British waters would be sunk by submarines without notice and without any provision for the safety of crew and passengers. 
this threat was put into action, and on 1st March came the declaration of Britain of a counter blockade. The chief sentences of this declaration may be quoted. Germany had declared that the English Channel, the north and west coasts of France, and waters round the British Isles are a war area, and has officially notified that all enemy ships found in that area will be destroyed, and that neutral vessels may be exposed to danger. This is, in effect, a claim to torpedo at sight, without regard to the safety of the crew or passengers, an merchant vessel under any flag, as it is not in the power of the German Admiralty to maintain any surface craft in these waters, this attack can only be delivered by submarine agency. A German submarine enjoys no local command of the waters in which she operates. She does not take her captures within the jurisdiction of a prize court. She carries no prize crew which she can put on board a prize. She uses no effective means of discriminating between a neutral and an enemy vessel. She does not receive on board for safety the crew of the vessel she sinks. Her methods of warfare are therefore entirely outside the scope of any of the international instruments regulating operations against commerce in time of war. The German declaration substitutes indiscriminate destruction for regulated capture. Germany is adopting these methods against peaceful traders and non-combatant crews with the avowed object of preventing commodities of all kinds, including food for the civil population, from reaching or leaving the British Isles or northern France. Her opponents are, therefore, driven to frame retaliatory measures in order, in their turn, to prevent commodities of any kind from reaching or leaving Germany. These measures will, however, be enforced by the British and French governments without risk to neutral ships or to neutral or non-combatant life, and in strict observance of the dictates of humanity. The British and French governments will therefore hold themselves free to detain and take into port ships carrying goods of presumed enemy destination, ownership, or origin. It is not intended to confiscate such vessels or cargoes unless they would otherwise be liable to condemnation. The treatment of vessels and cargoes which have sailed before this date will not be affected. Obviously, this policy did not fulfill the conditions of a technical blockade, and the government did not claim it as such. A complete effective blockade of Germany was impossible. Britain did not control the Baltic, and Sweden and Norway would therefore be in a different position from another neutral like America. Further, most of the German imports went through neutral ports, and to meet this difficulty, Britain had gone far beyond the ordinary blockade. She had proclaimed the right to detain and take into port ships carrying goods of presumed enemy destination, ownership or origin. This was not the old conditional contraband and continuous voyage, questions about which she had been arguing with America before Christmas. It was a claim to capture enemy merchandise of the most innocent kind, even when carried in neutral bottoms, a wholesale rejection of the Declaration of Paris. Further, instead of presuming cargoes of conditional contraband to have an innocent destination unless a guilty were proved, she was compelled to presume guilt unless innocence were clearly made out, and the bias of presumption leaned heavily against the possibility of innocence. These measures, which involved a very comprehensive rewriting of international law, were avowedly reprisals against Germany. Germany had crashed through the whole system like Elnish's basket. Her methods of waging war her treatment of civilian inhabitants in France and Belgium, her conduct towards prisoners, her laying of mines on the high seas, her sinking of merchant vessels and crews, her bombardment of undefended towns. The role was damning enough to justify any reprisals, but the British measure bore heavily upon innocent neutrals, and it is fair to recognize the very grave inconvenience to which a power like America was put. 
she did not know where she stood, and it is greatly to her credit that she recognized the novel situation created by German modes of warfare, and did not quibble about the letter of the law. The Allied governments admitted the difficulty, and did not propose to confiscate the vessels and cargoes detained, unless they were confiscable on the normal grounds of contraband. Whether damages should be paid for detention or the goods bought by Britain was left to the prize courts and the executive officers. Germany, in her blockade, intended to sink neutral ships and sacrifice non-competent lives. The British blockade involved no more than detention. The latter was, therefore, much less than a blockade, in which it is the custom of the captor to confiscate any blockade runners. As our blockade was technically incomplete, so the penalties we exacted were technically inadequate. It is difficult to see what other course was possible. The British government had the courage to frame a novel measure to meet novel conditions, and declined, in the Prime Minister's words, to be strangled in a network of juridical niceties. Germany was out of court and apart from the justification afforded by her recent conduct, the principles on which Britain acted had been approved by Bismarck, Caprivi, and Bernardi. To neutrals who had a real grievance, she defended her action on the ground of sheer necessity, a necessity which may override the technical provisions, but not the eternal principles of international equity. If your opponent breaks the rules of the game, it is impossible to remain bound by them without giving him an undue advantage. But an honorable man will not lower himself by adopting the baser kind of trick. She proclaimed a blockade which was not formally perfect according to the test books, though it was not unlike that proclaimed by the United States in 1861. She justified its formal imperfections by the fact that she was fighting with an enemy who owned no allegiance to any law. Mr. Balfour, on 29th March, published a defense of her action, to which it was hard to see an answer. He asked what international morality required of one belligerent when the other trembled international law in the dust. Clearly, the policy of the first must be modified, and those who declared that the crimes of one party should in no way affect the conduct of the other confounded international law and international morality. The obligation of the second was absolute, that of the first only conditional, and one of its conditions was reciprocity. If a state lost all power to enforce obligations or punish the guilty, ought the community to submit tamely and behave as if social conditions were normal? Clearly not. And in the same way, in the international world, where the law had no sanctions, if rules were allowed to bind one belligerent and leave the other free, they would cease to mitigate suffering, and only load the dice in favor of the unscrupulous. Let them, neutrals, remember that impotence, like power, has duties as well as privileges, and if they cannot enforce the law on those who violate both its spirit and its letter, let them not make haste to criticize belligerents who may thereby be compelled in self-defense to violate its letter while carefully regarding its spirit. End of chapter 22、chapter、23, Part 1 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23, Part 1. Turkey at War. October 29, 1914 to February 8, 1915. From the first day of war, Germany had made certain of Turkey's alliance, and had treated it as a fait accompli in her negotiations with the Balkan powers. In August, it seemed indeed a certainty. But the German misfortunes of September had weakened Germany's hold on the port, save in the case of Enver and the army chiefs. Early in October, it became clear that Enver and von Wangerham were making strenuous efforts to force Turkey over the borderline. 
and on 29th October, her many breaches of international etiquette, of which her behavior in regard to the Gerben and the Breslau, and her summary abolition of the capitulations where the chief humiliated indefinite acts of war. A horde of Bedouins invaded the Sinai Peninsula and occupied the wells of Magdala, and the combined German-Turkish fleet raided Odessa, sank and damaged several ships, and bombarded the town. On the 30th, the ambassadors of the Allies had fateful interviews with the Grand Vizier. The Sultan, the Grand Vizier, Dajamo and Dajavid were in favor of peace, but Enver and his colleagues overruled them. The Odessa incident was justified by a cock and bull story of prior Russian hostilities, and that evening, Sir Louis Mallet, the British ambassador, was instructed to present an ultimatum, demanding that within twelve hours the port should dissociate itself from those acts of hostility towards Russia, and should remove the crews of the Gerben and the Bresnau. It was certain that the port would refuse the second demand. But the question was not put to the test, for suddenly the Russian government, without consulting its allies, declared war upon Turkey. Nothing remained for the French and British ministers but to ask for their passports. And on 1st November, Sir Louis Mallet, who had played a hopeless game with great skill and patience, left Constantinople, and the century-old friendship of Britain and Turkey was at an end. The Turkish army was based nominally on a universal conscription, but in practice only the Muslim population was drawn upon, not all of that, indeed, for many of the Arab peoples were more usually opposed to than incorporated in the Turkish ranks. The conscript served for 20 years, nine in the first line, the Sam, nine in the active reserve, Rediv, and two in the territorial militia, Mustafis. The major unit was the army corps of three divisions, each division embracing ten battalions. The artillery, which had suffered severely in the Balkan Wars, was patchy and largely out of date, though in recent months Germany and Austria had strengthened it with a number of heavy batteries. The peace strength of the army was roughly 70,000 officers and 250,000 men, and in war, some total like 800,000 might have been looked for, provided equipment were forthcoming. The commander-in-chief was Enver, and the German military mission under General Niemann von Sanders had practically taken over the duties of a general staff. The German system of inspections had been instituted, four in number, with headquarters at Constantinople, Damascus, Asinjan, and Baghdad. The 14 army corps were distributed in peace throughout the empire at strategic points. The 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th were nominally stationed in Europe, at Constantinople, Adrianople, Kirkelisse, and Rodosto, but they drew most of their reserves from Asia Minor. The 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th belonged to the Damascus inspection. The 9th, 10th and 11th were in Armenia and the Caucasus, the 12th at Mosul, and the 13th at Baghdad, while the 14th Corps had no territorial basis. On the outbreak of war, these corps were reshuffled, six being concentrated around the Sea of Marmara. The Turkish infantrymen had enjoyed for many years a high reputation as a soldier, especially as he showed at Prevna in a stubborn defensive. His physique was good, his nerves steady, and his power of endurance incredible. But in recent wars, his fame had suffered a certain eclipse. He had been badly led and badly armed. The commissariat and transport had been rudimentary, and successive defeats were believed to have shaken his morale. Turkey's ill-provided levies in the past had fought desperately under brilliant officers, because they were inspired by a simple trust in their religion and their leaders and a genuine patriotic devotion. An attempt had been made to engraft upon this tradition the mechanical perfection of the German system. But the Turk was not meant by nature to be a soldier of the German type, 
and the seat of one their gods, and Niman von Sanders was sown in barren soil. The consequence was a machine without precision and without motive power. The Turk had been at his best when he fought for Islam and the Padishah, but Islam was inconspicuous in the ideals of the new committee. The old Padishah was somewhere in exile, and the new one too patently a cipher. A perfect machine is a mighty thing, but an imperfect machine is so much scrap iron. The Turkish soldier was now an incomplete German, which was like a gun lacking the breech block. It was impossible to withhold sympathy from a brave race going out to battle in a cause which they neither liked nor understood, from an army in the grip of an unfamiliar and imperfect machine, from a nation sacrificed to a muddled fiat politique. Disaster loomed large in its horoscope, but courage never failed it and the time was to come when the machine went to pieces, and amid the snows of the Caucasus or the sands of the desert, the children of Osman, fighting once more in the old fashion, died without fear or complaint. The beginning of war found Turkey with a curious strategical problem before her. Europe was the chief interest of her leaders. She hankered to recover the lost provinces of Thrace, and there she looked for her reward when her allies emerged victorious. But so long as Greece and Bulgaria remained neutral, there was no room for an offensive in Europe and no need of a defensive. Accordingly, she was free to move the bulk of her call to those frontiers where she faced directly the belligerents. The chief was Transcaucasia, where in a wild cluster of mountains she looked across the gorges at Russia. An offensive in Transcaucasia was what Germany and Austria urgently desired. Russia, they knew, had none too many equipped men, and a diversion on her flank would draw troops from that thin line a thousand miles long, which she held from the Leman to the Danista. Against Britain, too, Turkey might use her armies with effect. An attack upon the Suez Canal might precipitate the long-expected Egyptian rebellion, and would at the least detain the Australian and Indian troops now training there, and at the best compel Britain to send out as reinforcements some of her still scanty reserves. Further, it would bar the short road to India, and give the flame of Indian insurrection time to kindle. A further chance of fomenting Indian trouble, in the certainty of which Germany still firmly believed, lay in the scheme now coming to a head on the Persian Gulf. German agents had been busy among the Gulf traders, and elaborate preparations had been made for undermining the virtue of the Amir of Afghanistan, and for preaching a jihad among the Muslim tribes of the Indian Northwest. Turkey believed that she had little to fear in the way of attack. The Russians were too busily engaged elsewhere to penetrate far west from the frosty Caucasus, while Britain had enough to do in Flanders without attempting an advance into Syria or Mesopotamia. The one serious danger point in the war with a great naval power was the Dardanelles, but Enver and his colleagues were confident that the penetration of these straits long ago pronounced by experts a task of the utmost difficulty had been rendered impossible for all time by the heavy guns which Krupp and Skoda had diligently provided. The tale of the Dardanelles, the main episode in this section of the campaign, must be reserved for later chapters. For the moment, we are concerned with the preliminary stages. When Turkey took the offensive in the Persian Gulf, in Transcaucasia, and in Egypt. In the first theater, the Allies had anticipated the events of 1st November, and the Ottoman troops found their attack forestalled by a British invasion. The Persian Gulf was one of the oldest of Britain's fields of activity. Englishmen looking for trade had visited it in the reign of Elizabeth. In its early days, the East India Company established a factory at Bandar Abbas, and fought stoutly with Dutch and Portuguese rivals for the better part of two centuries. 
the Indian Navy first began the survey of the Gulf and looked to its lighting. For 50 years, Britain had hunted down the pirates and cleared out their strongholds on the pirate coast. She protected Persia against those who would have deprived her of a seaboard. She policed the waters. She suppressed slavery and gun running. She wrestled with the plague and introduced the rudiments of sanitation in the marshy estuaries. For 300 years, she had done this work for the benefit of the shipping of all nations, since she claimed no monopoly and desired no perquisites. All she took in return was a fraction of an island for a telegraph station. One thing indeed she asked, and that was a matter of life and death on which compromise was impossible. No other power should be allowed to seize territory, and no other flag should dominate those landlocked waters. For with the prestige in the Persian Gulf was bound up the future of India and of the empire. Before ever the Turkish crescent appeared in the Gulf, Britain had shown her flag there. In the 16th century, Suleiman the Magnificent had captured Baghdad, but it was not till 1638 that the conquest was confirmed, and not till 1668 that Turkey reached Basra and the sea coast. For the next two centuries, the writ of Constantinople had run haltingly on the western shores or not at all. The rise of the Wahhabi threatened the Turkish power, and all through the 19th century, Eastern Arabia was the scene of a rivalry between the great Wahhabi houses of Ibn Saud and Ibn Rashid, a rivalry in which the Caliph did not dare to interfere. At Kuwait and at Bahrain lived independent sheikhs, and not all the efforts of Midhat Pasha could turn that coast into a Turkish province. The Gulf shores, baked and barren and hot as a furnace, were a museum of types of incomplete sovereignty and de facto rule. But out on the waters lay British warships which kept the peace. To this happy hunting ground, the eyes of Germany turned. Persia was a decrepit state, Turkey was moribund, and in Mesopotamia she saw a chance of finding a field for exploitation which would make it for Germany what Egypt was to Britain and Morocco to France. German professors told excited audiences that a thousand years ago the land had supported six million people and that what had once been might be again. If Germany won a foothold on the Gulf, not only would she have the exploiting of Mesopotamia, but she would have weakened the British hold upon India. To secure this end, Turkey must be conciliated, and the long tail of intrigue began which we have already noted. The trump card was the Baghdad Railway. In 1899, a German company, backed by the Deutsche Bank, had obtained a concession from the port to build a railway from Konya, then the terminus of the Little Anatolian Railway, to Baghdad and Basra on the Persian Gulf. The concession was made valuable by a Turkish guarantee of the interest on the cost of construction at the rate of £700 per kilometre per annum. Britain awoke somewhat late in the day to the political purport of the new railway, and a diplomatic conflict began which was all but definitely settled at the outbreak of war. Germany had followed the practice of that lord of Bredoben who built his castle on the extreme confines of his land with the avowed intention of bursting Yont. Her Yont was Kuwait, on the actual Gulf shores, and she persuaded Turkey into various pretensions to suzerainty which the watchful eyes of the British agents detected in time and frustrated. Meantime, she was busy at the game of peaceful penetration. A certain firm, Wong House by name, played here the part which Verman played in West Africa and Luderus in Tamaraland. A simple, spectacled gentleman in white ducks and a topi appeared on the beach in quest of pearl shells. From a modest shanty on the foreshore, he directed his operations and spent freely money which could not have come out of his profits. Presently arrived a German consul 
and soon there were little tiffs between the employees of the shell merchants and the natives, which gave the council something to do. Quickly the business grew, but not on commercial lines. Then came the Hamburg-America line, playing national airs and dispensing sweet champagne, and the spectacled gentleman was revealed as his accredited agent. Very soon the innocent traders went concession hunting and called upon Turkey to ratify their claims under a pretense of suzerainty. Then Britain interfered, revealed the hollowness of the business, and put her veto on the game. But next week, it began all over again elsewhere. Sir Percy Cox, the British agent and consul general on the Gulf, had a task scarcely less difficult than that of Lord Cromwell in the early days in Egypt and he performed it with a patience, judgment, and resolution which deserved well of his country. By the beginning of November, the British in the Gulf were ready for the offensive. The government of India had sent the Pune Brigade under Brigadier General W. S. Delamain to Bahrain. On 7th November, the force reached the bar of the Shat al Arab, where the village of the Fowl, with its Turkish fort, lay among the flats and palm groves. The gunboat Odin bombarded the fort, and troops landed and occupied the village. The brigade then sailed 30 miles up the estuary, passing the refinery of the Anglo-Persian Oil Company at Abadan, and disembarked at Sanije on the Turkish bank, where it prepared an entrenched camp, and sat down to wait for the rest of the British force. On the 11th, there was some fighting with the Turks from Basra, and two days later, Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Barrett arrived with the rest of the Indian contingents, the Amenaga and Belgium brigades, native troops with a stiffening of British regular battalions. On the 15th, the embarkation of the remainder began, no light task on the soft, muddy banks of the Shat al Arab. Meanwhile, Delamain, with the Pune Brigade, was busy with a force of 2,000 Turks, who held the village of Sahan, four miles to the northward. The action was meant only as a reconnaissance in force, and Sahan and the date plantation beyond it were not entirely cleared. During that day, the landing was completed, and on the 16th, the British force rested. News arrived that the Basra garrison was advancing to give battle, and since there were Europeans in the city whose fate might depend upon a speedy British arrival, General Barrett ordered the advance for the early morning of the 17th. Sahan was found to be deserted, and he moved on for nine miles to a place called Sahil, near the river, where was the main Turkish force. The ground was open plain, and heavy rains in the morning had turned the deep soil into a marsh. The fight began with an artillery preparation, both from the British field guns and from gunboats on the river. The Turkish fire was bad, but they were screened by a date grove, and the country over which the advance was made was as bare as a billiard table. The enemy did not wait for the final bayonet charge, but broke and fled. Pursuit was well nigh impossible partly because of the heavy ground and partly owing to a mirage which screened his flight. The action decided the fate of Basra. On the 21st, while the bulk of the British force lay at Sanija, news came that the Turks had evacuated Basra and that the Arabs had begun to loot the place. Accordingly, General Barrett embarked certain troops on two river steamers and ordered the rest of his forces to take the direct road across the desert. The Turks had sunk three steamers at one point in the Shah el Arab and had a battery to command the place. But after silencing the battery, the river expedition managed to pass the obstruction early on the morning of the 22nd. About 10 o'clock, General Barrett reached Basra, where the Turkish custom house had been set on fire and the British flag was flown on the German consulate. The desert column, after a 30-mile march, came in about midday. Next day, the British formally entered the city of Sinbad the Sailor. 
During the remainder of the month, Barrett was occupied in preparing a base camp. His position was secure, but it was certain that he would be subjected to further attack. The enemy had fled at Sahil, but he would return, and the great military station of Baghdad was little more than 300 miles distant. Fifty miles above Basra, at the point where the former channel of the Euphrates joins the Tigris, lay the town of Kerna, a position now of less strategical importance than in former days, for the old Euphrates was of little use for traffic. Kerna was the point where ocean-going steamers could no longer ascend the river. On 2nd December, news came that the Turks had reassembled there, and next day a small force of Indian troops with the detachments of the Norfolks was sent upstream to deal with them, accompanied by three gunboats, an armed yacht, and two armed launches. Kerner proved to be a more difficult business than was expected. The British force landed on the eastern bank four miles below the town early on the morning of the 4th, while the gunboats went ahead shelled Kerna and engaged the Turkish artillery on the east bank of the Tigris near Masera. Meanwhile, the British column advanced and about midday came abreast of Kerna, which was clearly held in force. Our men were subjected to a heavy fusillade, and since the Tigris was there 300 yards wide and Kerna was screened in trees, they could do little in reply. Accordingly, the commanding officer led his troops back to the original camp, which he had strongly entrenched, and sent a message to Basra for reinforcements. Nothing happened on the 5th, but on the 6th, General Fry appeared with help. On the 7th, he advanced against Masara, which the Turks had again occupied, took it, and drove the defenders across the water to Kerna, while our naval flotilla was busy on the river. It was now decided to take Kerna in the rear, so early on the 8th, two battalions were marched some miles up the Tigris. A body of sappers swam the stream with a line, and with the aid of a down, a kind of ferry was established, and our men crossed. By the evening, the force was close to Kerna, entrenched among the trees north of the city. But there was to be no assault. That night, Turkish officers approached the British camp downstream and asked for terms. General Fry insisted upon an unconditional surrender, and just after midday on the 9th, the Turkish garrison laid down their arms. The British had now obtained complete control of the whole delta, and constructed entrenched camps at Kerna and Mesara on each side of the Tigris to hold off any possible attack from the north. Turkish troops from Baghdad hovered around, and in January there were 5,000 of them seven miles from Masera, but they offered no serious attack. We had achieved our purpose and established a barricade against any advance upon the Gulf which might threaten India. End of chapter 23, part 1「Chapter 23, Part 2 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23, Part 2 Farther north on Turkey's eastern frontier, the war was with Russia alone. A glance at the map will show that the Russian-Caucasian border has on the south Persia for two-thirds of its length and Turkey for one-third. Since Persia was a negligible military power, this meant that the northwestern territory gave each of the belligerents a chance of turning the flank of the other. The Persian province of Azerbaijan had therefore, during the recent troubled years, been occupied in parts by both Russian and Turkish troops. And when war broke out, it was certain that this locality would be a scene of fighting. South of Lake Ermia, the Turks took the offensive. A Kurdish force advanced by way of Shud Malak upon Tabriz, and meeting with no resistance from the Persian governor, took that city in the beginning of January, and moved some way northwards towards the Russian frontier. Russia, who had left no troops to speak of in Tabriz, soon repaired her omission, 
and having heavily defeated the invaders as Suvian, reoccupied Tabriz on 30th January 1915. In this unimportant section of the campaign, we have to chronicle two other movements where Russia was the invader. Early in November, a Russian column crossed the Turkish frontier from the extreme northwest corner of Persia and occupied on 3rd November the ancient town of Bayezid, which lies under the snows of Ararat, on the great trade route between Persia and the Uzun. Other columns entered Kurdistan from the east, and a movement was begun against Van. Farther north and 50 miles west from Bayezid, another Russian column from Irawan crossed the frontier in the neighborhood of Alaskurt Valley. The town of Karakalis was taken, but the Turks, part of the Baghdad 13th Corps, showed a vigorous defensive and held the invaders on the borders. The struggle died away towards the beginning of January, when the disaster in the Caucasus compelled a general retreat of the Turkish frontier guards upon Erzurum. We come now to the more vital part of the Eastern Campaign, the struggle in Transcaucasia, upon which Germany built high hopes and Enver expanded all his energy. The main features of the district are sufficiently familiar. The great range of the Caucasus, which contains the highest of European mountains, runs from the Black Sea to the Caspian, blocking the isthmus, much as the Pyrenees block the neck between the Bay of Biscay and the Mediterranean. Southwest of the range is a huge trough running nearly all the way to the two seas. Here stands Tiflis, the ancient capital of Georgia, and through it runs the main railway of those parts from Batum on the Black Sea to Baku on the Caspian. On the southwest side of the trough lies the mountain tango of Transcaucasia, midway in which comes the Russian frontier. A railway ran from Tiflis past the fortress of Kars to the terminus at Sarakamish, 15 miles from the Turkish border, while another line ran from Alexandropol by Irawan to the Persian frontier. Erzurum, the Turkish fortress, stood about the same distance from the frontier as Kars but it was on no railway and had none nearer than 500 miles. The mountain ranges extend north to the shores of the Black Sea and south into Persia and Kurdistan. The whole district is one vast upland. Most of the villages and towns standing at an altitude of 5,000 and 6,000 feet and the hills rising as high again. All the passes are lofty and in winter well nigh impassable. None of the roads were good, and, as we have seen, there was no railway on the Turkish side, and but one that mattered on the Russian. Winter campaigning there was likely to be as desperate as Xenophon's 10,000 had found it. It was an old theatre of war since the days of Cyrus and Alexander, and whenever Russia and Turkey had faced each other, it had been the cockpit of the struggle. There, in 1853, Samuel led his mountaineers. There, two years later, Fenwick Williams held cars against Muraviv in one of the greatest stands in modern history. There, in 1877, Norris Malikov and Mukta met, and Kars and Adahan and Bayezid were the scenes of desperate conflicts. If Kars could be seized, the way would be open to Tiflis and the Caspian oil fields perhaps even across the Great Caucasus itself to the levels of southern Russia. To the leaders of a race which had always been famous as mountain fighters, the offensive in the Caucasus seemed the easiest way of effecting that diversion which Germany had commissioned. Enver's strategy was ambitious to the point of madness, but it was skillful after a fashion. He resolved to entice the Russians from Sarakamish across the frontier and to hold them at some point as far distant as possible from the railhead. Then, while thus engaged, he would swing his left center in a wild enveloping movement against Sarakamish and with his left push round by Adahan and take cars in the rear. To succeed, two things were necessary. The force facing the Russian front must be strong enough to hold it while the envelopment was proceeding, 
and the operative part, the left wing, must be correctly timed in its movements, for otherwise the Russians would be able to destroy it piecemeal. It was this timing which formed the real difficulty. The swing round of the left must be made by a variety of mountain paths and over necks and valleys deep in snow, where progress in winter must be tardy and precarious. To time such a plan accurately was well nigh beyond the skill of any mortal general staff. For the Caucasian campaign, Turkey had the 9th, 10th, and 11th Corps, stationed in peace respectively at Erzurum, Erzingen, and Van, which had been concentrated at Erzurum about the middle of October. To reinforce the 11th Corps, the 37th Arab Division had been brought up from the 13th Baghdad Corps. For the movement on the extreme left, two divisions of the 1st Corps had been sent by sea from Constantinople to Tripasol. Turkey could obviously get no reserves in case of disaster. The nearest corps, the 12th at Mosul, had gone to Syria, and the remainder of the Baghdad Corps had its hands full with the British in the Persian Gulf. The nominal commander of the Caucasian army was Hassa Isset, but Enver was present as the real generalissimo, and he had been with him a large German staff. A German, Posset Pasha, was appointed governor of Erzurum. The total Turkish strength was not less than 150,000, and they had against them the army of General Rorensov, which cannot, at the outside, have been more than three corps strong, say 100,000 men. Fighting began in the first fortnight of November, when the Russians crossed the frontier and reached Kobrikyo on the Ezrom Road, which after some trouble they occupied on 20th November. The time was now ripe for Anvers' plan. The 11th Corps was entrusted with the duty of holding the Russian advance on Ezrom. The 10th Corps, at it, was to advance in two columns over the passes by Bardas against the road between Kars and Sarakamish, with the 9th Corps wheeling between it and the 11th. At the same time, the 1st Corps, which had landed at Trebizon, was to move up the Turok Valley across a pass 8,000 feet high, take Adahan and advance over somewhat easier country to the railway between Kars and Alexandropol. The difficulty about the whole scheme was the roads. The only real way for an army through the Armenian heights was by the high trough in which lie Kars and Sarakamish, and thence westwards to the upper valleys of the Arasas and Euphrates. Everywhere else the paths were tracks, now blind with snow and hopeless for artillery. The Turkish offensive began about the middle of December. The 11th Corps pushed the Russians out of Korbekil and forced them back a dozen miles to Khorasan, where on Christmas Day the retreat halted. The Russian army was now strung out along the 30 miles of the road from Khorasan to Sarakamish. Meanwhile, in desperate weather, the 9th and 10th Corps, 40 miles north, had struggled over the high watersheds and by Christmas Day had descended upon Sarakamish and on the railway east of it. The first call on the extreme Turkish left was crossing in a blizzard the steeps at the head of the Choro and already looking down through the pauses of the storm on where Adahan lay in his deep pocket of hills. If we take 28th December as a viewpoint, we find the Russian van held by the 11th Turkish Corps at Khorasan, the 9th Corps at Sarakamish, the 10th Corps east along the Kars Railway threatening to pierce the Russian front, and 60 miles northeast, the 1st Corps descending upon Adahan. It looked as if Enver's ambitious project had succeeded, but the attacking force was worn out, half starved, and short of guns and ammunition for no transport on earth could cope with such a breakneck march. The Russian general dealt first with the 10th Corps. From 28th December to 1st January, there was a fierce struggle on the railway, which, lay on New Year's Day 1915, resulted in the defeat of the Turks and their retreat into the hills to the north. This withdrawal isolated the 9th Corps at Sarakamish, which was now enclosed between the Russian right 
flung well forward in pursuit of the tenth corps and the russian vanguard at Khorasan. that corps was utterly wiped out its general iskan pasha with all his staff turkish and german surrendered after a gallant and fruitless stand the turks fought with their old stolidity till hunger and cold were too much for them and they surrendered as much to the russian few kitchens as to the russian steel meanwhile the first corps which had entered adahan on new year's day found that it could go no farther on third january a detached russian force drove it out of the town back over the ridges to the churuk valley whither the flight of the tenth corps was also heading the eleventh corps at Khorasan did its best to redeem the disaster it could not save the ninth corps but it might cover the retreat of the tenth and accordingly it pushed back the russian van from Khorasan and advanced as far as karia Ergen, some twenty miles from sarakamish it achieved its purpose for the pursuit of the tenth corps was relaxed and the bulk of the russian army went westwards to reinforce the van at karyo ergen a three days battle was fought among snow drifts and by the seventeenth the eleventh corps had been broken also and with heavy losses in men and guns was retreating upon erzurum meanwhile the first corps and the remnants of the tenth were cleared from the churuk valley by the russian right and driven towards trebizond the turkish navy which attempted to send stores and reinforcements by sea was no more fortunate for the several transport and provision boats were sunk along the coast by russian warships so ended enver's boat diversion it had failed signally because his reach exceeded his grasp as has happened before with adventurers the three weeks of desperate conflicts amid snow drifts and blizzards for the battlefields were scarcely less than eight thousand feet high must have accounted for not less than fifty thousands of turkish strength badly led and ill-equipped the starving turkish levies had fought like heroes and their sufferings were not the least terrible of the war the battle of sarakamish to localize the series of engagements made certain that russia for the present would not be menaced from the caucasus turkey must look elsewhere to find the joint in the armor of the allies she sought it in egypt and at the suez canal which as motka had long before told his countrymen was the vital artery of britain the story of egypt is one of the romances of modern politics and for its slow and varied drama the reader must consult the works of lord cromer and lord milner the men who were the chief actors in the piece in fifteen seventeen forty-eight years before the turkish invasion of europe spent itself on the fortifications of malta and the gallantry of the knights of st john the sultan salim acquired egypt by conquest and in spite of many vicissitudes of the weakness of turkish rule the ambitions of napoleon and the boldness of mohammed ali the suzerainty of constantinople continued the misgovernment of ismail and the precarious position of the egyptian bondholders brought in the western powers france and britain and a dual control was established over administration then came the deposition of ismail followed by the nationalist rising under araby the bombardment of alexandria and the battle of tel el kabir to britain fell the task of restoring order and that british occupation began which was the making of the country there succeeded the menace from the sudan the devastating advance of the mahdi and his fanatical armies the loss of the southern provinces and the death of gordon Que keritora kurui nostra is more pertinent to britain than to rome and the sands of the nile have had the best of british blood from eighteen eighty five onwards the task of the de facto rulers of egypt was twofold the reconquest of the sudan and the elevation of the nile valley from bankruptcy to prosperity the first was accomplished in eighteen ninety eight when lord kitchener at the battles of the edbara and omdurman scattered the dervish levies the second in the wise hands of lord cromer progressed yearly in spite of international bickerings court intrigues 
and a preposterous dualism in finance. In a multiplicity of problems, there is usually, as Lord Cromer saw, one master question, the settlement of which involves the others. In the case of Egypt, this was finance, and with infinite patience and perfect judgment, the greatest of modern administrators first of all reduced taxation, then from his scanty balances spent wisely on reproductive works, till he had given Egypt the water which was her life, and raised the peasants from a condition of economic slavery to a comfort unknown in the Nile Valley since the days of the pharaohs. In 1904, the British occupation was formally recognized by the powers of Europe, and the Egyptian finances were released from the bondage of international control. With prosperity came political activity, and with political activity is degenerate offspring, the demagogue. Lord Cromer handled the thing discreetly, providing means for the expression of popular opinion, and giving to the Egyptians as large a share in the administration of their land as was compatible with efficiency. He devoted himself to to educational schemes with excellent results. His successor, Sir Eldon Gorst, came at a time when both in Turkey and in Persia liberal movements were beginning, and it fell to him to make a further experiment in meeting the wishes of Egyptian nationalists. British control was reduced to a minimum, and Egyptian ministers were given a large responsibility. The venture was not altogether successful. For the Khedive was there to turn nationalism into a court intrigue, and the attempt to liberalize Egypt resulted in the reappearance of some of the old abuses. The advent of Lord Kitchener found the nationalist movement a good deal discredited, and his brilliant years of office represented a return to something like paternal government. He knew the East as few living men knew it, and he speedily acquired the confidence and admiration of all classes of the population. Under him, there was no sudden attempt to westernize institutions, but a continuation of the patience and gradual adjustments and remodeling which had been Lord Cromer's policy. The councils to which time hath not been called, time will not ratify. Germany, as we have seen, looked on Egypt as a nursery of sedition, she had considered carefully events like that at Danshawe and the wild speeches of the demagogues, and with her curious inability to look below the surface of things, she had jumped to the conclusion that democracy, Islam, and chauvinism would combine to produce an explosion. But the truth was that the ordinary Egyptian was content and had no grievance while in the Sudan the war awoke an unsuspected enthusiasm for the British cause, led by a descendant of the Prophet and the eldest son of the Mahdi. Let Lord Cromer speak. Why is it that the appeals to religious zeal and fanaticism made by the Turkish militarists and their German fellow conspirators have been wholly unproductive of results and have been answered both in Egypt and in the Sudan by the most remarkable expressions of loyalty and friendship towards the British government. The presence of British garrisons in Cairo, Alexandria, and Khartoum unquestionably counts for much in explanation of these very singular political phenomena. Something also may possibly be attributed to the fact that the more educated classes may have recognized that the Turco-Prussian regime with which they were threatened would assuredly combine many of the worst features both of Western and Eastern administration. But amongst contributory causes, I have no hesitation in assigning the foremost place to the fact that no general discontent prevailed of which the agitator, the religious fanatic, or the political intriguer would make use as the lever to further his own designs. In spite of the most positive assurances that they were the victims of ruthless tyranny and oppression, the population both of Egypt and the Sudan refused to believe that they were misgoverned. And why was it that no general discontent prevailed? The true reason is, I believe, that state expenditure has been carefully controlled and has been adapted to the financial resources of the two countries concerned, with the result that taxation has been low. 
it was futile to expect that the egyptian fellah or the sudanese tribesman would believe that he was oppressed and maltreated when the demands of the tax gatherer not only ceased to be capricious but were far more moderate than either he or his immediate progenitors had ever dreamed to be possible on seventeenth december the khedive abbas the second having thrown in his lot with turkey ceased to reign in egypt which with the ascent of france was formally proclaimed a british protectorate sir arthur henry mcmahon a distinguished indian political officer was appointed high commissioner the title of khedive first adopted by ismail disappeared and the throne of egypt with the title of sultan was offered to prince hussein kamel pasha the second son of ishmael and therefore the eldest living prince of the house of mohammed ali an able and enlightened man who had done great service to egyptian agriculture the change thus made was the smallest which the circumstances permitted there was no annexation the shadowy suzerainty of turkey disappeared but otherwise things remained as before nominally the tribute to constantinople continued since that tribute had been earmarked for the interest on the ottoman debt and was paid direct to the bondholders protectorate is the vaguest of political terms and may involve anything from virtual sovereignty to an almost complete detachment in this case it meant that britain was now wholly responsible for the defence of egypt and for her foreign relations the very vagueness of the arrangement had its merits for nothing was laid down as to the order of succession to the sultanates and the hands of the british government were left free for some future revision of the whole arrangement in the meantime it regularized an anonymous international status the first object of a belligerent turkey would naturally be the suez canal the turkish force in syria in peace time consisted of the eighth corps of three divisions whose headquarters were damascus but during november there was a large concentration in syria which included the bulk of the twelfth corps from mosul part of the fourth corps from adrianople and the anatolian reserve division normally stationed at smyrna out of this force which cannot have been less than one hundred and twenty thousand an expeditionary army was created under tajamo pasha the turkish minister of marine a vehement pan-islamist a professed admirer of france but an inveterate enemy of britain the seizure of the two ottoman dreadnoughts building in england had embittered his mind and he burned to wipe off the score by a blow at the suez canal one of the channels by which britain exerted her naval supremacy he had been governor of baghdad and of basra and had been at the head of an army corps in the balkan war he had no particular military reputation as he had certainly no military gifts having won his power rather as an energetic leader of the committee of union and progress than as a general in the field but as his chief of staff he had a german officer kress von kressenstein whose resource and ability more than atoned for the defects of the nominal commander the advantages of a blow at the suez canal were obvious if the eastern bank could be held the use of the canal by shipping would be endangered and britain cut off from one of her most vital sea routes if the canal could be crossed in force there was the chance of that egyptian rising for which the faithful of turkey and germany hoped but the difficulties were no less conspicuous to reach the canal from syria an all but waterless desert had to be traversed a stretch varying from one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty miles in width across this tract of rock and sand there were three routes all of them hard the first which we may call the northern touched the mediterranean coast at el arish and ran across the desert to el Kantara on the canal twenty five miles south of port said it was a hundred and twenty miles long and had on its course only a few muddy wells quite insufficient to water an army the southern road ran from akaba at the head of the gulf of that name on the red sea across the base of the peninsula of sinai to a point on the canal a little north of suez this route was the old pilgrim's road from egypt to mecca 
It was 150 miles long, and like the other, ill supplied with wells. Between the two was a possible variant, which may be called the central route. Leaving the Mediterranean coast at El Arish, it ran up the dry valley called the Wadi El Arish, to where the upper part of that depression touched the pilgrim's road. Now, from the Turkish bases of Gaza and Beersheba, there was no railway to assist and advance, and no route for motor transport. And since an army must carry its own water, it seemed impossible for the invaders to move in force unless they laid down some sort of light railway, or so improved the roads as to make them possible for motors. The Mecca railway, which ran to the east of Aqaba, gave them no help for between it and the escarpment of the Sinai Peninsula lay two rugged limestone ridges, enclosing a trench 3,000 feet deep. The best route, indeed the only possible, for a light railway was up the Wadi El Arish, but this had the disadvantage that, at its debouchement on the coast, it would come under fire from the sea. The difficulties of Turkey's strategical problem were enhanced by the nature of her object of attack, the Suez Canal was not only the equivalent of a broad and deep river, but was navigable for warships, and its banks provided superb opportunities for defense. It could not be turned, for it ran from sea to sea. It had a width of over 200 feet, and the banks at many places rose at an angle of 30 degrees to a height of 40 feet. On its western shore, a lateral railway ran the whole way from Port Said to Suez connecting at Ismedia with the line to Cairo, and a freshwater canal followed the same bank for three quarters of its length, from Suez to opposite El Cantara. Again, most of the ground to the east was flat and offered a good field of fire to the defenders on the west bank or to ships in the channel. In a few places, there were dunes on the east side which might give cover to an invader. Such a place lay just south of El Cantara. Several others were to be found south of Ismailia, and there was a small rise south of the Bitter Lakes. Any Turkish attack might therefore be looked for in the Ismailia Bitter Lakes section. The British forces in Egypt at the time included certain detachments of Indian cavalry and infantry, the Australian and New Zealand contingents under Major General Birdwood, a number of British territorials among them the East Lancashire Division, as well as the regular Egyptian army. The whole force was under the command of Sir John Maxwell, a soldier with a long experience of the Nile Valley Wars. At the end of October, it was reported that a force of 2,000 Bedouins was marching on Egypt, and on November 21st, there was a skirmish at Katia, east of the canal between this force and part of the Bikanir Camel Corps. Previous to this, the Anglo-Egyptian posts had been withdrawn from El Arish and from the Sinai Peninsula. Nothing more was heard of the invasion for more than two months. There were many rumors that the Jambo was having difficulties with his command, and was impressing for his expeditionary force a variety of unwarlike Syrians, from peasants in the Jordan Valley to cab drivers in Jerusalem. On January 28, 1915, small advanced parties had crossed the desert. One coming by the El Arash route reached Cartier and was beaten back by a Gurkha post east of El Cantara. Another party coming by the Aqaba route was driven back at Kubri, just east of Suez. The desert was well scouted by British airmen, and about that time, a party was landed at Alexandretta Bay in North Syria, and cut the telegraph wires. On the 29th, it was announced that the Turks had occupied Katia and had several posts to the west of that place. Five days later, on 3rd February, came the main attack, for which these proceedings had been reconnaissance. The Turks officially described the main attack as a reconnaissance, and the description may be accepted, for it could not be regarded as a serious invasion. But it was a reconnaissance not of design but by compulsion, for the Jammu found, when he began the attempt, that to transport even one army corps across the desert was wholly beyond his power. The troops seems to have numbered over 12,000 and to have advanced by the central route up the Wadi al-Arish. 
Four hours' journey from the canal, they split into two detachments. One moved against Ismelia, to the south of which the east bank gives a certain cover. A second, and much the stronger, advanced to a point opposite Tozum, just south of Lake Timsa, where the ground on the east is high and broken. A small flanking attack was made from the northern route against Alcantara. The troops were mainly from the 8th Corps, with portions of the 3rd and 6th Corps, a few of the 4th Adrianople Corps, a remnant of the old Tripoli Field Force, known as the Champions of Islam, and a number of Bedouin Irregulars. The preliminaries of the movement began on the night of 2nd February. A feint against Ismailia that evening had been spoiled by a dust storm, but in the darkness, the sentries on the canal saw and fired at shadowy figures on the side opposite Tuzum. The Turks had brought a number of pontoon boats in carts across the desert, and these they attempted to launch, along with several rafts made of kerosene tins. They never had a chance of succeeding. Crowded on the shore, with a high, steep bank behind them, our men mowed them down with rifle fire and maxims. A few of the vessels were launched, but they were soon riddled and sunk. The enemy then lined the banks and tried to silence our fire, and the duel went on till morning broke. With daylight, the battle became general all along the stretch from Ismailia to the Bitter Lakes. There was a small flotilla on the canal, several torpedo boats, the old Indian marine transport Hardinge, and the French guardships Ulcan and Dontrucastu. The Turks had a number of field batteries and two six-inch guns, which one of the French ships promptly silenced. The torpedo boats made short work of the remaining pontoons, and the crew of one landed on the eastern bank and raided a trench of the enemy. A few of the invaders crossed in the night and sniped our men in the rear, but they were speedily disposed of, and those who swam over later were deserters. In the afternoon, British troops from Sarapum and Tosum took the offensive, and admirably supported by artillery, drove the enemy from a large part of the eastern bank. Meanwhile, the Ismailian garrison also moved forward and cleared their front. About the same time, the half-hearted attacks on our flank near Alcantara and Suez had also failed. By the evening of the 3rd, the fiasco was over, and early next morning, the British crossed the canal in force and began the work of rounding up the enemy. By 8th February, there were no Turks within 20 miles of the canal, and beyond that, only a few scattered rear guards, the main force being in full retreat for the borders. It is not clear why it was allowed to escape. With 130 waterless miles to cover, there seemed no reason why a beaten and dispirited force should ever have succeeded in reaching Beersheba. End of chapter 23, part 2. Chapter 24, part 1 of A History of the Great War by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24, Part 1 The Battles on the Russian Front in the Spring of 1915, 3rd January to 22nd March At the beginning of January, the Russian Front had found a position in which it seemed that it could abide. Beginning on the lower Neman, it ran through the Mashurian lakes inside the East Prussian frontier regained Russian territory north of the Nariv, passed just south of Mwawa, bent in a salient towards Twosk, and crossed the Vistula just west of the mouth of the Suron. Thence it returned to the east bank of the Suron and followed it, and that of its tributary, the Wovka, in a line making due south to it struck the Nida. It ran down the west bank of the Nida to the upper Vistula, followed the Donayets and the Biwa to the Carpathian foothills, reached the watershed at the Dukla Pass, and then bent northwards, holding the Galician entrances to the Wolfkov and the Usok. East from it, it kept the northern side of the range, close up to the foothills till it reached the Romanian frontier. Its total length was just short of 900 miles, 
the longest battlefront in the history of the world. But it was no continuous network of defense like the line in the west, being little more than intermittent field trenches, only wired when bogs, forests, and hill sites were not provided by nature. Like her western allies, Russia adopted a system of army groups. These were two in number, a southern under Ivanov and a northern under Rusky. In Ivanov's command were the army of the Nida under Ivet, the army of the Donayets under Rakhil Dmitriev, the force engaged in the investment of Pusimisla under General Selemanov, Rusinov's army of the Carpathians, and the small Ninth Army in the Bukovina under Alexiev who had been Ivanov's chief of staff. Ruski's group embraced the army operating on the Belisa, the forces defending Warsaw along the Wovka and the Suron, the army of the Nerev, and the army operating against Masuraland. The immediate plan of investing Krakow had been relinquished. Russia had come to realize the weakness of numbers without weapons and had no hope yet a while of receiving adequate supplies either from home or from foreign factories. So far the campaign had been terribly costly, and thousands of the best regular officers and hundreds of thousands of the most seasoned troops were dead or in captivity. What remained were short of artillery and ammunition, of rifles and cartridges, of machine guns, even of clothing. She realized, too, that she was likely for the next months to be the chief target of the German attacks. She was therefore compelled to forego her dreams of Krakow and Potsdam, and to limit her offensive to her flanks. An advance in East Prussia would straighten and shorten her front, and a southward movement through the Carpathians would secure Romanian's allegiance, and might prove the last straw for a fainting Austria. Such movements on the wings meant that the central part of the front must be seriously weakened. The places were chosen because it was towards East Prussia and Hungary that the Teutonic League was most vulnerable. To outrage the sacred East Prussian soil would bring Hindenburg hot on the invaders' trail, and Hungary was Germany's chief remaining granary and the most sensitive part of the dual monarchy. The Grand Duke did not contemplate any enveloping offensive, for that he had not the men or guns. All he sought was to annoy and distract his enemy. Germany in January 1915 had reached the conclusion that nothing could be done for the moment in the West, and that it behoved her once for all to settle accounts with Russia. Only thus would Austria be saved from dissolution. Hindenburg was due to receive in February four new corps, and with them he hoped to reach a decision in East Prussia, which would at the same time relieve the situation in the Carpathians. He created a new 10th Army under von Eichhorn to take position between the 8th and the 9th Armies. With it and the 8th, he hoped to envelop the Russian right. Meantime, a new German Southern Army was formed under von Linsingen, to be inserted in the Austrian front east of the Uzok Pass. It was a course from which he was strongly averse, but he had no alternative. Austria's signals of distress were too urgent to be disregarded. In order to mislead the Russians, the Ninth Army was instructed to begin the operation by an attack upon the Ravka and Suron lines, with the aid of 18,000 rounds of gas shells as if the German plan were still a frontal assault on Warsaw. 1. The details of the valley of the Ravka must be noted. From its confluence with the Suron, it runs mostly south till it is cut by the railway line between Skinevica and Warsaw. On both sides, the ground slopes gently down to the water's edge. The town of Bolimov lies on its eastern bank about midway between the railway and the Suron. Opposite Budimov, about two miles from the stream, there is a row of downs, with the castle and distillery of Bosomov at the northern end. South of these downs, on both sides of the Ravka, are great belts of wood which extend for some dozen miles eastward towards Warsaw. Bolimov is about 40 miles from the capital, and is connected with it by a fair road. 
the Russian front was on the west bank of the Suron for two miles above its meeting with the Vestula. Then it changed to the eastern bank, keeping close to the water's edge and passing through the town of Sokachev, where it catched the Warwish Warsaw line. On the Ravka, it was more retired from the stream and held a line of trenches just in front of the crest of the downs opposite Bodemov, while the Germans had theirs close to the water and on the east bank. Skanevitsa was in German hands, and the Russian front crossed the railway about two miles east of it in a clearing of the large forests. On Sunday, 31st January, Mackinson had concentrated masses of artillery all along the front of the Ravka and down the Suron as far as Sogachev. He made his great artillery bombardment on a wide front in order to puzzle the enemy as to the direction of the main attack. But in the meantime, he was getting together his strength of men and guns on a line of seven miles in front of Bulamov. Here on the evening of Monday, 1st February, he had not less than seven divisions, a strength of something like ten rivals per yard. That night, the artillery, working by the map, began a preparation from the slopes west of the Ravka against the Russian position on the Bozhamov crest. It was snowing heavily, and under cover of the guns and weather, the infantry advanced up the slopes. Their formation was massed, sometimes ten and sometimes twenty-two men deep. They were mowed down by Russian shrapnel and machine gun fire, but the impetus of numbers carried them into the first line of Russian trenches. All along the front, from the castle of Bozimov, past Vola Zetwovska to Gomin, among the woods and down to the Skidnevitsa Warsaw Railway, the Germans gained ground. A second and then a third line of trenches were captured on the Tuesday, and by that evening the Russians had been pushed back to the crest of the ridge, and in some places beyond it, where the ground began to slope down to the little river Suka. Mackinson laid his plans well, and what was considered as a feint almost resulted in a substantive victory. He did not propose to repeat the mistakes he had made before Wuch and drive into the enemy's front a wedge too narrow to be effective. He realized that a bridge must be wide enough to move in and to permit him to operate against the broken flanks. All through Wednesday, 3rd February, he looked like seceding. But the place he had chosen for his assault happened to be the place of all others which the Grand Duke could most readily reinforce. There were two railways and two good roads, and troops were hurried along them from Warsaw, some divisions under orders for the north having been hastily recalled. Through the driving snow, the supports came on, and on Thursday, 4th February, late in the afternoon, the German advance was checked. It had done wonders. It was over the crest of Bozumov, and it had advanced nearly five miles along the Warsaw Railway. Another day, and the Ravka front might have been fatally breached, though the Guarnier lines would still have lain between the enemy and the capital. The counter-attack at Bulimov had scarcely begun to develop when Hindenburg set in motion his great northern scheme. From Dachimann, northward lay Einhorn's 10th Army, the enveloping force to be directed southeast to the frontier. South of it was Otto von Bello's 8th Army, moving on the Bob and the Narev, with a call from the 9th Army, Echelon, on the right rear. For those who love historical parallels, the position in the east at the beginning of February was full of interest. It resembled, as a distinguished writer pointed out, the situation in June 1812, when Napoleon was mustering his forces for the invasion of Russia. Then, as now, the front of the opposing armies was immense and extended from Galicia to the Lehman. Schwarzenberg and his Austrians, issuing from Galicia, represent the armies under the Archduke Eugen. The king of Westphalia, marching on Warsaw and Beer Wustock, is paralleled by Mackinson's command. The Viceroy of Italy, farther to the left, is reproduced by the German force on the right bank of the Vistula. The Emperor Napoleon, Mihai and the dukes and princes who came from Thorn and Marian Verda into East Prussia stand for the new German forces which Hindenburg is crowding into Masurenland. While lastly, 
Macdonald, with the Prussians in front of Tilsit, has his counterpart in the German force, which is already across the memo, and will act, no doubt, as Macdonald acted before. 2. When, towards the end of January, the Grand Duke began his forward movement in East Prussia, the force used was the 10th Army of Four Corps, commanded by General Baron Sievers. A strong frost had set in with February, much snow had fallen, and icy winds from the north piled up drifts on every highway. But in spite of the weather, by the 6th of February, the 10th Army had made astonishing progress. Its right was close upon Tilsit, and thence it ran just east of Instable, along the Angara River, just east of Lutzen, which was the key of the main route through the lakes, well to the west of Luke, till its left rested on the town of Johannesburg. South of it, but separated by a big gap, lay the scattered forces which constituted the Russian army of the Nariv. It had two railways behind it, one from Instaburg to Kovno, and one from Luke to Osovitz. But two railways were scarcely sufficient for a front of a hundred miles. On 7th February, the surprise which Hindenburg had prepared was sprung upon the invaders. The German advance was pressed along the whole line Tilsit, Johannesburg, and according to plan, the left wing, the 21st Corps under Fritz von Bello, swept in an unflanking movement east of Tilsit in the curve formed by the lower Niemen. The Russian right in front of Pugalen and Gombanen was compelled to retire to avoid envelopment and the lateral line of its retreat was along the railway to Kovno. In so doing, it turned a little to the northeast, and since the railway had its speed of movement, the core just to the south of it was left out of line. This core was the 20th, commanded by General Bugakov, and composed of one first-line division and three regiments of reservists, in all some 30,000 men. On the 7th, it had been lying along the Angara River, from Gumbernan to south of Dakerman. Eichhorn drove it back to the lateral frontier railway, after which there was no good way through the forests and marshes between the frontier and the Niemen. Its right wing was turned, and it was pressed down towards the south, with the enemy on three sides of it. In the wide forests north of Suwaki, it speedily became a broken force, and companies and regiments were left to make the best of their way home. The two southern corps had to face the attack of Otto von Bilo's 8th Army between Lützen and Johannesburg. They held a strong position in the eastern narrows of the lake region, and the passages were fiercely disputed. The extreme German right drove the Russian left across the frontier to Kono. Other corps farther north occupied Johannesburg and pressed back the Russians from before Lützen. The sternest struggle was for the narrows which covered the approach to Luk from the west, but by the night of the 13th Luk was abandoned, and the two southern Russian corps were straggling over the border, retreating by the Suwaki Cerny Causeway and by the Ozoviets Railway. By the 12th, Eichhorn was over the Russian frontier and had occupied Mariampo, and Otto von Bilo was also on Russian soil, moving towards Rodno and Ozoviets. By that time, what was left of Sievers' 10th Army was on the Niemen and the Bob. A bare outline gives little idea of the difficulties of the operations on both sides. For an army to fall back 70 miles under the pressure of a force greatly is superior, based on a good railway system, is at all times a hard feat. When it is added that more than half of Sievers' army had no railways to assist them, but must struggle with their guns through blind forests choked with snow drifts, the task verged on the impossible. The Russian losses were large, and the 10th Army was all but annihilated. By the 20th, the vigor of the German thrust had spent itself. The Russian remnant was entrenched, and the inevitable counterattack had begun. Once again, the rival forces were on more equal terms for the zone of German railways had been left behind. Motor transport was impossible, and the big Pomeranian horses were for work in snow and slush far inferior to the little Russian ponies. 
The Russian stand, which was virtually a counter-attack, began about the 19th. The line held was well to the west of the Neman. It ran from Kovno, covering Oleta, Miroslav, Draskaniki, and Grodno, then in front of Ossoviets, down the line of the Bob, and then north of the Nerev. For the present, we are dealing only with the thrust of Einhorn and Octavon Bilo on the Neman and the Bob and may neglect the operations developing along the Nerev. The German aim was clear. The map will show that the main line from Warsaw to Petrograd crosses the Niemen at Grodno, running about 30 miles south of Ossowiec, and at an average distance of 20 miles from the upper Nerev. If this line could be cut, then one of Warsaw's chief communications would cease and the road would be open for the capture of the city by an advance from the northern flank. Obviously, the most deadly movement against this line would be that made nearest Warsaw, but since the Germans had got so close to the Niemen, it was justifiable to attempt to cut it there, far as it was from Warsaw, provided a great effort were also made against the Nerev's section. The fighting on the Niemen and the Bob, therefore, developed into the operations of the left wing and left center of the German armies. The extreme left wing did little. Turogen, on the right bank of the Niemen, was seized and held, but the numbers were small, and no serious effort was made to force the difficult line of the Niemen's tributaries and take Kovno from the north. The chief attacks were two. Einhorn, about 20th February, launched the veterans of the 21st Corps from Suwaki against the Niemen a little north of Grodno. Dense forests on both sides of the river made an effective screen, and the Corps succeeded in making the passage, and for the better part of a week maintained themselves effectively on the eastern shore. They were unable to move against the Warsaw Petrograd Railway, which was less than 10 miles off. The second attack was delivered against Ossoviets, the fortress which Hindenburg had previously assaulted in September. Then, it would be remembered, the Germans had failed to find emplacements for their heavy guns in the wide marshes, for Ossoviets stands on a strip of hard land, where run the railway and the high road, and on all sides the swarms creep up to its skirts while the only good gun positions for miles round are part of the defences of the fortress. This second siege of Ossoviets was conducted with great determination, and lasted for the better part of a fortnight. It made no impression, for in those flat, snow-clad wastes, where every knuckle of dry soil was known to the defence, there were no opportunities for screening the big houses, and the guns of the fort seemed to have rapidly silenced them. By the beginning of March, the Russian counterattack had developed, and everywhere from Kovno to the Nerev, the invaders were checked. The 21st Corps had to leave its perch across the Niemen. On 5th March, the serious attack on Ossoviets ended, and the big houses were shipped on their railway carriages. By the middle of March, Hindenburg had drawn back his left and left center to a position some 10 miles inside Russian territory and covering his own frontiers. He had achieved one part of his purpose. He had cleared away for good the Russian menace in East Prussia, and had established an abiding threat to Warsaw from the north. We turn to the simultaneous campaign on the Nerev, where the right wing of the 8th Army under von Schultz was engaged, presently reinforced by detachments from the 10th Army under von Gowitz. Here lay the crucial part of the operations, for here lay the nearest flank road to Warsaw. Hindenburg, after the blow to the Russian right, hoped to find the Nerev so ill-guarded that he might cross it and take possession of the main railway before Russia grasped his purpose. His winning card was the East Prussian lines, which allowed him to move men speedily and securely and far behind his front. We must note the details of the Nerev Valley from the point where it receives the stream of the Bob. It flows in a tortuous course generally to the southwest in a marshy district, mostly heavily forested, and with few ridges to break the monotony. North of it and east of the Sansnich, there are some hills of considerable heights, with forests patching their sandy slopes. 
it had a series of fortified towns commanding the chief crossings, which beginning from the east were Wamsa, Ostuanka, Usan, Putusk, and Sarot, where it joins the book about 50 miles from Novo Georgiewicz. The Great Warsaw Petrograd line ran from 30 to 40 miles south of it and sent off several branches which met at Ostrovanka. These branches were the only railway connections of the Narif Valley. Just west of it ran the important line from Warsaw to East Prussia through Mwala. The town of Sesnich lies about halfway between the East Prussian frontier and Usan on the Narif. It rose converged upon it and gave it, therefore, some strategical value. To the east lay the low, boggy valley of the river Osage, at that time deep in snow. West was a ridge about 200 feet high, which separated the Osage system from the little valley of the river Modinia, down which ran the Mwawa Warsaw Railway. About the middle of February, the Russian army of the Narev, the 12th army commanded by General Plevy, was very weak. The strongest part, its left, had been in action towards Pwosk since January. In front of Psesnich, there was an outpost of a single brigade, and between Psesnich and the railway was another outpost, a division strong, holding the ridge between the two watersheds. On Monday the 18th, the Germans, now reinforced by Gorwitz's detachment, began to concentrate on the line Mwawa Kosala being well served by the lateral frontier railway from Sotau to Wellenberg and by the Mwawa Warsaw line on their right. The advance began on Monday, 22nd February. The right came down the Mwawa railway, the center from Kassela down the main high road to Sesnich, and the left down the Osets valley in a flanking movement directed apparently against Ostrowanka and the Narev. The single Russian brigade in front of Bzesnich was driven back upon the town, and on the 24th, the Germans under von Morgan captured Bzesnich, taking a number of guns and about half the isolated brigade. There remained only the division which had taken its stand on the ridge, which lies between Bzesnich and Chekhanov on the river Udinia. On the 23rd, this force was assaulted by the German right from the Mwawa railway and by the center from Sesnich which attacked by way of the village of Vola Piaspovska, to the southeast of the ridge. Meantime, the left wing was proceeding down the Ossets, and had taken the town of Krasnoshets, and was threatening Ostrowanka and Usan. This most critical situation was saved by the division on the ridge. Fighting a battle on two fronts, it held out for more than 36 hours, till the evening of Wednesday the 24th when the 4th Siberian Corps had begun to come up. They came by Chekhanov, where they strengthened the line of the heroic division. Another support arrived from Putusk, Usan, and Ostrowanka against the German right and center. The enclosures had now become the enclosed, for the German center was hemmed in at Volopiaspovska, between the Russians on the ridge and the corps coming from the valley of the Narev. The Russian right, meanwhile, had attacked Krasnoshets and driven the German left off the Oshets. The invaders were being pressed in on three sides and driven northward through Sesnich. This battle was fought under conditions which are scarcely to be paralleled from the history of modern war. Russia, hard put to it for munitions and arms, was unable to equip masses of the trained men that she had ready and it was the custom to have unarmed troops in the rear of any action who could be used to fill gaps and take up the weapons of the dead. At Sesnich, men were flung into the firing line without rifles, armed only with a sword bayonet in one hand and a bomb in the other. That meant fighting, desperate fighting, at the closest quarters. The Russians had to get at all costs within range to throw their bombs, and then they charged with cold steel. This was berserker warfare, a defiance of all modern rules, a return to the conditions of the primitive compact. But it succeeded. The Germans gave ground before numbers which were not their equal, and huddled into Psesnich. On Friday the 26th, the Russians entered that town, and all Saturday the battle raged among the snowy ridges towards Stagna. By Sunday morning, the enemy's strength was broken, and the retreat was ordered. 
the Battle of Sensnich decided the fate of Hindenburg's bid for Warsaw by a flank movement. It was an action which had more affinity with one of the struggles of old days than with modern engagements. The stand on the ridge with the enemy on both sides should have been impossible by all the test books. But with Russian armies, impossibilities happened, and the fight deserves to rank in the history of the war with Foch's two-fronted battle at Fair Champenoise and Smith Dorian's at Lugato. End of chapter 24, part 1 Chapter 24, Part 2 of A History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24, Part 2. 3. The sea now changes to the Russian left, where the battles of the spring were for the most part a long struggle for the mountain passes. To capture a pass, it is not sufficient to hold a crest at the watershed. The debouchement into the enemy's country must also be held for it is precisely at the debouchment that the point of danger lies the invader shut up in a strict mountain valley has no lateral communications but this is an advantage to him till he has descended the farther slope for he is immune from flank attacks but when he would issue from the pass into the enemy's lowlands he is at once exposed to assault from many routes and unless he can hold the foothills which will allow him to debouch and deploy he can make little of his mountain vantage points. In examining the struggle for the Carpathians, which lasted through December and January, and started with new force at the close of the latter month, it must be kept in mind what it means to hold the passes. Rusinov held all the main ones in October, because he commanded all their outlets to the Hungarian plains. Russia lost them all in December, lost in some cases her own Galician approaches. By Christmas, she had regained all the Galician entrances and was almost on the crest of the Dukla. On the first day of January, she had carried the watershed west of the Usok and had begun to pour down the Hungarian glens towards Ungva. Presently, she was struggling for the Wolfkov, and word came of her cavalry at Mesolobos on the southern side. In the mass of news of those operations in the hills, it was hard to find exact truth for the simple reason that no distinction was made in the communicates between the main position of an army and the doings of a cavalry patrol. For example, a few weeks later, Russian successes were reported at Monkets, 30 miles south of the Carpathians, while on the same day, a little farther east, there was a vigorous Austrian attack on Russian positions, fully 20 miles north of the range. This did not mean that the Russian line was indented like a nightmare soul, but only that a cavalry vanguard had shown exceptional boldness. But during January and February 1915, Russia did not hold any of the passes in the true sense. She could not have debouched from any of them in safety. Her main position was still on the north side of the Carpathians. Rusinov in his mountain campaign was not yet inaugurating an offensive. He was endeavouring to clear his flanks to win back the ground he had held in October. The real offensive of these months was farther east in the Bukovina, but Brusinov's advance was met by a vigorous Austrian concentration which was directed to one single object, the relief of Pesemisler. The enemy right wing had been reinforced by German troops and knowing well that the Greek fortress was in extremis, they made one last effort to save it and drive Brusinov from the Galician foothills. In an earlier chapter, the nature of the Carpathian range has been sketched, but the time has come to look more closely at its character. It bends in a semicircle round the Hungarian plain, but it is not to be regarded as a single continuous ridge like the Pyrenees. At the northwestern end is the mountain country of North Hungary, a region more than a hundred miles wide from north to south, which includes the bare volcanic range of the high Tatra and the loftiest peaks of the system. At the southeastern end is a still broader mass formed by the hilly country of the Bukovina, which acts as a bastion, and inside the loop of the chain, the great mountain district of Transylvania, bounded on the south by the Transylvanian Apes. The central part of the range, which was the theater of the campaigns, forms a kind of curtain between the two flanking masses, here lie the chief passes, 
and here is the main route from the north to the plain of Hungary, the road traversed centuries ago by Tatar and Magyar invaders. Between the valleys north and south of the watershed, there is a notable difference. In the north, they are separated by long spurs of hill and run roughly parallel and some distance apart. But in the south, owing to the semicircular nature of the chain, they converge rapidly on each other, and their streams unite to form the Thais. In general, the distance from plain to plain over the central range is not less than 30 miles. The rock is mainly sandstone, with some few volcanic outcrops on the south which form peaks and precipices. Sandstone means, for the most part, easy slopes, rounded tops, and wide valleys. Unlike the High Tatra, too, the section is heavily wooded, and as we go east, the woods increase till the range is one undulating forest. On the lower lands, the trees are beech, and as the ground rises, fir and pine clothe it till just short of the summits. The Bukovina means the country of beech woods. The central Carpathians from the Dukla Pass to the Bukovina were therefore the easiest avenue between Hungary and the north. There, the summits were lowest and the range most narrow. There were also good lines of lateral communication on both sides as well as five railways crossing the chain. On the Galician side, a line followed the foothills and linked up the mouths of the glens from Sandek to Stray. On the Hungarian side, the branch lines running into the hills were connected by a good main line from Pressburg by Budapest and Miskoitz to Munkes. So far as communications went, both the combatants were reasonably well served but the danger was greater on one side than on the other. From the nature of the topography, to conquer Hungary from Galicia was easier than to conquer Galicia from Hungary. An enemy once south of the passes must advance along valleys which quickly converged, and whenever he approached the junction point, his advent would make the position of troops in the other converging valleys untenable. On the Galician side, on the contrary, the long parallel valleys, which often in their earlier courses run in the same direction as the range, gave the defense strong positions, and enabled one part of the front to keep its ground in one valley, though the invader had driven in the outposts in a neighboring glen. When Austria made her efforts to save Pusemsla, there was a defensive as well as an offensive purpose in her movement. Unless Rusanov were driven right away from the passes, unless Austria held the Galician debouchments, there was no security for those rich Hungarian cornlands, in which the sowers would soon be busy, and from which Germany looked to make good the deficiencies of her coming harvest. While Rusanov was endeavoring to push across the passes from the Dukla to the Usok, the extreme Russian left moved through the Bukovina towards the Carpathian watershed. Rusanov, it will be remembered, had seized Chernovitz, the capital, and Kolomia in the first half of September, after the victory of Lambert, and ever since, the northern Bukovina had been in Russian hands. Very early in the new year, a forward movement began on the left by a small Russian force, not more than a division, which was opposed by an Austrian force but little stronger. On 6th January, the town of Kimbolong was captured, and the Russians had fought their way for 80 miles to the mountain watershed. Almost the whole of the Bukovina was now in their hands. On 17th January, they took the pass of Kilababa, a low saddle between wooded ranges, over which runs the road from Kimbolong to the Hungarian town of Maramaro Siket. The main pass of those parts, the Bogo, which lies in the angle where Transylvania, the Bukovina, and Romania meet was not in their possession, and this was the most vital pass, for it gave access by the Shamosh River to the lateral communications of the Austrian front, and by the Marosh River to the heart of Transylvania. A great army does not adopt a serious offensive with one division. The Russian movement in the Bukovina was not strategical but political in its import. Russia had not sufficient forces to turn the enemy's flank, but she had enough for a political diversion. The Bukovina advance was directed to the address of Romania. That country was in a position of peculiar difficulty. Strategically, she commanded the Austrian right rear, 
Commercially, she was one of Germany's main supply grounds for petrol and grain. She was intimately linked with Italy in her foreign policy, and it was generally believed that the entry of the one on the side of the Allies would soon involve the adhesion of the other. But at the same time, her situation was dangerous, for on her flanks she had a hostile Turkey and a dubious Bulgaria. Moreover, while she had little love for the Teutonic League, she was still profoundly suspicious of Russia, and the loss of Bessarabia rankled scarcely less than the loss of Transylvania. During the month of January, arrangements were made for the advance by the Bank of England of five million pounds against Romanian treasury bills, an arrangement which pointed to a considerable progress in her negotiations with the Allies. But to make her way clear, it was necessary to remove the menace of Turkey, and as we shall see later, the Allies took steps to achieve this result by their Dardanelles operations. Further, some pressure must be brought to bear on popular opinion, and the presence of a Russian army on the threshold of Transylvania might prove a potent influence. The Bukovina and Transylvania contained a large population Romanian in blood and language. If Romania allowed these districts to be occupied by Russia and still remained neutral, she would have little prospect of making a successful claim to the annexation of any part of them at the close of the war. If she hoped for Transylvania, she must play her part in winning it. But if the Russian advance aimed at putting pressure upon Romania to join the Allies, it was also aimed at facilitating her cooperation if she took the plunge. The map will show how the Bukovina dominated the communications between Romania and the Russian front in Galicia. The main Romanian line ran north and connected by Chernovitz and Colomia with Lamberg and the Galician system. If the Bukovina were held by Austria, Romania would be compelled, should she intervene, either to attack Hungary by the Transylvania passes, a difficult course which would turn her effort into an isolated campaign, cut off from all direct communication with the Russian front, or she would be forced to send her troops by a long circuit through Bessarabia and Podolia. The position towards the end of the third week in January was, therefore, as follows. Brusanov held the crests of the Carpathians at the Dukla Pass, and practically at the Wukov, and everywhere else the Russian line was close up to the northern foothills. If the advance here was pushed with rigor, the upper valleys of the Thais might be won, and converging columns would descend on the Hungarian plains. In the east of the chain, the Russians had won the watershed at Kelibaba, had occupied all the Bukovina except the small southwestern corner around the Bogo Pass, and were threatening to bring about that political result, the entrance of Romania into the struggle, which Austria especially dreaded. The situation called for a great effort, and with Germany's aid, Austria was ready. On 13th January, Count Berto, the Austrian Minister of Foreign Affairs, resigned his portfolio. A great nobleman and landed proprietor, he had found politics an uncongenial task. His place was taken by Baron Stephen Burian, a Hungarian diplomatist who was of the party of the Hungarian Premier, Count Tissa. We may regard Count Tissa as now the one dominant influence in the policy of the dual monarchy. It was his own Hungary that was threatened, and he was resolved that no German preoccupation with East Prussia and Warsaw should prevent him from holding the enemy in the gates. The Carpathian campaign was fought in deep snow, three feet or more on the saddles, and far deeper in the glens. Eastward, among the beech woods, the weather improved, but for the most part, the conditions were scarcely less rigorous than those which Enver some weeks before had faced in the Caucasus. The sufferings on both sides were terrible, but it was worse for the Austrians, who were of a less hardy breed than the Russian peasant soldiers, and were less accustomed to a bitter winter. In the last week of January, the sun shone in the mountains, and observers described how the virgin white of the slopes as the battles progressed, became a vivid scarlet with the blood of the fallen. In February, blizzards were the rule, and the fighting in the uplands slackened per force, though the struggle in the foothills continued. 
the Austrian forces were grouped in three main armies. In the section from the Dukla to the Utsok was the army of Borovich, charged with the relief of Przemysla. In the section from the Usok to the Wieskuf Pass, directed along the Munkers Lamberg Railway, was the army of the German von Linsingen, which contained various German formations and which had for its chief of staff Ludendorff, bitterly contemptuous of his allies, and complaining that Germany had bound herself to a corpse. Farther east was the army of von Flanze Bauten, moving upon the Bukovina, mainly by the Dalatin or Jabonitsa Pass. The whole offensive was skillfully staged managed. Rumors were set about that Austria meditated a great attack upon Serbia, and that four German corps had been sent south for the purpose. A pretense was made of bombarding Belgrade and occupying islands in the Danube, but the troops never got farther south than the railway junction of Miskoit, whence they went eastward to the Maramaros valleys. The Austrian left made little progress. It was held by Brusanov on the Dukla and Wukov, but it crossed the Rostogi and the Usok, and forced the Russians back on the upper stream of the San about Baligru. The resistance of the Russian right at this point was much assisted by the work of Dmitriev and the army of the Donayets, who on the front from the Vistula to Smigru checked the offensive of the Austrian Second Army and inflicted on it severe losses. East of the Wukov, however, the Austrians won all the passes and poured their troops into Galicia. Linsingen, moving by the railway pass of the Beskid and the two road passes Beresk and Visku, advanced in the direction of Srey and Lemberg. Farther east, Flanza Bauten crossed the range by the old Mekya and Tata ways and advanced upon Stanislav and Kolomia, while on 23rd January, his right wing pushed the Russians off the Kilababa Pass, and three days later was close upon Kimbulun. The two points of danger were the advance of the Austrian center on Srey and of the Austrian right upon Stanislav. A strategical blunder seems to have been committed in the first region. The capture of Stray and the upper valley of the Nista would be the first step to the relief of Bizemsla, and the attack was pushed here with a force which could have been used to more purpose in the Bukovina. Bizemsla showed once again the fatal magnetism which a fortress can exercise both on the attack and the defense. Linsingen's effort shipwrecked upon the difficulties of the Galician foothills. The glens run long and straight towards the Nista, the pass which is variously called the Varesk and the Tohuka carries a road which crosses a minor ridge and descends by a tributary glen to the valley of the Opo. The pass called the Biscuit or the Voloch carries a railway which continues down the Opo valley. Between the meeting place of these two roads, that is, between the Opo and the stream which runs from the direction of the Varesk pass, is a ridge which takes its name from the village of Kosova and which is marked in the map as 992 meters. It rises steeply, is forested to its summit, and its roots are washed by forming torrents. There, during February and the first days of March, Brusanov's center withstood Linsingen's assault. The action of Kosova saved Stray and Lambert, prevented the relief of Przemysla, and gave time for reinforcements to reach the Bukovina. The Russians, so long as they held the heights, prevented the departments of the Austrian columns, and in spite of desperate bayonet attacks, they could not be dislodged. The situation was an instructive commentary on the nature of mountain warfare. The two Austrian forces, moving by two different passes, could not cooperate because of the high land between them. If the forces on the left needed reinforcements from the right, they must be taken back over the range to the point north of Munkes, where the two routes diverged. The Russians, holding the valley mouths and all the plains behind them, were in a far easier position. The selection of Kosovo for a stand showed good generalship, for it was the main strategic point of the central range. So long as the Wukov and the Dukla were held, and so long as the openings of the Rostoki and the Usok were stoutly guarded, the defense of Kosovo meant the safety of Galicia. The Austrian right made better progress. 
about 18th February, moving from the southern corner of the Bukovina at Kimpolong, and also by way of the Yamonisa Pass down the valley of the Pruth, it took Chernovitz on the railway from Romania, and presently Colombia, which is the junction between the Yabonitsa line and the railway from Chernovitz to Lamberg. Between 27th February and 3rd March, it advanced northward and took Stanislaw, from which ran the line which followed the foothills to Stray and Prismisla. It was a conspicuous success, for it threatened the Russian main communications. From Stanislaw, as the crow flies, it was only some 70 miles to Lamberg and some 50 to Tarnopo, through which ran the line to Kiev and Odessa. It did not succeed, however, in forcing the Russians behind the Nista. The weak Russian left fell back rapidly, fighting small delaying actions, till it reached a position where reinforcements could join it. On the 3rd of March, these reinforcements arrived, and the enemy was driven out of Stanislaw, and the menace to the Stanislaw straight line removed. During the next fortnight, the Austrian right was slowly pushed back almost to the kolomir chernovitz line. By 21st March, the position in the Carpathians was that the Russians held the Dukla and were close on the crest of the Wupkov. They did not hold the Rostocki or the Rusok, but held in strength the northern debouchments, so that they were of no use to the enemy. All the passes to the east of the Usok were in Austrian hands, but the true debouchments had not been won till the Yamonissa was reached, from which point to the Romanian frontier, the Austrian armies were from 60 to 100 miles north of the watershed. The main strategical object of the offensive had failed, for Prismisla was no nearer to relieve or Lamberg to recapture. On Monday, 22nd March, after an investment of nearly seven months, Prismisla fell. The city had been famous as a fortress for nearly a thousand years. In the early ages, it held the outlets of the main passes between Hungary and the north, a Turin or a Verona of the east. Often, these old mountain citadels have been hardly used by the modern world. Railways have shunned them. The route which made their fame has been left to gypsies and foot travelers. And the once famous fort stands like an empty sentry box at the gate of a dismantled palace. But Prismisla had never lost its value. Its first modern forts were begun in 1871. It was enlarged in 1887 when there was a prospect of trouble with Russia. It was rebuilt in 1896 and was fully brought up to date in 1909. It was the first of Austria's defensive schemes against an eastern invader. The fortress owed its modern importance to its situation astride the railways. The main trunk line between Krakow and Lamberg had been bent round so that it ran through the Ensembles. It was true that there were routes independent of Przemysla. The armies of the Donayets could draw their supplies from Lamberg and Kiev either by way of Yaroslav and Ravaraska on the north or by the southern line which skirted the Carpathians via Yazwo. Sano and Stray, but these were only makeshifts. The trunk line was by way of Tarnov, Eroslav, Prismisla, and Lambert, and with Prismisla in the enemy's hands, the trunk line was useless. Supplies had to make a laborious detour to north or south, and such an encumbrance meant much to Russia when every hour and every man counted. The situation of Prismisla did not make it an ideal rain fortress. The heights were insufficiently isolated, and on the northeastern side there was the widening plain of the sun. The city lay on the right bank of that river, which was crossed by two road bridges and one railway bridge. Round it, at a distance of about a thousand yards, was a strong system of inner lines. Beyond this, there was an intermediate circle of forts, mostly small, and beyond these again, at a distance of about six miles from the city, a circle of outer forts, consisting of nine main works, with numerous smaller connecting photon. The distance between these forts was not regular, but depended upon the nature of the ground. Besemisla was defended, therefore, like Liege or Lemur, its first line being the great forts themselves, and not, like Verdun, the far-flung trenches of a field army. 
Had Russia been well supplied with siege artillery, its fall would have been assured in the first month. When Lemberg fell in the beginning of September, part of Alfenbeck's army took refuge in Presemsa, and the numbers of the invested were increased by the debacle of Rabaroska a fortnight later. The place in normal times had some 50,000 inhabitants, mostly Jews, and this total must have been increased by refugees from the surrounding country. The bulk of four Austrian army corps were now in sight, and the total must have been over 200,000 souls. Provisions had not been collected on any great scale, and by the middle of October, starvation was within sight. Then came the first assault of Hindenburg upon Warsaw, when Ivanov retired behind the sun, and by 15th October, the investments had been broken. All the west and north of the city was open, and remained so until Hindenburg being in full retreat, the Austrian left had to retire westward to conform. Presemusler, therefore, had leisure to prepare for the second and grimmer blockade. It was known that large supplies of food and ammunition had been brought in. It was believed that most of the Austrian population had been sent out. And when the rain closed round it about 12 November, even the Russian general staff assumed that whatever man could foresee in the way of defense had been prepared. The astonishing thing is that nothing had been done nothing that touched the heart of the question. Austrian strategy in all that concerned Presemsa was bewildering in its incompetence. Why, to begin with, was so great a point made of its defense? Its possession meant much to Russia, but more in the way of convenience than stark necessity. It did not block completely her communications or veto finally her movements against the passes nor did it give Austria any conspicuous advantage with the seclusion of so large a force. Verdun was worth an army to France. Presumably to Austria was not the equivalent of a call. This was the view of the Russian staff, and the event proved them right. But if Austria thought fit to hold it at all costs, why were not the means proportioned to the end? Kuzmanek, the commander of the fortress, was a man just over fifty, a commander apparently of fair ability as the austrian army went but of a foresight even lower than the austrian average he did not propose to hold the place with a field army in outer entrenchments he guessed rightly that russia could not easily batter down the first line of works and for the purpose which he set himself fifty thousand men were ample instead of that he crowded inside the twenty-five miles perimeter something like a hundred and fifty thousands and part of these were cavalry. In short, he kept the same garrison as had blown in by accident in September after Alvenberg's misfortunes. Those who had sought Presemusa for sanctuary were retained for its defense, in spite of their unwieldy numbers and inferior quality. Moreover, he kept most of the civilian population. All that was done in the days of respite was to bring in food and shells as if food or shells by themselves were a sufficient bore. Kuzmanek, with a personal staff of 75, seems to have regarded Rusemsla as ideal winter quarters, and to have settled down to the siege under the impression that, long before the Ampo commissariat was curtailed, relief would have come. The chance given him in late October was neglected. The defense from the first was at the mercy of his own mismanagement, and passed from blunder to blunder. The Russian army of investments had nothing to do but to wait on the certain consequences of their opponent's folly. Yet there was a moment when relief came very near. General Selivanov had never more than a small force and little heavy artillery. By the middle of December, it will be remembered, Ivanov had to fall back from Krakow as the Austrian attack across the passes uncovered his left flank. On 15th December, the Austrians held the Galician debauchments of the Dukla and Wukov passes and were in Sanok itself, not 30 miles from Presemsa. Selivanov's position was full of peril. The Austrians coming through the passes were conversing by means of searchlights with the Austrians in the fortress. The enemy's guns sounded on both sides of the Russian lines. It was the chance for a successful sortie, and on 15th December, the sortie came. 
five Magyar infantry regiments broke through at the southwest angle and pushed 15 miles beyond the outer lines to Biriosa on the Sarnok road. For four days the issue hung in the balance. Slivanov brought reinforcements from another segment and drove back the sortie with a loss of 3,000 killed, wounded and prisoners. The more dangerous pressure from the south was presently relieved by Brusanov, who cleared the mouth of the passes, and by Christmas Day had restored the safety of the Russian flank. Thereafter, stagnation set in. The Russians perfected their position, and by means of light railways, secured great mobility round the whole circumference. There were no more sorties by the garrison, but an enormous expenditure of ammunition, mainly fruitless. The town itself was never shelled, and its streets showed none of the ordinary siege casualties. But they showed something worse, for famine began to stalk through them, since the provisions laid in in October could not maintain the motley multitude in the enceinte. The officers of the Bresemsler defense treated the siege as a business in which, at all costs, their health and comfort must be protected, though it is hard to see what purpose this protection served for they were singularly supine. They insisted on leading the ordinary lives of café and heavy meals, while their men were fainting from starvation in the streets. There were exceptions, of course, especially among the Hungarian Hanvi regiments, who meant business, but the conduct of Usmanek and his staff remains one of the ugly episodes of the war. On the night of 13th March, the end began. The village of Markovica in the northwest segment on the line to Yaroslav was carried by a Russian assault. This meant that the outer line of the defense had been successfully breached. The Russians fortified the ground they had captured and began a bombardment of a section of the inner circle. Four days later, on the night of the 18th, the garrison attempted a last sortie, which failed. Very early on the morning of the 22nd, the Russian lines heard the noise of many explosions. Kuzmanek was busy at purposes of destruction, and this he performed with an assiduity unknown in his other methods of defense. About 9 o'clock, the Austrian chief of staff arrived at Russian headquarters. He brought a letter from Kuzmanek, which ran, in consequence of the exhaustion of the provisions and stores, and in compliance with instructions received from my supreme chief, I am compelled to surrender the imperial and royal fortress of Przemysl to the imperial Russian army. A few Russian officers proceeded to the Austrian headquarters and received the surrender, but there was no formal and triumphal entry. The new Russian military governor took charge of the evacuation, sending off prisoners at the rate of 10,000 a day, and making provision for the feeding of those who remained. The fall of Przemysl was not a Russian achievement so much as an Austrian disgrace. It fell by its own momentum like an overripe fruit. Selimanov had only to bide his time for Kuzmanek to do his work for him. We cannot therefore compare it with any of the great sieges of history, with Lille or Paris or Port Arthur, for it was no case of a strife of inflexible wills and an issue determined by overmastering skill or strength nor was its fall a matter of prime strategical importance. Her success freed Russia from a menace, improved her railway communications, and gave her a good northern base against the central Carpathian passes. But the real gain was the release of Salimanov's army for an active offensive. To observers in the west at the time, it appeared that Hindenburg had now shot his boat, and that it was Russia's turn to advance. They underestimated alike the essential weakness of Russia and the boldness and efficiency of the German Eastern Command. For at the moment, Hindenburg and his staff were devising a mighty stroke, destined to sweep the Russian armies eastward like leaves in the wind, and to make their recent hard-won victories seem a far away, meaningless tale. End of chapter 24, part 2《Chapter Twenty Five of a History of the Great War, Volume One, by John Buchan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter Twenty Five, Neuf Chapelle, Eighth to Fifteenth March. In the early stages of a campaign, 
certain actions are thought which seem at first sight of small importance. Their scale is such that they would scarcely be noticed among the great battles of the close. They are affairs of corps rather than of armies, of divisions, even of battalions. But they are nonetheless epoch-making, for they represent the first step in an experiment which may control the future policy of the war. Of such a type was the engagement at Neuf Chapelle, into which the British army entered on 10th March. It was intended by Sir John French as a local enterprise to prepare the way for the great combined assault of the summer. He had collected a modest reserve of ammunition, and by dint of raking together every spare gun from the whole of his front, he hoped to explore the possibilities of the new method of artillery preparation, which the French had already tried in Champagne. He did not expect to inflict a decisive blow. Rather, he wished to test the value of tactics, which seemed both to him and to Joffre the true ones to break down the German defense, and to practice his troops and his staff in the type of action which promised to be the staple. The Dardanelles expedition, from the policy of which he profoundly differed, was beginning, and he was anxious for a success in the West which should concentrate public attention on what he regarded as the main battleground. The Allied front in Flanders and northern France was, by the beginning of March, little changed from its position in November. On the Isa, the floods were ebbing, for the German howitzers had broken the dams near Newport, which held them up, and by the middle of March, troops could cross the meadows between the railway line and the canal. South from Dismute to the point of the Ypres salient lay French troops, relieved at intervals by British cavalry. The southern reentrance was held by the new British Corps, the 5th, under Major General Sir Herbert Plumer, and south of them, behind Wishkit and Missin, lay the 2nd Corps. Putenay's 3rd Corps was in its old position astride the Lys, in front of Armentieres, and south of it, from Itier to west of Neuve Chapelle, was Sir Henry Rawlinson's 4th Corps. The Indian Corps continued the line towards Shivenshi where the first corps carried it across the canal, and linked up with Moudoui's 10th army. Moudoui had greatly improved his position by small successes on the ridge of notre dame du Lorhet, west of Lons, but his line in its main features was that which he had so stubbornly held in late October. But while the front remained the same, the Allied forces had been largely augmented. In November, Major General Davis' 8th Division had arrived to complete the 4th Corps. Early in January, the 5th Corps had been constituted under Sir Herbert Plumer, its two divisions being numbered the 27th and 28th, to allow of the new service divisions at home coming in between. These divisions were largely composed of men brought back from tropical stations who were highly tried by the abrupt transition to a Flemish winter. In February, a Canadian division under Major General Alderson, arrived, and by the beginning of March there were more territorial divisions with Sir John French than there had been territorial battalions in November. The British force had been organized in two armies under the commander-in-chief, the first army commanded by Sir Douglas Haig, embracing the first, fourth, and Indian Corps, and holding the line from La Bassi to Etier and the second army, commanded by General Sir Horace Smith Dorian, continuing the front to the Ypres salient, and including the second, third, and fifth corps. It was still the day of comparatively small things, but it is instructive to remember that the British under Marlborough were rarely more than a division strong, that at Waterloo we had a division and a half, that at our strongest in the peninsula we had no more than one modern army corps, that in the Crimea we had less than the strength of two divisions of today, and that at the full tide of the South African War we had under a quarter of a million men. March saw a British army assembled on the Flemish borders, twelve times as large as that which had triumphed under Wellington in the peninsula, and fifty-five times greater than the force which charged with King Harry at Archincourt. It had been decided as early as the middle of February that an action should be staged to test a new theory of attack. If a sufficiently powerful artillery fire were accumulated upon a section of the front, parapet and barbed wire entanglements could be blown to pieces. And if the artillery, lengthening its range, were able to put a barrage of fire between the enemy and its supports, the infantry could advance in comparative safety. 
to ensure the success of such a plan complete secrecy was necessary and for surprise the british were in an advantageous position the ascendancy in air work which they had exhibited made it difficult for a german airplane to show its nose over their lines without being promptly hunted back while their own airmen were able to make reconnaissances over the german front and determine where it was most weakly held the section chosen for the british attempt was the village of neuf chapelle it will be remembered that on sixteenth october smith dorian's second corps took the village and next day advanced as far as Uber and Ely, and on the nineteenth took the hamlet of le Pili, three and a half miles east of Louf chapelle a position which was the farthest one in this neighborhood the german counter-attack pushed us back to just east of Neuf chapelle and on twenty seventh october they recaptured the place so that by the beginning of november we had fallen back to a line well to the west of the village there we remained during the winter months the german lines covered the village and the british front ran from givenchy by festubert just east of Rishibu, just west of neuf chapelle and then northeast by fukisa and Wargreny, to east of armentier it will be seen that our line between la Bassi and neuf chapelle represented a reentrance which might profitably be straightened it was not so dangerous an angle as that at saint eloi south of ypres but in the neuf chapelle section the war had long languished and the enemy was less on his guard than in the old cockpit of the ypres ridges looking eastward from the british front neuf chapelle showed a long straggling line of houses among gardens with a tall white church standing conspicuous over the flats as studied in one of the photographs which airplanes obtained from above one main high road was revealed running north from la Bassi to Etier. at neuf chapelle a second road left this and went by Flubay to armentier and a connecting road joined the two and formed a diamond-shaped figure in the west angle of which the village lay the houses straggled round the road junction those on the east being small and crowded together and those on the west larger and surrounded by gardens and orchards at the northern apex of the diamond was a small triangle bounded by roads and fields with plots and hedgerows between the houses and the la Bassi road on the west were meadows and ploughland where lay the german trenches our own being about a hundred yards westward close along the highway to appreciate the strategic importance of neuf chapelle we must continue our survey to the east two miles southwest of lille a low but clearly marked ridge began which ran to the village of fun smith dorian's old october objective at fun it split into two one following the main la Bassi road to illy the other running west to Upumaru, and then bending northeast to Ube and Frommel. The top of these ridges was a low plateau which, once won, would command the approaches to Lille, Ube, Tukon, and the cities of the plain of the Scheldt. A small river, the Dele, flowed between Neuf Chapelle and the ridges. This stream crossed the La Bassi Highway south of Neuf Chapelle at a place which we called Port Arthur and was crossed to the northeast by three roads which ran towards the ridges from the neuf chapelle armentier highway along the stream lay the german second line of defence with strong positions at the bridgeheads and a mile northeast of the village at the piet mill whose tall chimney was one of the landmarks of the place a considerable wood mainly of saplings the bois d'aubier lay southeast of neuf chapelle on the left bank of the delay and another the bois du pomeru clothed the ridge south of ube obviously if the attack could be pushed so far as to carry the second german position the ridge would be won the la Passi lille line threatened and if fortune were kind lille itself rendered untenable on eighth march sir john french assembled his corps commanders and expounded to them the plan of attack the assault of neuf chapelle was to be undertaken by the first army the fourth corps operating on the north and the indian corps on the south in order to keep the enemy occupied and prevent him from sending reinforcements two supplementary attacks were arranged on the flanks of the main movement the first corps attacking from givenchy 
and the third corps from the second army attacking just south of Armentier. The scheme, which had been worked out by General John Gough, Haig's chief of staff, before his untimely death, was as prudent as it was bold. But it made high demands on our artillery, and it was to some extent at the mercy of accident. It involved an artillery bombardment four times greater than anything we had yet undertaken. First, the enemy's trenches and entanglements must be destroyed. Then, with a lengthened range, a curtain of fire must be hung between him and his supports. To achieve this, the staff work must be precise and efficient. The infantry must advance at the right moment, neither sooner nor later, for if they were too soon, they would run into our own fire, or would find the enemy's defences unbroken, and if they were too late, the crushing effect of the bombardment would be lost. No plan ever works out quite as it is intended, and it might be necessary to modify some parts. Close communication must be kept up between the infantry and the gunners far behind them. Dispatch bearers were too slow, and telephonic communication was aped to be destroyed in a bombardment, while if there should be fog, the difficulty would be increased. Everything depended upon the artillery observers and upon the effective coordination of the different units by the divisional staffs. So far as surprise went, that could be made certain. We could catch the enemy unawares, thanks to the brilliance of our air work. But whether we should merely straighten our line or drive a deep wedge into the German front which would threaten Lille depended upon the thousand chances of battle which no human staff could completely foresee. Very quietly, during the 8th and 9th, our artillery was brought together into a small area west of Neuf Chapelle. Every variety of gun was there. Field gun, field howitzer, 60-pounder, coast defense gun, and a new heavy howitzer, which was our answer to Krupp and Skoder. The main field artillery positions were just west of Richibou, while the heavy guns were around La Couture and Ville Chapelle. From 10 o'clock on the evening of the 9th, the infantry assembled in the March night. Every trench and ditch was full of them, masses of expectant men waiting on the order for the long-delayed advance. Hot meals were served out along the line, and like the soldiers of the revolution, they had hot coffee before sunrise. Then came a period of tense silence. Waiting under arms is a nervous business at the best, and doubly trying was such waiting as this with the unconscious enemy a hundred yards away, and all held leashed in the great guns behind. Down the line from Amatea to Labasi, there was the same eager anticipation. The men and the company officers did not know when the main attack was to be launched. All they knew was that they were on the eve of a great movement. Dawn on the 10th broke grey and solemn. The clouds hung low in the sky, and there was mist in the distance. The first light seems to have shown the Germans that something was astir in the British line. The trenches were full of men, so ran the reports of the outposts. But the corps commander took no steps. Then suddenly on the ancient ear of our troops fell the boom of guns. It was our artillery firing ranging shots. Then all was silent again, and from Amatea to Givenchy, battalion commanders looked at their watches. At 7.30, Punctually to a second, the silence was torn by a pandemonium of sound, a new thing in the experience of the British army. It split the ears and rent the heavens, so that the troops, crouching under cover, were dazed and maddened by the brain-wrecking concussions. Sometimes when the gun trajectory was low, a shell passed closed over their heads. Sometimes when the big howitzers fired, the shells rose to the altitude of a high mountain before descending on the doomed German trenches. The discharges were so rapid and incessant that they sounded as if they came from some supernatural machine gun. The earth vibrated as if struck by a great hammer. The first shells that hit the German position raised a mighty cloud of smoke and dust, and for the next 35 minutes we could see nothing but a pall of green lidite fumes and great mushrooms of red earth. Barbed wire entanglements were sliced through, parapets, the work of months were crumbled like sand castles, and horrible fragments of mortality blew back upon us with the lidite rafts. 
four shells to the yard was our ration of fire and in this action there was more use of artillery than in the year and a half of the south african war the preparation lasted thirty-five minutes and at the end of it there were no german front trenches only a welter of earth and dust and mangled bodies at five minutes past eight our gunners lengthened the range and the houses of the village began to leap into the air huge dust spouts went up to heaven trees were raised like rocks before a scythe and the cloud grew denser with the debris of brick and mortar then the whistles blew along the line the time had come for the infantry to advance due west of neuf chapelle lay two brigades of the eighth division the twenty third to the left and the twenty fifth on the right south of them on a front a mile and a half long was the merit division with the lahore division behind in close support on the left was the garo brigade with the terra dun brigade on its right the first attack was carried out by the twenty third against the northeast corner of neuf chapelle the twenty fifth against the village and the garo brigade against the southwest corner the twenty fifth had no difficulty with the trenches opposite them dazed and dying germans were the only enemy left though a machine gun or two still kept up fire from concealed positions and there was much sniping our artillery bombardments continued and it was not till eight thirty five that the range was again lengthened in order to interpose a curtain of fire between the village and the german supports then the two battalions of the twenty fifth brigade swept into the battle streets in which every german was soon dead or captured what had once been a village was now only a rubbish heap the church was a broken shard and the churchyard horribly ploughed up with our fire showed those long dead in their graves the ground was yellow with lithite the fruit trees and the oaks were torn up by the roots and over the desolation in the churchyard and at the crossroads loomed two gaunt crucifixes which by some miracle had escaped destruction to point an ironic moral the attack on the right by the Gower brigade was at first no less successful it easily carried the first trenches and swept on to the bois to be past the heap of wayside ruins which was once the hamlet of port arthur but on the left of the attack there was a different story there the artillery preparation had been insufficient and in the northern corner of neuf chapelle where there was a slight hollow the german trenches and barbed wire entanglements were still intact here the twenty third brigade advanced and the second scottish rifles the old cameroonians who had on their regimental rows lord hill lord walsley and sir evelyn wood came up against unbroken wire and a storm of shots from rifles and machine guns the splendid battalion never wavered they tore at the wire with naked hands but were compelled to fall back and lie in the fire swept open till one company got through a gap and broke down the defence they lost fifteen officers including their gallant commander and few regiments have lived through a more dreadful hour scarcely less terrible was the ordeal of the second middlesex on their right they too were mown down by machine guns in the open and faced with wire a message was sent back to the gunners and the middlesex waited in that zone of death till our shells had destroyed the entanglements meantime the success of the twenty fifth brigade to the south had turned the flank of the germans north of the village and presently the whole twenty third brigade had struggled through to the orchard northeast of neuf chapelle where they joined hands with the twenty fourth brigade which had attacked on their left from the neuf chapelle armentier highway by midday our artillery isolated the village with a curtain of shrapnel fire no german counter-attack was possible for no reinforcements could pierce that screen and our men had leisure to secure the ground they had won now was the moment while the enemy were still stupid with surprise and demoralized by the awful bombardment of the morning and while our own men were hot with victory to push on and carry the ridge which dominated the road to lille but the scheme had not gone as smoothly as was hoped all telephonic communications had been cut by our own and the enemy's fire and it was hard to get orders quickly to the first line the check of the twenty third brigade had put the whole movement out of gear and our front needed serious adjustment 
mistakes have been made. I am of opinion, Sir John French wrote in his dispatch, that this delay would not have occurred had the clearly expressed orders of the general officer commanding the first army been more carefully observed. There was also an unaccountable delay in bringing the reserve brigades of the 4th Corps into action. It was not till 3.30 in the afternoon that on the left of the 24th Brigade there formed up the three brigades of the 7th Division, the 20th, 21st, and 22nd, who had won for themselves immortal glory in the October battle round Ypres. The left of the attack now swung south, moving towards Ube by the hamlet of Piet. Simultaneously from the south, the Indian Corps, the Gawo and the Deradun brigades pushed towards the ridge through the Bois du Bi, but everywhere they met with difficulties. The Gawo brigade on the south came upon a German position unbroken by artillery and carried it only with desperate losses. While it established itself on this new line, the Deradun brigade, supported by the Tulondor brigade of the Lahore division, attacked farther to the south but were held up on the line of the river Dele by a German outpost at the bridge. Haig brought up the 1st Brigade from the 1st Corps to support, but darkness fell before they arrived. Farther to the left, on our front, another fortified bridge over the stream held up the 25th Brigade, while the 24th was checked by machine gun fire from the crossroads northwest of Piet village, and the 7th Division by the line of the Dele and the defense of the Piet Mill, Everywhere in this neighborhood were strong positions which our artillery had not yet touched, and to push an infantry attack was needless sacrifice. Accordingly, as the gray evening closed in, we devoted ourselves to strengthening our line on the ground we had won. Neuf Chapelle was ours. We had advanced a mile, and we had fully strengthened our line, but the wedge had still to be driven into the enemy. Nothing could be done without artillery. So early on the 11th, our fire was directed towards the Wadubi and the positions around Piet. Here and there, the Germans rallied and counterattacked, and here and there, we won a few hundred yards. But the enemy had now recovered himself. The asset of surprise had been lost, and our great artillery effort was exhausted. Such a preparation as was seen on the morning of the 10th could not be repeated. During the night of the 11th, German reserves came up from Tukor, and early on the 12th, the counterattack developed in force all along our front. The mist continued, and our guns could do little, for in the absence of proper communications between observers and batteries, they were just as likely as not to be shelling our own men. The stubborn bridgeheads of the delay still prevented access through the Buotobi to the ridges and the Germans held the fort around the Piet Mill and the neighboring crossroads, and so covered the approach to Ube. The German counterattacks were badly coordinated and effected little, but our own thrust was now rapidly spending itself. Much was hoped from the attack on the 12th, and the 2nd Cavalry Division under General Hubert Goff and the Brigade of the North Midland Territorial Division were ordered to support the infantry in the hope that there might be a chance for the cavalry to get through. But when Sir Philip Chatwood with the 5th Cavalry Brigade reached the Hu Packerwood at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he was informed by Sir Henry Rawlinson that the German positions were still unbroken, and he had regretfully to retire to Iter. All that day, the 7th Division on our left struggled against the Piet Fort, while the rest of the line attacked the Delay Bridges and the German 2nd Trenches in the Bois du Bi. The hardest task fell to the 20th Brigade around Piet Mill. They took position after position, but without the aid of artillery, their task was hopeless. Farther south, the 2nd Rifle Brigade from the 25th Brigade pushed forward in the afternoon and managed to carry a section of the German 2nd Trenches. But enfilading fire made their position untenable, and they were compelled to fall back on their old lines. By the evening of the 12th, it was clear that a stalemate had been reached. We could not win to the German position commanding the ridge, and they could not retake Nerf Chapelle. As most of the objects for which the operation had been undertaken had been attained, Sir John French wrote, and as there were reasons why I considered it inadvisable to continue the attack at that time, 
I directed Sir Douglas Hay on the night of the 12th to hold and consolidate the ground which had been gained by the 4th and Indian Corps, and to suspend further offensive operations for the present. Many of the German trenches were destroyed by shell fire. Many had been turned in to make graves. So all the 13th was spent by our weary troops in digging themselves into the wet meadows along the Dele. By the 14th, the two corps which had fought the action had been withdrawn into reserve. The most severe counter-attack was not at Neuf Chapelle, but 15 miles north, where the village of saint eloi stood on the southern ridge of Ypres. On the 14th of March, when the mists lay thick on the flats, the Germans concentrated a mass of artillery against the section held by the 27th Division. The village, which lay along the ypres Armentier road, was the point of that dangerous southern re-entrance to the Ypres salient which had been fought for so fiercely in the great October battle. At five in the afternoon, a heavy bombardment began, and at the same moment, two mines were exploded beneath a mound which was part of our front, to the southeast of the village. A fierce infantry attack followed, with the result that our men were forced out of their trenches. This led to the enfilading of the troops to the right and left, and the whole section of the British front fell back. Then came darkness, and under its cover we prepared our counter-stroke. It was delivered about 2 a.m. on the 15th by the 82nd Brigade with the 80th Brigade in support. The former drove the enemy out of the village of saint Eloi and retook part of the trenches to the east, while the latter completed the work, and by daybreak we had recovered all the lost ground which was of material importance. In this action, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry especially distinguished themselves, the first of the overseas troops to be engaged in an action of first-rate importance. Their deeds were applied to the whole empire, a pride soon to be infinitely heightened by the glorious record of the Canadian division in the desperate battles of April. The attack on Neuf Chapelle was supported by a variety of movements along the British front to prevent any sudden massing of reinforcements. On the morning of the 10th, the first corps attacked from Shivenshi, but there had been too little artillery preparation. The wire entanglements were largely uncut and the most they could do was to hold the enemy to his position. On the 12th, the second corps had arranged to advance southwest of Wishkit against that troublesome German position on the ridge which we had assailed in December. It was time for 10 in the morning, but the mists hung so low that it was not till 4 in the afternoon that the 7th Brigade could move. The mist thickened, darkness drew near, and the attack had to be relinquished. More successful was the attack the same day on the hamlet of Lebanet, southeast of Armentier. At noon, the 17th Brigade of the 4th Division of the 3rd Corps, with the 18th Brigade in support, advanced 300 yards on the front of half a mile, carried the village, and held it against all counter-attacks. Our artillery also succeeded on the 10th in shelling the railway station of Quinoa, east of Armentier where some German reinforcements were entraining, and the fire of our great howitzers penetrated as far as Hubert on the ridge, where a tall church tower dissolved in a cloud of dust. But the chief success in these subsidiary operations was won by our airmen. During the three days from the 10th to the 12th of March, the weather was the worst conceivable for air work, and aviators were compelled to fly at a height of no more than 100 or 150 feet to make sure of their aim. One dropped a bomb on the bridge at Menon, which carried the railway over the lease and destroyed one of the piers. Others wrecked the railway stations at Coutre, Don, and Douai, and bombs were dropped on Lille, hitting one of the German headquarters. This whole air campaign was brilliantly conceived and executed. To destroy vital points in the enemy's communications was as effective as a shrapnel curtain to bar him from his reserves. One result of Neuf Chapelle was to convince the British army that they were facing an unbeaten enemy. When the defense rallied, it fought with desperate valor, aided by its many machine guns. There were 15 on one stretch of 250 yards. It showed admirable discipline and handled its reserves with boldness and precision. In the mind of the German people, the affair produced a curious exasperation. 
it is not war, it is murder, was the verdict passed on the British use of artillery by the nation which had accumulated gigantic reserves of shell and had already used heavy guns to prepare an action in a way unknown to history. Considered as a battle by itself, it was for the British a pyrrhic victory. On a front of three miles, they had advanced more than a mile, and their former sack in their line was now replaced by a pronounced sack in the enemy's. But the cost had been high, and the losses of the defense were probably not greater than those of the attack. The result, in Cromwell's words, was not answerable to the honesty and simplicity of the design, and the British rich had notably exceeded its grasp. This was partly due to accidents, the sudden clouding of the weather from 10th to 12th March. But there were also many grave blunders, which proved that our organization was still far from adequate for a serious offensive. The artillery preparation was patchy. The staff work as a whole, and especially that of the 4th Corps, was imperfect. And there was an unexplained delay in bringing up the brigades of the 7th Division after the advance of the 8th on the morning of 10th March. The observation work of the artillery was faulty, with the result that occasionally our own advancing troops were shelled, and more often the enemy's position was left unbroken. It was our first attempt at the new tactics, and inevitably we fumbled. Sir John French laid the chief blame for the result upon the lack of ammunition, but in making his plans he must have foreseen this, for the new British factories were not yet producing at full power and he had accumulated a reserve which he thought sufficient for the experiment. He had not unnaturally miscalculated the strength required to effect his purpose. Neuf Chapelle was a test action, and the deduction from it was to have a sinister effect on the Allies' conduct of the war. For both to the British themselves and to the French staff who looked on with the liveliest interest, it appeared that, after making all allowances for inexperience and blunders, the new plan was justified. Guns could blast away for infantry through the strongest defenses. Clearly, the attack must be on a broader front. Otherwise, the avenue of advance would be too narrow and degenerate into a salient. But on a broad front, granted limitless supplies of guns and shell, it seemed that success was assured. This view, as we shall see, dominated all the plans for 1915 and its many weaknesses were left undiscovered in the obsession which had fallen upon the Allied commands. More serious was the fact that it ossified the study of tactics, and turned the war for long into a contest less of brains than of blind material force. A false step had been taken, which for three years was to be left unretrieved. End of chapter 25 End of a History of the Great War, Volume 1, by John Buchan